This is Audible. Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Silent Valor, One Man's Vietnam War by Rick Greenberg Narrated by Patrick Lawler Chapter 1 The Story Begins February 8, 1968 Dong Huang District, Thai Binh, Vietnam, seven miles south of Da Nang I snap my head around as gunfire erupts to the west. Twenty-five yards away, Echo 3 has walked into an ambush. The enemy, hidden in the trees, waited until they were close. I spy one Marine lying only a few feet from the tree line. Charlie's firing both small arms and automatic weapons. We have to do something. An RPG fired from deep in the bush explodes near them, and I know they're in a world of shit. They're in that ditch, shouts Hammond. I look and find two more Marines lying in front of the ditch where Echo 3 had taken cover. I spot Captain Jocelyn talking on the radio. I expect air or artillery to start dropping bombs, but nothing happens. The NVA and VC are in full assault. Hammond looks at me and yells, Don, you and Joe lay down cover fire! Joe and I take a knee along with Hammond. We start picking off the VC and NVA as they leave the trees and rush the squad. The enemy must think Echo 3 is killing them. I don't think they realize we're here. I watch and fire at the enemy as they get closer and closer to Echo 3. Dozens more leave the trees. There are too many for us to stop. Still firing, I watch the NVA reach the ditch and shoot whoever is left. Now I stare in disbelief. It's over. Echo 3 is gone. Joe, still shooting, yells, Keep firing, Don! Kill those motherfuckers! Stunned by what I see, I look over at Joe as an explosion erupts behind me. Gunfire follows. The enemy has figured out where we are. The rest of our squad is in a ditch that looks a lot like the one where Echo 3 just got slaughtered. They're a few yards away and catching hell. A round zips past my head and the ground around me is peppered from enemy fire. I drop to the prone position and cover my head. Everything is happening too fast! I'm frozen until Hammond grabs the back of my flak jacket, pulls me to my feet and shouts, Get in the ditch! Let's go! Move! January 19th, 2020 My name is Don Talbot. I'm sitting in the house of my friend Rick Greenberg talking about my time in Vietnam. Rick, who is writing my story, has asked what happened to me during the North Vietnam Offensive of 1968, better known as Tet, the Vietnamese New Year. But that's not the story Rick wants, or at least not all of it. He wants the whole damn thing. I don't know if I can give him that. He wants me to start at the beginning. The beginning? What was the beginning? He's watching me, expectant. I draw a deep breath and let it escape through my teeth. Okay, Rick, you want it? You can have it. I open my mouth and begin to speak, surprised that my voice doesn't even waver. It was March 13, 1967, when I landed at Da Nang Airfield. I checked the time as soon as we touched down. It was 23.30. The plane was taxiing down the runway when, off to the side, I spotted jets parked in bunkers. I wondered if they were F-4 Phantoms. There's one thing about that first night I will never forget. It was dark. Real dark. Every thought I speak leads me back to that first night in Vietnam. I can feel myself changing back into that 18-year-old Marine. Before I realize it, I am back in Nam, telling my story, reliving it. I am there again. Chapter 2 Vietnam March 13, 1967, Tet minus 323 days. The plane turns off the runway and stops. Fifty yards away stands a single-story terminal building. I gaze out the window trying to see this Vietnam. Seated in the rear of the plane, I wait for my turn to disembark, my eyes fixed beyond the window. Beyond the terminal building, all is darkness, intense and opaque. I've heard about things in space called black holes. What I'm looking at reminds me of photos I've seen in magazines. 
The blackness is so deep no light can penetrate. The line begins to move, so I stand and enter the center aisle. I retrieve my bag from the overhead compartment and take a quick look inside. The flight from Okinawa took more than six hours. A lot of people have been out of their seats going through the luggage compartments. I want to be sure my orders and record book are still there. But more than that, I want to check on my two cartons of lucky strikes. I smile. All is good. Once I near the plane's front hatch, one of the pilots and a stewardess stand, wishing everyone a safe tour in Vietnam. As I pass by, they smile, and I nod. Outside the air-conditioned plane, I step into a wave of heat and humidity I've never felt before. My lungs feel like they're about to implode. The air is so thick it's like breathing through a wet towel. I'm only out of the plane a few seconds and already sweating. My boots seem to melt into the pavement. But there's something else. An intolerable odor. It smells like an outhouse filled with jet fuel. I mumble. So it's not only the heat I have to deal with, but this stink, too. I follow the other Marines as they move toward the terminal. The walk is dark, and the only light comes when a Marine opens the hatch and walks in. The building's outside walls are covered with sandbags. Inside, I realize this is not a terminal at all. It's a huge open floor area with a few benches scattered around. The whole room is no more than 2,000 square feet. By the time I enter, the place has Marines packed asshole to belly button. Over loud conversation, someone yells, Listen up! Make sure your orders are in your record books! Drop them in this barrel, now! No one moves, so he raises his voice. Get those books over here! I don't have all day! Move, people! The one yelling wears gunnery sergeant chevrons on his collar. I also see this gunny is wearing a Marine Corps green uniform with large pockets on the breast and trouser sides. I'm still wearing my stateside uniform with straight breast pockets and regular trousers. The only thing typical on his uniform is the USMC insignia on the left breast pocket. The gunny sees me staring and demands, What are you looking at, Private? Your uniform, gunny. Lots of pockets. Do we get those too? When you check into your unit, now drop that book and get your ass out of the way. I do as I'm told and move away. No one else drops any books, so Gunny yells out, Is that everyone? Receiving no negative response, he tells us, This building is the indoctrination center. This is where you will receive your record books and new orders in the morning. You people, find some place to crash. There are barracks outside on the port side. Pick a rack. Reveille goes 0430. Chow is at 0500. There'll be a formation at 0700. If you need to use the head, it's across the deck out back. If anyone's hungry, there's some sandwiches and milk in that room. He points to his right and says, Welcome to Vietnam. Then he walks out. I'm not interested in any bologna sandwiches. I head out the back for a quick smoke. While enjoying my cigarette, I look around for the black hole I spotted from the plane. There you are, I say aloud. It's only a few yards away. I look up. There's a mountain behind us, and the black hole is at the base. The trees and ground are absent as though they've been removed. There's only the darkness. Something explodes off in the distance, and I wonder, is it ours or theirs? There's a popping sound, and up the mountain, a faint shadowy light draws my attention. After another pop, the light that follows illuminates the other side of the ridge. The brightness that fades in and out reminds me of camping in the summer back home. The light from our lantern, hanging on a tree branch, would sway back and forth during a summer breeze. The swinging lantern would turn our campsite from dark to light. What the hell? Is that somebody walking up there? I'm talking aloud to no one in particular, and so focused on what I see I don't notice other Marines gather nearby. Someone speaks out. Shit, yeah, man. That is somebody up there. We're all watching the ridgeline when a corporal holding a smoke walks up. Some of the Marines wonder out loud where the light is coming from. 
The light is from illumination on the other side of the mountain. What's that popping sound, Corporal? I ask. Mortars launching that illume. Hey, Corporal, what's up there? A voice in the crowd asks. That's the perimeter for Da Nang. On the other side of that ridge line is the jungle, and the jungle belongs to Victor Charlie. He field strips his cigarette and walks away. Victor Charlie, VC, Viet Cong. I decide I don't need to ask any more questions tonight. I field strip my smoke and look for the head. I don't want anybody to know I'm new, so I don't ask questions about where I go take a dump. I'm wandering around back until I see a guy who walks out of a small building buttoning his trousers. Under my breath, I say, that's got to be the head. I walk over and check it out. What I find is anything but the comforts of home. I open a door and step inside. A spring-loaded door closes behind me. Inside is so dark I can't tell where to piss. I flick on my cigarette lighter. The place is narrow, only a few feet wide and ten feet long. It has a roof and screened windows in the front with two screened doors. There's a long sheet of plywood laid flat to sit on with four holes cut in a row. This is where I take my dump. Before I sit, I look down the hole and see a barrel with a dark liquid inside. I take a whiff. That's fuel oil. We burn the shit away. I turn around to sit and find two rolls of toilet paper attached to the front wall, one each for two shitholes. Thank God for toilet paper. I unbutton and lower my trousers, then sit. I don't mind the smell of fuel. It's better than what I'm dropping in. Finished, I leave the head. A lot of Marines are either outside smoking or chowing down on bologna sandwiches. I head over to the barracks to find an empty rack. All I want is some shut-eye. Each barracks had two screened doors. The structures are all made of wood except the upper half of the walls, which are covered with screens. I walk in and find several bunk beds running down each side of this barracks. Some guys are already sleeping, so I pick a top rack, take off my boots, toss my bag up, and climb on. Now on top, I find a pillow and folded green blanket. I set the still-folded blanket at the foot of the bed and put my head on the pillow. After closing my eyes, it doesn't take long to fall asleep. It's zero dark thirty when someone starts yelling, Everyone up! Grab your shit! Mess hall opens in thirty mics! Chow is past the Indoc Center and down the road! Be back at the center by zero seven hundred! There's a formation for every swinging dick that came off that plane last night! Make sure you have all your gear with you. I sit up, rubbing the sleep from my eyes. After grabbing my bag and jumping down, I put my boots on and head out back for a quick smoke and head call. Outside, the heat has lessened, but the humidity is the same, making me sweat. Inside the head is another Marine sitting over one of the holes. He's big and black. Standing over the hole next to him, I need to pee. I start to whip it out, but he yells, Hey, new guy, sit the fuck down when you piss. I don't want you spraying all over me. Or go outside and piss in a bush somewhere. Under his breath, he adds, Dumb fucking FNG. I sit and ask, Why do you call me an FNG? He laughs and says, Shit, FNG, fucking new guy. His laugh is so robust it makes me smile. I guess I am. And you're not? Hell no. I'm going home, back to the world. I'll be on that Freedom Bird before you can check in. Freedom Bird? Yeah, man. You know, the plane that flies you out of here and back to the world. He wipes his ass and stands up. Looking down at me while buttoning his trousers, he says, You keep your head down, you'll be okay. Then he turns and walks out. With a few more questions on my mind, I finish and try to follow, but he disappears into the crowd. At the mess hall, everyone in line waits for it to open. This place is larger than I expected. It looks like it can hold every Marine who was on the plane and more. I can smell the food inside, which brings on a hunger that wasn't there when I woke. The doors open, and it's a mad rush as the Marines and Navy line up inside for chow. I notice the milk dispenser in the middle of the room. 
I rush over, grab a glass, and fill it with the cold white liquid. I chug the whole glass down, which helps with the heat of the day. I refill the glass, grab a tray and some utensils, and get in line. There's scrambled egg without too much green. There are bacon, potatoes, and pancakes, a larger variety than I expected for a mess hall in a combat zone. With food on my tray, I look for a place to sit. Some guys I went through boot camp with find me. One of them shouts, Hey Don, over here, man! I walk over and join them. One of the Marines sitting there I remember from MCRD. The drill instructor made him their house mouse. He was the smallest Marine in our platoon and became their gopher. Hey, mouse, how's it going? Hey, I ain't no D.I. house mouse anymore. Give me a break, man. I must be getting under his skin, and I smile. All is well. Mouse grills me. I watched you come out of the head this morning. Did you see that big brother when you were in there? Was he on our plane? What'd he say? No, he wasn't on our plane. He told me we're all FNGs, fucking new guys, and if you live through the next 13 months, you'll go back to the world on a freedom bird. The confusion on their faces makes me smile again. Chapter 3 First Assignment After chow, I walk outside. Across the road, a few marines sit smoking on a three-foot-high sandbag wall, so I join them. Other marines coming out of chow head straight back to the induction center. I light my cigarette and take a huge drag, hold it a moment, and then exhale. My eyes move to my watch and I shout, Shit! Formation in ten minutes! Everyone jumps up. We field strip our smokes and double time down the road. When we arrive at the center, we find it empty. Muffled voices surround me. Someone hollers, They're out front! And we all head for the hatch. Outside, we find a couple hundred Marines standing around in a clusterfuck. I run my eyes over the mob looking for my boot camp buddies. There they are. When I join them, Mouse asks, You're 0311, ain't you, Don? Damn straight. I'm a hard-charging killing machine. How about you guys? I'm 3531, says one Marine. Me too, says another. What about you, Mouse? I ask. Radio operator like them. A lanky Marine that has to be 6'4 says, Well, I'm a radio operator too, but my MOS is 3533. Telegraph operator. He pauses while looking down at me. Why are you always smiling, Talbot? That's who I am. Well, knock it off. It bothers me. He turns his attention back to the group. You guys know why there are so many radio operators here. No one answers. We're replacements. Still no response. Dudes, it's because we're the first to go in a firefight. Take out communications and you take out support. My smile fades and I ask, How do you know this? From my instructors at comm school? They've been here, they told us. Yeah, adds another Marine. I had an instructor tell my class the same thing. Our life expectancy is five seconds from the moment the firefight starts. The lanky Marine replies, See? It's like I said. Knock out calm and you got the grunts by the balls. The news has everyone a little down, so I try to lighten things up. Hey, if any of you guys go down, can I have your shit? A couple of guys smile, but one Marine asks, What shit, Talbot? Chow, pogey bait? No one says a thing until I add, Addresses of your chicks back home? I promise I'll let them know how you died heroes. While they cry, I'll love them. Hey, Mouse, what's your girl's name? Cindy, right? Another Marine says, Cindy, Mouse? Is she blonde? Looks like Talbot's getting all your pussy. Everyone laughs while they rag on Mouse. The talk of dying stops. For now. A voice comes over the babble of 200 Marines. Fall in! I want four ranks! Move your asses, people! It's the same gunnery sergeant from last night. It takes a couple of hundred Marines time to square away into four ranks. I find myself in the front row. Once we're in formation, Gunny yells, Atten! Hut! Everyone snaps to attention. Then he orders, At ease! When I call your name, fall out! 
Pick up your record book and orders. Three by six troop trucks back in and stop 20 feet in front of the formation. The drivers come out of their cabs and lower the tailgates. Gunny continues. Staff Sergeant Ramirez will direct you to your transportation. A staff sergeant walks out from behind the trucks. Some of you people have units in the bush. You'll be going to Marble Mountain and go out by Chopper. Gunny calls out the first name. Aaron, John, 2168401. A Marine answering to that name and serial number falls out. Handing him both his record book and orders, Gunny tells him, You're heading to 19 Quang Tri Province. There's some real shit going on down there. You're a replacement. Quang Tri Province? Where the hell is that? Gunny continues to call out names alphabetically until reaching the letter T. Talbot! Donald! Before he can read my serial number, I break formation and haul ass. Facing him, I stand at attention. Here, Gunny! What the hell, Talbot? He stares at me, then says, First Military Police Battalion. With my record book and orders in hand, I move toward the trucks and Staff Sergeant Ramirez. Then the Gunny yells, Where the hell are you going, Talbot? To the trucks, Gunny. He looks at me like I'm some kind of stupid and says, over there. He points back at another road leading into the camp. Follow the sign. I look past him and see a huge sign 50 yards away, 1st Military Police Battalion. It's in front of a small, hardened Quonset hut. Get your ass in gear and report in. As I walk away, he adds, laughing, Hey, Talbot, don't get lost. I smile and Gunny glares back. I stop in front of the military police battalion headquarters. Looking to my right, I see a line of Quonset huts like what they have back at MCRD. I didn't know what to expect before I got here. I did wonder what the barracks arrangements would be. Sleeping in Quonset huts is a lot better than what I imagined. They're dome-shaped and metal-framed, which gives the troops inside protection against enemy attack. I hope. A sergeant walks past me and opens the hatch to the battalion office. He stops and turns around. You checking in, Private? Yeah, I am. Then get your ass in here. I follow him in. Inside the building is a large reception counter that stands chest high. It separates those checking in from those in charge. The sergeant from outside moves behind the counter and takes my orders and record book. A major walks over, grabs my orders, says... Put him in Delta Company, 1st Squad, and walks away. While separating my paperwork, the sergeant tells me, Don't worry, Private, you're going to like it here. Nothing much ever happens in Da Nang. He looks up at me. No VC. After writing something on my orders, he stamps them and then takes a sheet of paper from a pile to his right. The corporal hands me a check-in sheet and explains, There are two rows of hooches. Next to us is Alpha Company. Next to them is Bravo. Go behind this office is Charlie Company. Down the road you'll find Delta. You check in there. Give them that paper and they'll assign you to your platoon and squad. You got it? Yeah, I got it. With everything in hand, I head outside. Next to the battalion office is a walkway that goes behind it. I follow the path and find Charlie Company right where the sergeant said it would be. A dirt road runs in front of these Quonset huts, separating Alpha and Bravo from Charlie and Delta. I find the Delta Company office and walk in. The hut is split in two sections, the front half as the office and the back half as someone's quarters. Back there are two cots, two lockers, and at the foot of each rack, a foot locker. Someone is living back there. I look around, sizing up the place. The back living area has a hatchway in the stern. The other hatch, the one I entered through, is in the bow. The building's metal sides have several windows, all open and covered in screen. Both doors are screened and closed. A corporal behind the counter asks, What do you need, Private? I hand him my orders and check-in sheet. Battalion said I was to report here. He takes the papers and examines them. Wait one. He walks to a room behind him and knocks on the hatch. A husky voice answers, Enter. From a hatchway left open a few inches, I try to see who is talking with the corporal. All I see is a set of hands signing my paperwork. 
The corporal returns and grabs his rifle from under the counter, then walks around it. Come on, Talbot. First sergeant wants me to get you checked in. He hands me my check-in sheet. I grab my bag and follow him outside. Where are we going? I ask. Supplies first. I can't help but wonder why he's carrying a club rather than a weapon. I have to ask. Why do you have your rifle but no magazine, Corporal? We're not allowed to carry loaded weapons. No order says you have to carry your weapon with you, but if it's stolen, it's my ass. So I keep it close. Most guys do. Along the way, I try to familiarize myself with the unit. I can't see the mess hall, but I smell the food. The odor is coming from the same general direction as this morning. It must be the same one. I hope this check-in doesn't interfere with lunch. The ground consists of hard-packed down dirt, but dust from foot traffic still rises. No training is going on anywhere I can see. Not even marching. But around us are many Marines moving in different directions. The Corporal continues to lead, and I play dumb. So, Corporal, you got any idea where I'll be assigned? You're in 1st Platoon, 1st Squad. That squad is a man short. Am I going to be military police? He laughs. Fuck no! Each company here defends Da Nang and the air base. All you've got to do is guard. Maybe an occasional short patrol, and sometimes you might set up an ambush. We round a corner and find a building shaped like a big rectangle and made of wood. The sides, hardened with sandbags, tells me an enemy attack is always possible. Above the door is a sign that reads, Supply. The top part of the door is open, so I look in. A lone lance corporal is sitting at a small green desk. The corporal tells him, Hey, supply clerk, he's a new check-in, needs a full issue. The clerk walks up, takes my check-in sheet, and hands me a paper. It shows a drawing of a male figure with lines connected to boxes coming from the different body parts. Sizes. Small, medium, large, and extra large. Except the boots. Those are actual sizes. Fill it all in. He snaps in a cold tone. I fill in the information and hand the paper back. The clerk takes the list into a back room and returns ten minutes later with all my clothing requirements. I check to see if I have those kangaroo pockets. I do. Then he hands me a green sack that looks like a duffel bag. He hands me my 782 gear separately from the clothing. I check to make sure I have it all. Let's see. Helmet, flak jacket, web belt, and straps. Hmm. Six magazines. They're smaller than I remember. I'm getting the new M16. Poncho, backpack, flashlight. I try the light, and it works. First aid kit. Hope I never need this. Okay, what's this? I pull out a knife in a sheath. Shit, it's my bayonet. I think that's it. You got everything, Private? The corporal asks. Yeah, I do. Everything is serviceable, and I pack it all in the bag. The supply clerk hands me two pairs of jungle boots. The corporal says, Try them on. Make sure they fit. They have to last you your entire tour. I put the boots on, and they fit perfectly. I'm handed another sheet of paper listing everything this supply clerk has given me. He tells me, sign at the bottom. I do what he says and return the document to him. I tie off the top of the bag and I'm ready to go. The Lance Corporal warns me, those are the only jungle boots you're getting, Private. Take care of them. He turns away to file the paperwork. The bag has two straps that allow me to carry it on my back. I slip one arm in and then hoist the bag up while sliding in my other. You all set, Talbot? Good to go, Corporal. As we start to leave, the Corporal asks, Hey, Private, where's your check-in sheet? Shit, I never got it back. I turn around and the supply clerk is standing at his window with my paperwork in his hand, all signed off and ready to go. We make our way through the whole check-in process until we reach the armory. A private first class is playing cards with a sergeant. I notice the NCO is carrying a forty five caliber sidearm. I assume it's loaded. Like back in the States, an armorer has to protect the weapons stored under his watch. Is this guy the only armed Marine on the base? The corporal I'm with tells the armorer he needs a weapon, magazines, and ammo. The sergeant gets up and asks for my sign in sheet. 
He initials the box marked Armory, picks up a book off his desk, and orders the PFC, Go get him rifle 2 9 5 7 and 20 magazines. He puts the book down and walks away to another room, returning five minutes later. He hands me 25 boxes of 556mm ammunition, and my jaw drops open. I've never had such firepower. I remove the green bag from my shoulders, open it, and drop the ammo in. The PFC returns a moment later carrying an M16 automatic rifle. Along with the weapon, he hands me 20 empty magazines. Everything goes into the bag except the rifle. The sergeant tells me, read off the serial number. One, six, two, two, niner, five, seven. Sign here, he says. I sign the paperwork and he hands me back my check-in sheet. You ever fired an M16? The corporal asks. I've never even seen one before. All I've trained with is the M14. Your squad leader should get you familiarized with its function. If not, you'll figure it out. Now let's get back. I have work to do. Back at Delta Company, I say, Hey, Corporal, I never got your name. Martin. I'm the admin NCO. Your squad leader is Sergeant Ballister. Give me your check-in sheet. I'll file it in your paperwork. Checking his watch, he says, Your squad is at a company rifle inspection and chow. Mess hall will close before you can get there. It'll reopen at 1600. He points at the first building. That's your hooch. He turns away and walks back to the Delta Company office. I enter the hooch the corporal pointed out and find a dozen racks lined up, six on each side. At the far end lies another rack separated by a thin wall. Across from it is the 14th rack with medical gear stacked high. Those are squad leader and corpsman racks. There's one rack with no gear third from the front on the right. I put my green bag and personal stuff on the floor next to it. After standing my weapon against the bulkhead, I sit, pull out my smokes, and shake one loose. I move outside and light up while I wait for someone to return. With the cigarette finished, I return to the rack, lie back, and doze off. I'm startled awake as several Marines walk into the hooch, and an NCO with them demands, Who the hell are you? Chapter 4 First Squad Delta Company March 14, 1967 Tet minus 322 Who the hell are you? yells a sergeant standing next to my rack. He's big, over six foot. Startled by his tone, I snap to my feet. I'm PFC Talbot. The first sergeant assigned me to first squad. The admin corporal told me this was where I'm... I don't give a shit. We've got guard duty tonight. The sergeant exhales as he calms down. Get your shit squared away. Chow is at 1600. I'm Sergeant Ballister, first squad leader. He looks at my rifle and asks, You just in from the world? Yes, sergeant. You ever fired an M16 before? No, sergeant. Know anything about them? Negative. I figured that. When the hell are they going to start training you people before they send you here? He reaches past me and picks up my rifle from the bulkhead. Watch me. This is the charging handle. You use it to pull back the bolt to the rear. That's how you clear a weapon jam. He locks the bolt and turns the rifle over on its left side so I can see what he's doing. You lock and release the bolt here. This is your selector switch. You see it? I nod. Your thumb can activate it while your finger stays on the trigger. From safe mode, you push down and the selector points up. The weapon is on semi-automatic. You push again, you're in full auto. You never go full auto, got it? Yes, Sergeant, I got it. I watch him return the weapon to safe and take a magazine from his pouch. He takes a 556mm round from his pocket and loads it in the magazine. What's he doing? I may be an FNG, but I know if he puts that magazine in the weapon, it'll make the rifle live, and a live weapon in your barracks is not kosher. The sergeant continues, You take your mag and slide it into the magazine feedway until you hear it click, then release the bolt. The sound of the bolt charging around into the chamber causes me to blink. Your weapon is loaded. 
Sergeant Ballister watches the smile that's been across my mouth fade away. Evidently enjoying the tension he's causing, he pulls the charging handle back. The round ejects, and the bolt auto-locks to the rear. I pick up the ejected round from where it fell on my rack and hand it back to the sergeant. You hold on to that. Why did the bolt lock to the rear? He asks. I thrust out my chest. It locks because there were no more rounds in the magazine. This is so after the last round has been fired, the bolt will stay open until a fresh magazine is inserted and the bolt released. When there are bullets in the magazine, the bolt will not lock and the rifle will continue to auto-load. He gave a small nod. Okay, that's all you need to know. He removes his magazine and releases the bolt. Then he hands me back my rifle, saying, Put the round in one of your magazines. I follow his order and then show him when it's complete. His face loses all expression when he says, Now you do it. I stare at Sergeant Ballister for a moment, not sure he wants me to load the rifle. Go on, he shouts. Do it! I slide the magazine into the rifle, pull back on the charging handle, and let the bolt go home. The weapon loaded, I pull the charging handle back and eject the round from the rifle. I remove the magazine and show him I can do everything he demonstrated. When I finish, he says with a slim smile, You're good to go. What did you say your name was? Talbot. Don Talbot. And you're a private? PFC. You ain't in the bush, Talbot. This is a garrison. Get your chevrons on, PFC. He turns to the whole squad yelling, Listen up, y'all. This is day one. We got rice paddy duty tonight. Make sure you have chow, ammo, rain gear, and plenty of water. I don't want anyone leaving their posts because they need water. Corporal Mulch. A tall, muscular Marine turns from the others and moves to the sergeant. Explain to PFC Talbot what he needs to do. The sergeant turns back. Talbot, put your web gear together. Load all your magazines and stow your other shit away in that footlocker. He points at the locker at the foot of this rack. This is your rack now, and that is your footlocker. You got a lock? I do, from Okinawa. Use it. Corporal Mulch is my second. He'll help you square away. Say, Sergeant, you told everyone to bring Chow. Where do I get Chow? Corporal Mulch will take care of it. Sergeant Ballister walks away. Sit down, Corporal Mulch orders, and I sit. What's your name? Talbot. My name's Mulch. You can call me Corporal. The sergeant explained the M-16, right? I nod. Good. You got any questions? No, Corporal. Put your deuce gear together first. I'll inspect it when you're done. You got ammo, right? Yes, Corporal. What the hell are you smiling about, Talbot? I didn't realize I was. It just happens. Well, knock it off. You look like a fucking idiot. Did Sergeant Ballister explain how many rounds you load in the magazine? It's a 20-round mag, right? It is, but you only load 18. That info comes from grunts in the bush. 20 rounds in the magazine can cause the weapon to jam. It has something to do with the pressure on the spring. Leave the extra rounds in your footlocker. Copy that. As the corporal turns to leave, I ask, The sergeant told me you'd explain where I get chow for tonight. Yeah, that's right. Okay, follow me. We walk to the corpsman's area of the hooch. Under his rack, I see boxes of sea rations. Pull out a box and take three meals. Don't be picky. Take whatever. We go to chow at 1600. At 2000, we stand guard. You use one meal for morning chow. The others are for noon and evening meals. Tonight at 2400, the mess hall will send us sandwiches. I grab three meals and walk back to my rack. I set the rations down and look over what I got. I mutter, Beans and weenies? Cool. Ah, my favorite, spaghetti. And what the hell? Ham slices? Ah, oh, shit. The rack next to mine is separated by two feet of space. A black marine sitting on it, his back to me, turns his head and asks, Y'all want to trade those ham slices? I look up. What you got? He turns around, swinging his legs over his rack to face me. I got beans and meatballs and spiced beef to trade. I'll take the beans and meatballs. He hands over his sea ration while I hand him my ham slices. He asks, what's your name? Don Talbot? Mine's Davis. 
You got a first name? I asked. My mama named me Frederick Douglass Davis after the abolitionists during the Civil War. You ever heard of him? Heard of the Civil War, but nah, never heard of that guy. Hey, what's with Corporal Mulch? Mulch is a cool guy. He's trying to show you he's in charge, but he's okay. You say your name's Talbot. Yeah, Don Talbot. He sticks out his hand and we shake. Hey, Frederick, the sergeant said something about this being day one. What's that about? Hey, man, don't call me Frederick. You call me Davis. I pause to see if he's pissed. So, what's this place about? Here's the shit. We do a four-day cycle. Tonight starts day one for 24 hours on the line. When we finish tomorrow night, we're off till morning. Then we do a 12 on and 12 off. Then we're back on the line for 24 more hours. The last day is another 12 on and 12 off. Then we start all over again. What happens during the 12 on and 12 off? We do a walking post and a patrol through dog patch. But if we're lucky, we're put in the reactionary platoon. You know what that is? Think so. Someone needs help? We go help. Yeah. Anybody gets in the ship, we go rescue them. It's great duty because we're usually left alone. If the platoon's needed, we can't be scattered around. You have to watch out for our first sergeant. He doesn't like it when we're doing nothing, so he'll put us on police call or other bullshit details. If we stay out of sight and the heavies can't find us, we skate. What's his name? I ain't met him yet. Dankworth. First Sergeant Dankworth. You'll meet him later. He's your typical lifer. A tough son of a bitch. But fair. You ever get called up on reactionary? Nope. That ain't never happened in the six months I've been here. Not by first squad or any squad in the battalion I know of. Da Nang's pretty quiet, usually. Usually? What does that mean? A couple of weeks ago, we got hit real hard. Hey, Mulch, Davis yells. What day was it we got hit last month with all those rockets? 27 February. They knocked out two Super Sabres and a C-130 took a direct hit. But no gooks got into the base. I think one sapper was KIA. Davis tries to relax me. See, Don, you got nothing. Oh, shouts Mulch, interrupting him. And two Air Force pukes got wasted. I take a moment to digest what Davis and Mulch are telling me and then put it out of my mind. Changing the subject, I ask, So what's dog patch? That's where first platoon does our guard duty. We have the village and some rice paddies to cover. Bunkers and wire go around the entire air base. It stretches for miles, man. The village is located at the other end of the base. Grunts that were here long before any of us named it Dog Patch because of all the damn dogs. He pauses. You know, Talbot, the Vietnamese eat dogs. Oh, you gotta be shitting me. Nope, they really do. You know, before the village became off-limits, we went there to shop or hang out. Hey, man, there's Boom Boom Girls there, too, if you're interested. It doesn't take me long to figure out what he means by Boom Boom Girls. I just smile. Davis goes on. This one day, I was looking for something to buy and send home when I saw burgers frying on a grill. They smelled really good, so I bought one. It was rolled in a thin layer of bread made from rice. I found out later it was dog meat. Man, that's disgusting. After pausing, I ask, So, what did it taste like? His head and shoulders come up and he answers, It was good. The meat tasted a little different than what I was used to, but yeah, it was good. Would you eat another one? I tell you this, if I was hungry enough, I'd eat dog, and so would you. I let that roll around in my head for a while. So why is Dog Patch closed? A while back, some jarhead got into an argument with a shop owner and fired his weapon. Fuck, he shot the guy? No, he just wanted to scare the gook. The village chief got pissed and the heavies closed the village to us grunts. Some guys still sneak in, especially at night. They go in for the chicks. They ain't afraid of getting caught? 
Laughing, he tells me, What the hell are they going to do? Cut their hair and send them to Nam? <laughs> His laugh is large and hearty, but I'm not sure I get it, so I keep smiling. A tall, thin guy walks over and joins our conversation. Hey, Davis, tell him what's happening tonight. You know, I'll take him to the tower with me. The guy turns to me. My name's Crux, with a K, not a C. You want to come to the tower tonight? They let me pick whoever I want. Davis snorts. The only reason you get the tower, Crux, is because you flunked out of sniper school. You're all they got. I didn't flunk out, I quit. But not before I qualified at the thousand meter shoot. Davis gets angry and yells, Fuck you, Crux! You never qualified at a thousand meters. You always tell these bullshit stories. The M1A only has an 875 meter effective range with the scope. And that's the rifle you used. That's the sniper rifle you trained with. Why do you quit? I ask. Crux doesn't answer, but Davis does. He couldn't do the PT. Dropped out of every run. They dumped his ass. I told you, Davis, I wasn't dumped. I quit. I wanted to come back to the grunts. Bullshit, you fucking liar, Crux. You quit because you couldn't hack the runs. Crux turns back to me, his hands gesturing sympathy. Those runs were ten miles and working their way to fifteen. Shit, man, I barely made the three-mile PFT run, you know? I don't answer as he stares down at me. The tower is the best guard duty. You want to come? What'd you say your name is? Don Talbot. I take a moment to consider his offer. Thanks, Crux, but I'll stay with Davis. <laughs> Whatever, FNG. Monsoon startup, you'll be sorry. Crux walks away. Why'd you turn him down? Asks Davis. The tower is a pretty sweet deal. There's a roof over your head, a spotlight to play with. It's drier and warmer if it rains. And then there's the wire. The bunkers sit close to the wire, and that's where the VC comes through, you know. Nah, I'm good with what I got. You mean me, white boy? What makes you think I want you with me? I'm not sure how to take what he said. Was he serious? Was he being racial? The look on my face gives me away. Don't be so pathetic, Don. I'm just fucking with you. My smile returns. What time's chow? I missed lunch and I'm fucking hungry. We go at 1600. The whole squad goes together. Sometime later, I'm lying in my rack when Sergeant Bowlister announces, Chow time! Let's go, people! As we head out the hatchway, I see others in the squad I've gotten to know, like Jimmy Holloway, a Marine from California, who tops out at less than five foot eight. Then there's Pete Butcher. Everyone calls him Meat. He's from Detroit. A couple of other guys I still haven't met, but I suppose I will in time. At the mess hall, I walk in with Davis and Crux. Crux, who got over me turning him down for watching the tower, tells me, You smile a lot, Don. You make me want to smile. Keep it up, man. The chow tonight is good. We're having beef stew over rice with something that looks like smashed pie in a bowl. Tastes like apple, but looks like blueberry. I'll have to write Mom about that dessert. She'll know what it is. My tray filled with food, I sit at a table with Davis, Crux, Meat, and Corporal Mulch. Across from me, Mulch looks up from his chow. Talbot, you're going to be in Davis's fire team. Since your rack is already in his area, Ballister thinks you'll fit there. He swallows a spoonful of stew and asks, You ready for tonight? I didn't check your web gear. Davis answers, I checked him. He's good to go. Talbot knows his shit. Mulch stares for a moment at Davis, then returns to eating. Davis reassures me, You're all set, Don. Tonight you'll be in my bunker. A lanky lance corporal wearing a peace sign tied tight around his neck sits and joins our table. I don't know his name, but have seen him in the squad bay. Davis questions him. What the hell, hippie? This is the third fire team. Fuck you, Davis. You don't own the table. The table is quiet a moment. Then Hippie asks, So what you all talking about? Crux answers, We were just cluing in Don here on what to expect tonight. Hippie locks his eyes on me. Did you tell him about the snipers and dog patch? 
I've been here more months than anyone at this table, and I've never seen a sniper. But what about Charlie Company last week? Says Hippie. They had a guy take a round in his face. He was in Bunker 4. What about him? Hippie argues. The look on my face must tell these guys I'm nervous. I hardly eat any chow. Meat sitting on my left gives me a hard elbow. You going to eat that, Talbot? I look at him and say with a sigh, Now, go ahead. I slide my tray over. Don't worry, Meat says while stuffing his mouth with stew. Nothing much ever happens here. Guard duty is boring. I'm not sure I believe him. This is Vietnam. There's an American death toll every day. I've seen the news. As we're getting ready to leave, I notice Sergeant Ballister is heading out ahead of the squad. Where's Sarge going in such a hurry? I ask. Mulch answers, I think the first sergeant wants to see him. Back at the hooch, everyone is finishing their last-minute details for guard duty when Sergeant Ballister walks in and moves to the center of the room. Listen up, y'all. Everyone on me. I follow Davis as he and the rest of the squad move in and surround Ballister. I just left the first sergeant. He told the squad leaders on guard tonight that intelligence... Now that's an oxymoron, Meat laughs. Ballister's eyes turn cold and the young Marine stops laughing. As I was saying, intelligence says the attack last month could be a setup for something larger. Maybe tonight. Stay on your toes. If we're hit with rocket or mortar fire, keep your eyes open for sappers coming through the wire. I don't want anyone going home in a body bag. We move out in ten mics. I head back to my rack. Picking up my gear, I ask, I don't remember anything about sappers during grunt training. What is that, Davis? Sappers are like VC Special Forces. Those gooks can get through any wire and be on your ass before you know it. If we get hit with rockets and mortars, sappers will try to use the confusion and come through the line. If they get past us, they'll play hell with the airbase. And they usually leave dead marines in their wake. So stay awake tonight. But there was only one sapper last month, right? And he got killed? So maybe... I know what you're thinking, Don. Don't get your hopes up. Last month was probably just a test of our defenses. To see how we'd react. We get hit a second time. It won't be so easy. Crux hurries past us. Let's go, Talbot. It's time to be baptized. Chapter 5 Guard Duty I follow Davis and Crux outside where Sergeant Ballister is forming up the squad. We're in fire team order and ours is number three. It consists of Davis, Butcher, Jimmy Holloway, and me. As the platoon forms up, a staff sergeant takes over and calls us to attention. He then makes an about face. An officer walks out of headquarters and stands in front of the staff sergeant. They exchange salutes and the staff sergeant moves behind him. The officer has a gold bar on his collar. He's new, a second lieutenant. Holloway leans over and whispers, That's Lieutenant Brentley. The staff sergeant is trembly. He's our platoon sergeant. The lieutenant took over as CO last week. He's as boot as you, Talbot. I look at staff sergeant trembly. His nose is huge and has a hook at the end. Hey, Holloway, I whisper back. Trembley's got Barbara Streisand's beak. Jimmy stifles a laugh and I smile. Davis doesn't care for the joking. Knock it off, you two. We both settle down and watch the lieutenant scan the platoon without saying a word. It's as though he wants to show he's in control. To me, the gold bar he wears is all the authority he needs. The lieutenant addresses the unit. At ease. We are in a state of alert. Intelligence reports have indicated the possibility of more rocket attacks. Included in the report are increases in sapper attacks. Last month, a sapper made his way through our wire. It occurred during the rocket assault on Da Nang. The sapper got within a few feet of a bunker before the Marines shot the gook dead. This alert will most likely stay with us for a while. Stay alert. Line checks will be random. Don't get caught sleeping on watch. He pauses for a moment and then yells, 
Attend, hut! Staff Sergeant Trembley, front and center. The platoon sergeant returns and faces the lieutenant. In the distance, I can hear the roar of trucks approaching. You have the platoon, Staff Sergeant. Aye, aye, sir, says Trembley. He about faces back to the platoon and yells, Those are our trucks. They're all going to the same place, so squad leaders pick one. Two squads per truck. Fall out. Several six-by-six troop carrier trucks roll down the dirt road and stop in front of our barracks. The squad begins to move away, and some Marines light up smokes. I do the same. Sergeant Ballister walks back to the rear of the closest truck and yells, First squad, this one's ours. Mount up. Our squad climbs on board the truck. We sit on fold-down benches while staying in the fire team order. Second squad climbs up and sits on the other side. The driver, a husky marine with a mustache, closes the rear tailgate and locks it down. The trucks move forward and soon we pass through a gate. As I look around, Holloway says, That was gate six. Up ahead is the main gate and highway one. We'll take the highway to Dogpatch and our posts. Do MPs guard all the gates? Yeah, they do. The MPs guard everything inside Da Nang. We guard the perimeter. Hey, Don, how about a smoke? I pull out my lucky strikes and shake one loose. You need a light? Nah, I got it, Jimmy says as he cups the cigarette inside the palm of his hand, protecting the flame of his lighter from the wind. We pass through the main gate. Three sandbagged security posts are spaced apart to cover all approach angles. Each is equipped with a mounted 50 caliber machine gun and operated by MPs. We left turn and head down the highway. Vietnamese civilians are everywhere. Some are sitting in a squatting position while cooking on small fires. Others roam through roadside shops. Kids are standing along the side of the road with their hands out, begging and screaming in English, Marine! Marine! A couple of the guys toss out sea ration candy bars, and the little ones scramble to get their share. Ten minutes later, the truck pulls off the road and through another gate, coming to a sudden stop. I stand to see what's going on. It's a village. Is that dog patch? I ask no one in particular. Jimmy, standing behind me, answers, Yep, that's dog patch. It's nothing like I expected. I can see open shops displaying stuff to sell and food cooking. Marines and Navy are walking around and buying stuff. I turn to Jimmy. Isn't dog patch closed? I don't know, man. Not supposed to be anyone there. We feel a push from behind and Jimmy hurries me. Come on, we gotta get off. I hurry to the tailgate and climb down. Several yards off the path stands a formation of Marines. Hey, Jimmy, who are those guys? I ask. That's last night's guard. This is a 24-hour post. We'll be here until tomorrow night. Davis yells out, Third fire team on me! Jimmy, Meat, and I follow Davis and start walking to our posts. A hundred feet later, I spot a line of bunkers that seems to go on forever. As we get closer, I see they're spaced about 15 yards apart. Davis orders, Talbot, you're with me. Ballister and Crux start walking away from the squad. I ask, where are they heading? Meat grabs my arm and points toward a huge tower standing 25 to 30 feet high. It's 15 yards behind the bunkers. Ballister shouts, First squad fire team leaders, get your people in their bunkers. That could have been you in that tower, Davis reminds me. I pay him no attention. Everything here seems dead. It's like I'm in an old black and white movie. Even the village has no color. As the sun sets, all those who were shopping disappear. I don't like this place, I mutter under my breath. Staff Sergeant Tremblay and the lieutenant duck into the first bunker. First and second fire teams take the next four. Jimmy Holloway and Meat walk on to Bunker 7. Davis and I are in Number 6. Hey, Davis, we all two-man bunkers? I ask. Yep, let's go. This one's ours. He walks through a rear hatch, but before I follow him in, I look back toward the lieutenant's bunker and the next two in line. They all face Dogpatch. Let's go, Don, Davis calls from inside our bunker. 
I can't help but notice the outside walls of the structure are only four feet tall. They're made from several layers of sandbags. The roof also has sandbags set on boards, but holes gape between them. That's why the tower keeps you dry and the bunkers don't. I go through the hatch and step down to the ground. Now I realize the walls on the outside are not the total height of this bunker. It's been dug out, adding another two to three feet of space. Inside, it's damp and getting dark. The only light comes from the setting sun, which shines through a slit in the front wall and a few holes in the roof. Lance Corporal Davis takes his pack off and lays it on a single cot along the wall. He says, This is it, man. Settle yourself in. I drop my pack on the rack next to his and walk to the slit. I need to see what's out there. Behind me, a landline phone rings and Davis answers. Yes, sir. I know who he's talking with. I gaze through the slit and see razor-sharp concertina wires stacked high. Past the wire, a rice paddy stretches for what looks like a thousand yards to the edge of the city, Danang. To the left are endless fields of water that cover growing rice. On my right is the village. The angle makes it impossible to see any other bunker, but the wire in front of them is visible, separating the Vietnamese of Dogpatch from the Marines on guard. A large gate stands in front of Bunker 2, where Corporal Mulch has a fire team. The gates are closed and covered in razor wire. I turn back to look at Davis. How come I saw Americans walking around in Dogpatch? Didn't you say it was off-limits? Those are office pogues. Air wing, hospital pogues, and anyone stationed in Da Nang who's not an 0311 grunt. But the town should be empty by 2000. What you saw was probably MPs doing a last minute walkthrough. They closed the gate. It's closed now. He moved to the slit to check my info. They're already gone back to their area. I look at the slit in the wall. This is the firing hole. It's at least two feet wide and six feet long. It runs parallel to the roof, and two-by-fours hold it open. The length makes it possible for two men to fire their weapons standing side by side. Okay, Don, says Davis. Here's how this will work. We'll be two hours on and two hours off starting at 20 hundred. You take the first watch. I need to make sure Holloway and Meat are set for the night, so I'll be gone for a while. Here's something you'll need when it gets dark. He shows me that under the firing hole is a shelf set between some sandbags separated by a couple of two-by-fours. He pulls out what looks like a telescope and hands it to me. Amazed but more interested in where it came from, I step back and strain to see the shelf through the darkness. I look up at Davis asking about the scope. What is this thing? Well, that answers my next question. He says, you never heard of Starlight, Starbright? Negative. After dark, you flip this button here and press your eye into the rubber eyepiece. The wire, the patties, and any people coming toward you will be green. It doesn't work without some outside light, so if there's no moon and a solid overcast, forget it. Let your eyes adjust to the darkness and keep your ears open. Any questions? I shake my head. Davis looks at his watch. Okay, we start now. Put a full magazine in your rifle, but do not chamber around. We don't lock and load unless we're getting hit. If you see anything, you get me. He reaches back into the shelf and pulls out two M26 grenades. My eyes bulge. Here on the line, it's as real as it's going to get. These you will never need but knowing they're here can make life a little less stressful. Davis gives me a moment to take everything in. Okay, Talbot, one more thing. Next to the rack on the deck, right there. He points at the phone. That's a field phone. Yeah, a landline, I saw it. We used them in MOS school. Cool. You hear it ring? That's the CO. You need to reach him or trembly you crank the handle. Yeah, I know how it works. Does every bunker have a phone? No, just ours and the lieutenant's. We are close to the middle, so we get the landline. 
If the LT wants to get a message to another bunker, we're his house mouse runners. Got it? I nod as he turns and walks out of the bunker. I stare out at the rice paddies and load a magazine into my M16. Outside, the sun has set. The red sky is gone, and only darkness remains. I don't know what's coming. Alone in the bunker, my smile fades away. I stare out the firing hole, trying to see what might be out there. This is it. This is real. If the enemy comes tonight, I will shoot him. Chapter 6 Rockets and Sappers Wake up, Don. It's your watch. As Davis shakes me awake, I sit up and ask, What time is it? Midnight. The sound of an approaching truck sends Davis hurrying out the back hatch. They're here, he says. Get your ass up, Talbot. You're on duty. I watch as the flap to the bunker's rear exit closes behind him. I fumble in the dark, putting on my boots, then stand and move to the front wall. I look out at total darkness. The wire, the rice paddies, and the faint lights of Da Nang are gone. The night took everything away. I grab starlight, hoping it will light up and show me what's out there. But the scope is dark. Why isn't this thing working? Where's the green light? I check the on-off switch and confirm it's turned on. I place my eye back in the rubber eyepiece, but still, nothing. Then I remember what Davis said. If there's no light above, the damn thing doesn't work. I put the scope back on the shelf beneath the firing slit and look to the sky. Above me, the moon and the stars are all gone. As my eyes start to adjust, the concertina wire and the rice paddies come into focus. Then a flare lights up the fields and my night vision goes away. Shit, Don, you're an 0311. You never look at the flare. You look under the light at the ground. From behind, I hear Davis. Everything quiet? I turn and he shoves a paper bag into my gut and says, This one is yours. What's this? Remember bologna sandwiches? He pauses for a moment. That's yours. He turns back and sits on the rack. I watch him take out and unwrap the sandwich, then gobble it down in three bites. He eats like he's starving. After opening the milk, Davis swallows it down in one continuous motion. I take my bag, pull out the sandwich, and set it on the ledge of the slit. I take out the milk and find it still cold, which brings a smile to my face. Hey, Davis, I got a cookie, too. Lucky you. You might want to save it. Things can get pretty boring. I place the cookie in my jacket breast pocket and open the chips. Those I scarf down. I'm not hungry, so I start to put the sandwich back in the bag. Davis asks, you're not going to eat that sandwich? Nah, you can have it. I hand it over. This time he slows down, taking smaller bites. You think the attack last month was just sizing us up? I ask. Maybe. I don't know. That sapper last month got really close to one of our bunkers in Bravo Company. So yeah, I think that's what they're doing. He washes down the last of his sandwich with water from his canteen. Then he moves next to me. See how dark it is out there? This would be the perfect night to hit Da Nang. And our lines. He sits back down and removes his boots. Lying down, he says, You keep your eyes open. Make sure you stay awake. As he dozes off, he adds in a muffled tone, The lieutenant will fry your ass if you don't. I have another question, but before I can say anything, Davis is asleep. I swallow the last of my milk and return to watching the wire and rice patties. The time on guard duty drags by. Checking my watch every few minutes doesn't help. I hear a noise behind me. It sounds like a twig breaking. I turn to see the shadow of someone standing only an arm's length away. Startled, I try to move backward. Everything okay out there? Davis asks. I sigh in relief, answering, Yeah, I thought... Yeah. I haven't seen a damn... Without any warning, small arms fire erupts down the line. What the fuck? I cry out. Are we getting hit? The weapons fire stops as fast as it started. I'm not sure what to do. I watch Davis, who's not shaken and remains calm. 
The phone rings. That's the lieutenant, he says. He picks up the receiver and I hear him talking about Holloway and meat. After hanging up, he says, LT wants me to check out the other bunker, see if I can get a better look down the line from there. Keep your eyes outbound, Don. Watch your fields of fire. I nod and he's off. I'm alone. My focus returns to watching the wire when again I hear small arms fire. Down the line, tracers fly outbound. I watch as one hits something in the rice paddies and ricochets high in the air. A ton of illumination starts bursting overhead. The darkness in front of me vanishes. A light flashes from the other side of Dogpatch. A rocket flies high in the sky and heads toward my position. Oh shit, it's coming right at me! The rocket passes over my head with a swooshing sound I will never forget. More flashes continue across Dogpatch. There are so many I lose count. Behind me are the results of those rockets as explosion after explosion erupts. Da Nang is getting hit hard. I don't wait to be told that it's time to lock and load. I pull back the charging rod and chamber around. My M16 is ready to fire. I strain to see what's out there as more illumination ignites overhead. In the distance, explosions burst around the area from where the rockets launched. Our artillery is fighting back. Panicked by a noise from behind, I jerk around to see through shadows of flickering illumination. But it's only Davis. I sigh with relief. Eyes forward, Talbot. Up close, I see his eyebrows draw close together. He looks worried. With a tremor in my voice, I say, What's going on? Stay alert. Sappers will be coming. My eyes grow large as Davis takes a position next to me. Now we wait for the VC. My hands sweat and my mouth is dry. My thumb rests on the safety switch of my M16. While I continue straining to see what's in the distance, small arms fire continues to grow. Soon automatic weapons join in. The firefight is intense and lasts for several minutes. Then as fast as it started, it comes to a stop. Silence engulfs us. Davis warns, stay alert. I turn my head and stare at him. His eyes still forward, he adds, This ain't over until we get the all clear. I look back to the wire and wait. An hour goes by. Then, from outside, a voice yells, All clear! All clear! The landline rings and Davis moves to answer. Yes? Understood. Sure sounded like that. Copy that. He hangs up and turns to me. We're all clear. What happened? Staff Sergeant said at least a dozen rockets hit Da Nang. Artie took out the launch sites. We're clear now. What about the small arms fire? Sappers hit Bravo Company in the same place as last month. He didn't know of any casualties. Any sappers get through? He didn't say. The CO gave us the all clear, so relax. Davis looks at my weapon and asks, Did you chamber around? Not sure if I'm in trouble, I admit. Yeah, I did. I didn't know what to do, and it's okay, Don. Remove your magazine and clear the weapon. Davis checks the time. Your watch is over. You're an hour into mine. I could use some sleep. Why don't you stay on guard for another hour and I'll take over at 0400? Our alert status will end at 06 and you can sleep in. I'll wake you later. I nod. He lies down and falls asleep. The flares have stopped. An occasional illumination still ignites over the rice paddies. The moon is back and shines down as the clouds break. I pick up Starbright and press my eye into the rubber eyepiece. The wire and rice paddies are green. No enemies appear anywhere. My final hour passes and it's time for Davis to take over. An artillery shell flies over and with a loud pop, it ignites. I turn away from the flare attached to the falling parachute and place my back against the wall. Exhausted, I slowly bend my knees and slide down until I'm sitting on the bunker floor. As the illumination outside shines through the slit, it dances inside the bunker. It starts near the bottom of the back wall and moves over Davis asleep on the cot. As the flare outside drops to the ground, the light and shadow in the bunker move up the wall and finally flicker out. 
I stand and turn back to the darkness. My eyes are on the wire. Remembering my snack, I remove the cookie from my breast pocket and open the small plastic bag. The cookie has smashed into pieces. I swallow down the last crumb and turn to Davis. It's his turn to stand watch. My night is over. I made it through an enemy attack, but never fired my weapon. I don't know if that was a good thing or not. But after this night, I know I'm ready. I know what fear is, and I will not hesitate to do my duty if things go south. Davis! Hey man! Wake up! It's your watch! Chapter 7 Something New Get up, Talbot! Get up now! Davis yells. I snap to a sitting position. My eyes still heavy, I search for my boots. What time is it, man? It's 0530, get your ass up. What happened to sleeping in? I thought we had a deal. Things change. We just got fragged for a patrol. You got 15 mics to grab chow, check your gear, and be on the road. I respond sarcastically, almost yelling, I got time to take a piss? Davis walks out without answering. I got lucky. Being a wise-ass to my team leader can get me in a bind. With my boots on, I'm out the hatch looking for a place to piss. Across the road are some bushes. That's where I go. Finished, I'm back in the bunker grabbing my box of sea rations when I hear, Let's go, Talbot, on the road. You got five mics. I mumble, What happened to fifteen minutes? I grab a John Wayne and open a can of crackers and a peach jam. With no time to eat, I scoop out the jam with a plastic spoon and shovel it all in my mouth along with the crackers. I chew the mass trying to keep it in, but it's pointless. I wipe the jam and crumbs off my lips while opening the accessory packet. Every Marine knows the most important things are the box of four cigarettes and the toilet paper. The items fall on the rack. I rustle through them and find what I'm looking for. But then I spot something rarely included in sea rations. This is something every Marine wants, and I get it. Hot sauce. This is my lucky day. I shove everything into my kangaroo pockets. The spaghetti and beef chunks go into my ass pack for later. With my deuce gear, flak jacket, and weapon, I'm out the hatch. The morning is still dark, and the squad is formed up and ready to move out. I join my fire team. Happy you can make it, Talbot, Davis says. Hey, Holloway, man, where are we heading? Dog patch, like always. Shit, why are we running patrols through the village? Marine and Navy personnel are here all the time. You'll see. Just do what you're told, FNG. We begin by going to the gate between the bunkers and dog patch. As we walk into the village, Davis tells us, Everyone load a magazine. Talbot, keep your chamber empty. I pull a magazine from a pouch and shove it into the receiver. The weapon is on safe, but with no round in the chamber, it doesn't matter. As the sun rises, the villagers wake. They gather outside their homes and businesses, preparing for the day. The streets are more like paths than thoroughfares. They are so narrow that sometimes we're only a couple of feet away from the people. This situation makes me nervous. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do if one of them gets hostile. There's so much bullshit about how we're to handle our weapons. Do I wait until someone shoots at me before I shoot back? This is a fucked up war. The patrol comes to a halt when we reach the far end of the village. In front of us, rice paddies stretch from the villages to the city of Danang. Sergeant Ballister sends his first fire team out as a point in a wedge formation. The other teams fall in covering the left and right flanks. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do until Davis finally tells us, Listen up. Lock and load. I ask Meat, Does that mean we chamber around? That's right, Don. Just make sure you keep your weapon on safe. I pull back the charging handle and let the bolt slam forward. I'm loaded. Walking through the water-covered rice fields, my feet are soaking wet. I've never been in a rice paddy field before. Never seen one before last night. The first thing I notice is the odor. The smell is a musty aroma. It's like raw sewage. 
The stench seems to rise off the sprawling rice paddies, and a gripping, humid heat joins it. Every step is like walking in quicksand as my feet sink into the ground. The water makes a slushing noise with every step. Sergeant Ballister looks back. Get out of the fucking water, Talbot! I notice everyone in the squad is walking on raised mounds of dirt that run through the rice paddies. These dikes separate the different fields. I step up and smile, taking my feet out of the water. Jimmy Holloway asks with a laugh, Hey, Talbot, <laughs> are the dikes better than the water? I ignore him and ask Meat, who's right behind me, I thought Vietnam was jungle. Where are all the trees? I ain't ever seen any jungle, he answers. Vietnam is supposed to be a thick forest filled with snakes and bugs. Like I said, all I've seen since I got here are rice paddies. We hump along for a while. Morning turns to late afternoon. In the distance, a farmer with a large animal I've never seen before is pulling what looks like a plow. This animal is huge. Its nose is long and narrow. Its ears fall down below its snout. The creature also has large horns that curl backward toward its ass. What the hell is that? I ask. You see that bull, new guy? shouts Ballister. Take a good look. You think it would be bad to shoot one of those gooks in the village? You shoot one of these bulls and your ass is grass and jag is the lawnmower. They'll throw you in the brig, fine you a year's salary, and give it to the dink. I turn back to meat and ask, Brig time for killing a bull? Ballister's bullshitting me, right? You shoot a water buffalo, you got no defense. They'll send you home in chains. What Ballister is telling you is fact. So that's a water buffalo? I heard about them, but never seen one. Spread out! Ballister orders as the team drifts closer together. Meat, still close behind me, shares a story. I knew this guy from Marble Mountain, a gunner on a UH-34. He told me about this other gunner who started shooting everything he saw with his M60. He killed a bunch of gooks and got arrested. They tried his ass in Japan, found him innocent. He claimed the gooks all had weapons and were shooting at him. Really, he got off that easy? I guess the pilot reported that he was taking fire before the jarhead opened up. They couldn't prove the dead gooks didn't have weapons. But that's not where the story ends. He's doing time right now for killing a water buffalo. They didn't get him for killing innocent people, but they got him for killing one of those bulls? That's fucked up. Maybe so, says Davis, joining the conversation. But that animal is the lifeblood of the Vietnamese farmers. They lose a water buffalo, they starve. Sergeant Ballister holds up a fist and the squad halts. Everyone take five. He signals the fire team leaders over and they have a powwow. Light up a smoke? asks a Marine from Corporal Mulch's team. Smoking lamp is lit, answers Ballister. The meeting ends and Davis returns. Sarge says we're setting up a night ambush and listening post. There's an oasis a click east of here. We're going to be out all night? Holloway complains. That's right. Battalion needs this listening post up and running. We got chosen because we're the best. You should feel honored, Holloway. Fuck that. The only honor I need is that flight home in a freedom bird. Ballister orders, On your feet, we're moving out. The squad gets up and turns east. The dikes run north and south, so we now slog our way through the water. Two hours later, I make out something green in the middle of the rice paddies. It's a long way off. Is that the oasis? I ask. That's it, answers Davis. As we get closer, I see trees clustered in the middle of the rice paddy. The thought of stepping out of the water and onto dry land makes me smile. When we finally arrive, I size the place up. We're in a clump of trees, or jungle. The whole island can't be more than 50 square yards. Mulch and Davis set up our defenses. They start with placing claymore mines and some trip flares to the east and the south. Ballister says it's the most likely approach for the enemy. Our fire team sets in at the east end, but we need one more. 
This skinny guy from the second fire team joins us. While he tries to get under cover, I can tell he's over six feet tall. What I like most about him is what he brings to our team. An M79 grenade launcher. That's a badass weapon. As he crawls past me to set up next to Jimmy, I ask him, Your weapon, it fires 40 millimeter grenades, right? Yeah, it does. You ever seen one before? I got to play with it in ITR. Its kick hurt my shoulder. Positioned next to Davis, I ask, Do you think we'll see any VC tonight? I don't know, Don. That attack last night was well planned and executed to perfection. If Bravo Company had not been on full alert, the outcome could have been a whole lot different. I'm in over my head. These guys all seem to know what they're doing, but I don't. And that can cost me. Or another Marine. I ask Davis, What happens if the gooks come through here with a large force? We sit tight, he says. If there's too many to handle, we let them pass. And then we radio in their position to headquarters. If there's only four or five, or maybe a sniper crew, we waste them. Snipers? Are there snipers in Dogpatch? No, not that I know. He turns to me with a sly smile and says, But there's always a first time. Our defenses are set. Now we wait. Soon dusk will turn to night. When darkness sets in, the squad goes all quiet. Watches have been set. There are three Marines on guard at the same time, one from each fire team. They start at 2200 and last until 0600, just as the sun is rising. My watch is from midnight to 0200. In the darkness, I can't sleep. The thought of the enemy walking up to where we are harboring scares the shit out of me. Even though it's pitch dark, I can still see the other Marines. Most are already asleep. I relax, lay my head down, and think of home. I think of my mom, my brothers, and my sister. The day has been tough. The hump was difficult, especially through the water. My eyes close and I drift off to sleep. Meat wakes me when it's my turn. After he hands me the handset, he whispers, Listen, do nothing else. If you see anything, you wake Davis, got it? I take the handset and place it to my ear. It's silent, which worries me. Is it on? I look for a knob to turn while thinking, what if it got turned off? I won't be able to get help if we need it. I don't know much about this, Prick 25, but when I turn a knob and a loud static fills my ear, I know the radio is fine, and the squelch, if left alone, will kill the static. I turn the knob back and the static disappears. I stare out at the darkness all around. An enemy could be right on top of me and I'd never see him. The moon is only a sliver tonight. The clouds roam from here to there, sometimes blocking what little light the moon gives. Silence surrounds us. Not even the insects are talking. I stay awake and finish my two hours, waking Jimmy Holloway at 0200. He whispers, Anything to report? I shake my head, hand him the radio handset, and curl up on the ground for my night's sleep. At 0600, we're all awake. Ballister tells us, If you got anything to eat, do it now. Is the smoking lamp lit? I ask. No. Chow down. We stay in the oasis until 0700 when Davis finally tells us, Smoking lamp is lit. I open the pack of four Winston cigarettes I took from the sea rations packet and light one up. I take a huge inhalation of smoke and feel the tingling in my lungs. I hold it for a moment, then exhale. Man, that feels so good. We finish the patrol with no VC activity and return to our Quonset huts in Da Nang. The squad has 24 hours off and we start that time with showers. The shower room walls are made of tin. They're about five feet tall. From the top of the tin walls to the roof stretch screens to keep the mosquitoes out. There are six double-head showers, so two guys sharing is a must. The water is warm. Not hot, but better than cold. After we dry off, we head back to our hooch. Sitting on my rack next to Davis, I ask, Hey man, you seemed pretty calm when we were attacked in our bunkers the other night. 
You see many rocket attacks? No, at least not here. Last month's rocket attack on Da Nang was my first since being in Delta. But the one the other day with you, that was hairy. Especially with those damn sappers in the wire. What do you mean, at least not here? This is my second tour. I did my first in 66. I was with Foxtrot 2 of 7. We were part of Operation Utah. Ever hear of it? I shake my head. Well, that was a battle. It went on for, hell, four to five months. I was wounded, shrapnel to my back. It was a rocket attack like the one we went through. Only those rockets were coming down on my position. Shit, man, why are you back in Nam? They sent me to Japan. I was only there for a week and supposed to come back. But my mom died, so I went home on emergency leave. After that, I was TAD for six months in Lejeune. Then they sent me back here to finish my 13-month tour. So when do you go home? I arrived back in country in October, but they started me over as if that was my first day. Damn, that totally sucks. How'd they get away with it? They took my entire time in Nam and added the time I spent back in the States. It all went past my regular 13-month tour of duty. Since I did less than six months, I had to start over. At least that's how the first sergeant explained it. Davis steps out of our hooch, and I realize the Corps can do anything it wants. Sending Davis back to finish his tour of duty, and then telling him he has to do another tour? That sucks. The big green weenie strikes again. Chapter 8 Easy as Breathing May 12, 1967 Tet minus 263 days. I wake to the sound of the armed forces radio disc jockey yelling, Good morning, Vietnam! Corporal Mulch has our reveille set for 0600. Instead of the bugle, he uses a DJ. He plays this game. Whoever names the first song and the artist goes straight to chow. No police call. I hear the words, She would never say where she came from. I shout, I know this! It's, it's, Ruby Tuesday, Rolling Stones, yells Meat. With a smile, Mulch says, head on out to chow, Meat, we'll see you there. Mulch looks around the hooch. Let's go, people, we need to get on the road. The sooner we finish the police call, the sooner we go to chow. Don't forget, our platoon is the reactionary force today. Make sure your deuce gear is ready to go on your racks. Staff Sergeant Trembley will hold a rifle inspection at 1100 hours. You know his rule. Anyone in reactionary fails inspection, the whole squad is in a world of shit. Take the time to clean your weapons the right way. While we're getting dressed, I ask, Hey Mulch, do you think Sergeant Ballister is on the Freedom Bird yet? He looks at me like I'm some kind of stupid. Shit, Talbot, he's in Okinawa by now. Yeah, for sure, says Mike, a lanky Marine from the second fire team. Hey, Mulch, you took over the squad on what, Monday? Today is... What the fuck is today? Boots on, I stand up, still buttoning my blouse, and shout out, It's Saturday! No fucking way it's Saturday, shouts Meat. It's Thursday! Davis corrects us. It's Friday, and Mulch took over for Ballister last Monday. It's been five days. He's on his way back to the world. I bet he'll land in California sometime today. Mulch puts his hand on Davis's shoulder. Get them on the road. Last week, Sergeant Ballister rotated back to the world. Corporal Mulch, his assistant, took over as squad leader. Davis, number three in the chain of command, is now number two. Let's go! First squad on the road, orders Davis. I'm hungry. Get this shit done. Meat takes off for chow, and we head outside for our morning police call. Maybe tomorrow I'll win. Picking up someone else's cigarette butts pisses me off. I smoke, and when I finish, mine goes in my pocket. Every jarhead knows this. Has to be Navy squids. Every morning is the same. We wake to the radio, do our police call, and then chow. If we're not reactionary, then we're patrolling or doing guard duty at the bunkers. We never do anything different, and we never see any action. 
I feel like I've been here a year, but it's only been two months. Today is day 60, according to my short-timer calendar. I cross off Friday, May 12th, before going outside. Pay attention, Don. Get that wrapper under your foot, Davis tells me. I look down and lift my foot, bend over, and grab someone's candy wrapper. Got it, Frederick, I smile. Davis doesn't say anything about me using his first name. He and I have grown close, but using it with other Marines around is not good. His look tells me not to do it again. When you're bored, your mind can think of some stupid shit, like, I wish the VC would attack. I've had this rifle since I got here and never fired it one time. How fucked up is that? If there's a war in Vietnam, it isn't here. We finish the police call and head to Chow. We find Meat sitting alone and join him. In the mess line today, we have scrambled eggs with Marine Corps green tossed in for color. They also have bacon, cold toast, and no butter. Yesterday it was sausage, and the day before it was SOS. Shit on a shingle. That's the best thing the mess hall serves. Meat laughs, elbowing me as I sit. You're crazy, Talbot. I ain't ever seen a guy smile so much as you. You know, Talbot, adds Jimmy, sometimes I see you start to laugh even when you're alone. Are you trying for a Section 8? You guys are always complaining about everything. The chow is no good, police calls in the morning, I keep smiling. Even when something pisses me off, I try to stay happy. Y'all should try it. You might find it's better to be happy and relaxed than always uptight and miserable. Day 60 drags on, and since 1st Platoon is on duty, our squad is ordered to stay around the hooch. We need to be ready if called to support Marines on patrol that might have walked into a world of shit. But a likelier scenario would be the bunkers getting hit and overrun. Several possible threats to the airport or the city itself could cause the reactionary force to be deployed. But like every other reactionary force I've been on, it will be nothing but a waste of time. Evening chow is good tonight. Fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and corn. We have a salad, too, but the chicken is the best. Usually it's cooked so long it's like eating rubber. Tonight it's crispy and moist. So good. Back at the hooch, Meat and Holloway sit on my rack and ask, You ready, man? For what? With a shitload of sarcasm, Holloway answers, The club, dummy! The whole squad is going to the club. Shit, that's right. It opens tonight. Get your boots on, Talbot, Davis orders. Let's go, man. The place ain't that big. We want to get a table or two. What about reactionary? Aren't we still on duty? How can we... Platoon sergeant says we had the best rifle inspection he's seen. They only need 30 bodies tonight. That means one squad gets the night off. With a wide smile, I laugh. Tremblay gave us the night off? Ah, fuck, man. The staff sergeant can be cool. I put on my boots and lace them as fast as I can, then run up and out to catch the squad. Where's Mulch? I ask when I don't see him. He'll meet us there later. He has some personal business to take care of, Davis tells us. Let's go, man. I need a beer, Crux bellows. The club is a raised building with steps leading to the entranceway. Above the hatch is a sign reading, Enlisted Club. Inside, a dozen tables spread across a small room. We're not the first to get there, and many tables are taken. Davis spots two tables near the bar and yells, Don Holloway, there, by the bar, go now! We run through the club, sidestepping those already seated. Holloway grabs a table, and I hold the other. We push them together to make one large tabletop. We have twelve marines, but only eight chairs. Unable to coax any more from the bartender, some guys stand, and a couple try to share a seat. Anyone got any money? asks Jimmy. I heard they're not accepting MPC, says Davis. That's bullshit, answers Crux. He gets up from the table. First round's on me. He returns, carrying a dozen cans of Pabst Blue Ribbon beer on a tray. Each beer opened with the bartender's can opener. This shit cost me three bucks. You guys buy your own round next time. I shout, Hey, you guys feel that? Everyone stops and stares at my smiling face. 
The expressions on theirs tell me they don't have a clue. Crux says, What the hell are you talking about, Talbot? Don't you guys feel it? Feel what, man? asks Davis. Now I'm looking at them like they're all dumb. What's the one thing different about this club over any other building we grunts can use? I wait for a response, but no one has any idea. It's air-conditioned. This place has air conditioning. Can't any of you feel it? Is anyone still sweating? Holloway joins in. He's right. Shit, man. You feel how cool it is? Oh, I could get used to this. The beer we get here is Budweiser and Pabst Blue Ribbon. You can't pick what you want. You get what they give you. Sometimes they have Coca-Cola, but it's not what we want. The drinks here are better than what we get in Dogpatch, though. Here, it's all cold. I'm tired of warm Vietnamese rice beer. Too bitter. It's not American. A few beers in me and I'm feeling good. Crux tells us a story about this visiting second lieutenant. He was up in the tower with him on our last 24-hour assignment. So this dumb shit starts telling me what I have to do if the enemy attacks the line. He keeps referring to being there. What the hell is being there? I'm ignoring his bullshit. He thinks because he's wearing a bar, he knows more about our line than I do. Then, I hear him swear as he slaps himself. Crux is trying not to laugh. So, I turn around and the lieutenant says, Something bit me. I'm infected. I better get it checked out. I need to make an appointment for sickbay. What time can I do that? Crux laughs. He wants to know. Comments come from everyone. What a dumb shit says Davis. Jimmy, laughing, says, he thinks he has to make an appointment? Wait, wait, says Crux. It gets better. It's like 2300 and I want him gone. So I say, let me see what bit you. He rolls his arm over and there's nothing there. I tell him, that looks bad. That's a boca bite. What the hell is a boca bite? asks Mike. How in the fuck do I know? I made it up. So listen, I tell him he needs to get to sick bay ASAP. I tell him we had a Marine almost die from that bite last week. Get to the Jeep, sir. Tell the driver you were bitten and need to get to sick bay ASAP. He gathers up his gear, and as he leaves, I tell him, Sir, we need batteries. Stop by HQ and pick up some arc light batteries. Get a dozen. He nods and repeats, arc light. What a dumb shit. When we drink a lot of beer, everything is funny. I'm laughing my ass off when at the corner table next to the bar is a team of Marines unlike us. Sometimes Marines from outside our MP battalion pass through our area. I've never seen a recon Marine before, and I'm intrigued, wondering, is that who these guys are? I heard about them. I asked Davis, hey, are those recon Marines? Davis looks, yeah. A reconnaissance battalion is down the road a couple of miles. How can you tell the recon? Their utility's a camouflage. That's definitely recon. What do you think they're doing here? Sometimes they run patrols out of dog patch. They'll hump their way through the rice paddies to the jungle a few clicks away. Real badasses, huh? Davis stares at them for a few seconds. No different than us. Davis is right. Like us, they're Marines. But I also know these Marines, like the grunts in the bush, have seen action. The longer I'm here without even seeing a VC, the more I want to fight. I stand, pick up my chair, and walk over to their table. Hey, Don, where the hell are you going? Meade asks. I don't look back. I want to talk to them. At their table, I set my chair down. With a broad smile, I ask, How you guys doing? The leader, a corporal, asks, What can we do for you? My name is Talbot. I'm 0311. You guys are recon, right? Yeah, we are. You got a problem with that? The corporal asks. Oh no, hell no. I wanted to ask you guys a question, if that's all right. The corporal looks me over and says, Sit. He stares for a moment and tells me, Ask away. Grunt. Thanks. I've been in country for two months. I'm a little ashamed to say this, but I have never even seen a VC. I mean, I'm on bunker guard and I go on patrols, set up night ambushes and listening posts. 
Not a single VC have I seen. What about you guys? I bet you've seen plenty, huh? A Marine sitting to my right asks, What do you want to know, Grunt? You want to know what it's like to kill? He pauses and leans into me, almost putting his face on mine. He whispers, You want to know what it feels like to be a life taker? Hell, Grunt, I'm a heartbreaker. He falls back into his chair and smiles, telling everyone, He wants to know what it's like to kill a gook. I don't know what to say, but that is exactly what I want to know. The Marine who asks me the question shakes his head but says nothing. I look into the eyes of each man around the table. Their gaze is the same, blank and unfocused. Their eyes are empty. Then the corporal asks, You want to know, should the time come to kill, will you be able to do it? Not once, but over and over. That's what you want to know, isn't it? I don't move or answer. How can I say, Yeah, that's what I want to know? The dude is scaring the shit out of me. The corporal and I stare at each other. Then he leans into me and says these words, words I will never forget. You know who you are, what you're made of. War is in your blood. It's in everyone's blood. When the time comes, don't fight it. Killing is as easy as breathing when you're pushed. I stare at him as those words, killing is as easy as breathing, go through my mind. I get up and look down, my usual grin vanishing. I look across the recon team, pick up my chair, and return to a table filled with guys laughing. I sit down and Meat asks, What'd they have to say? Did they tell you why they're here? I force my smile back and answer my friend, Nah, they didn't want to talk. Meat pushes another beer in front of me. Drink up, man. This one's on me. I pick up the beer, glance over to the recon table, and see the corporal staring back. My smile fades, and I turn back to my squad. Chapter 9 Donut Dollies and Fast Cars June 11th, 1967. Tet minus 223 days. Boredom continues as I begin my third month in Nam. My friends are those in my fire team, and today we're heading to Freedom Hill. Hey, meat, you going to the hill? I ask. Hell yeah. You've been there before, right? Yeah, this is my second time. Before I can ask anything more, Davis hurries us. Let's go, you two. We don't have all day. Bring your weapon and a full magazine. A check of my wallet shows I have all my pay certificates. I pick up my weapon and slide the loaded magazine into my kangaroo pocket. Now I'm ready. Holloway and Meat stop at my rack and ask, You got a full metal jacket? I slap the side pocket of my trousers to say I do. Cool. Let's go. And the three of us follow Davis out the hatch. We heading for the highway or going through dog patch? Asks Holloway. Y'all see a truck, flag it down. Davis squawks. I ain't going through that shithole. We do that enough. We'll hump out of here and catch a ride to the hill. Before we reach the main gate, a six-by truck rolls up behind us. The driver stops and leans out his window. You guys heading for Freedom Hill? You want a ride? Davis walks up to the driver, smiling. Yeah, man, we can use a ride. Climb aboard, Corporal. The ride out the gate and down Highway 1 is short. The driver stops across from Freedom Hill and Davis yells, Let's go, people. Time's a-wastin'. We jump down and walk across the street. A screened-in shack is a gateway into Freedom Hill. We enter in single file through a small enclosed porch attached to the building. Military police are collecting everyone's weapons. I guess we're not allowed to carry them inside. On the other side of the building is the same style porch. People leaving the area pick up their weapons there. Our rifles turned in, we step off the porch and into Freedom Hill. Ahead of me, buildings line a single road. The scene reminds me of a shopping center back home. There's a barber shop, a massage parlor, a huge cafeteria with the smell of burgers frying, and, of course, the post exchange. The PX is our first stop. 
We walk inside and I find so many things to buy, it's like I'm back shopping at Camp Pendleton. The others take off searching for what they need, so I grab a hand basket and start shopping. The PX has everything, even a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. They have fans for the hooch, toiletries for personal use. But when I see the stacks of cigarettes and my lucky strikes, I'm happy. I put four cartons of cigarettes in my basket. Next, I head over to the food aisles. My eyes open wide. The aisles are filled with canned pork and beans, spaghetti and meatballs, ravioli, cans of lasagna, and so much more. I'm smiling so hard, I almost laugh. I fill my basket with a variety of canned goods. Next, it's candy. The aisle is filled with delicious pogey bait. I fill my basket with all the sweets I can. There are gummies, red Twizzlers, Reese's peanut butter cups, and a host of chocolate Hershey treats. My basket full, I head over to a cashier. Halfway there, I stop cold when I spot something I've wanted even before I enlisted. A Polaroid instant camera. This thing takes a picture and in seconds it's developed. How fucking cool is that? I grab the camera and a couple of boxes of film and find a way to slip them into my basket. While I wait in line, Holloway grabs my arm. Come on, Don, we're going next door to get cheeseburgers, fries, and coke. My eyes are open wide at the thought of burgers. I tell Holloway, I gotta pay for all this shit. He looks at what I have. Man, that's a lot. You sure you got enough money? They take MPC, right? Of course. How much you bring? Everything I'm paid over the last three months. Ninety bucks. Yeah, you should have enough. The cashier, a Vietnamese woman, rings me up. The total, including the Polaroid, comes to $47.50. I pay the lady, then follow Holloway to the cafeteria next door. We walk in, and the place is huge. The sounds of the Beach Boys singing Good Vibrations wails over loudspeakers. Vendors are selling everything from stereos to automobiles. A section of tables is set aside for those eating. Along the wall stretches a grill with guys waiting to order. Davis and Meat are in line, so Holloway and I join them. The sound of sizzling burgers on the grill makes my mouth water. The smell of those burgers, combined with the french fries coming out of their grease, has me thinking more of home than being in Nam, The local burger joint across from the high school where I spent many a lunch period comes into focus. I can almost feel myself there. You two get everything you want? asks Davis. Don did, but I still have to see someone. Holloway looks over the cafeteria. The guy I need to see isn't here right now, but he said he's always around. He looks at Davis. He'll be here. I get the feeling Davis knows what Holloway is talking about, but I have no idea. I give my order. I'll take a double cheeseburger, french fries, and a cherry Coke. Do you have cherry Coke? She repeats my order back to me in broken English. Cheeseburger, two fry, and Harry Coca-Cola, right? I have no idea if she got the Coke part right, but I nod. She turns to the girls behind her at the grill and speaks in Vietnamese. A few minutes later, the food is ready, and when we sit at a table, the first thing I do is take a sip of my drink. I'm surprised when I taste the bite of the Coke in my throat and the sweet cherry flavor. She got it right. I look around and bite into the hot and juicy double cheeseburger. My grin must stretch across my entire face because Meat asks, What the hell you smiling about now, Talbot? Is the burger that good? I look across the table and explain what I'm thinking. This place makes me feel like I'm back in Harvey. There was this hamburger joint by my high school. I'd go there when I was on my school lunch. Meat looks around and then back at me with a frown. This is the kind of place you hung out in? Still smiling, I say, Maybe it's the music playing or the smell of those burgers frying, but yeah. If I close my eyes, you know what I see? Not all you jarheads in green utilities, but guys with long hair and girls in miniskirts. You guys ever have that favorite place you and your buds would go? Meat and Holloway respond by laughing, but Davis remains silent. He doesn't join in. He ignores us. 
Yeah, shouts Meat. Girls are wearing those bell-bottoms. When I get home, I want some of that free love I hear about, you know? Holloway adds, like flowers all over their clothes. We laugh. For a few moments, we're not in Nam. We're in California or Detroit or, for me, back in Harvey, Illinois. We're hanging out at our favorite malt shop. Everyone is reminiscing about home. Everyone except Davis. Corporal, what about you? Any memories from those high school days? Davis doesn't smile. I didn't grow up in one of your white neighborhoods. When I went to school, we stayed in for lunch. They tried to protect us from those people selling drugs or the gangbangers. You know, you leave the building, you ain't coming back. Our smiles and laughter fade away, and we stare at our team leader. If you have anything left to do, do it now, Davis says. Remember, we're on guard duty tonight. We finish our food in silence and then stand to get rid of our trash when Davis points across the room. Hey, let's check that out. We all turn and see a crowd forming. What's that all about? I ask. Donut dollies, Meat answers with a sly grin. They were here last time, too. Donut dollies? I ask. Yeah, man. Round eyes handing out free donuts. Come on, let's get ours. I remember hearing about these girls working for the Red Cross. They volunteered to come to Vietnam and bring a little bit of home to the soldiers fighting here. Come on, let's move. Those donuts don't last long, Davis tells us. The four of us rush over to get in line. These are the first round-eyed girls I've seen in three months. They're young and pretty, wearing light blue dress uniforms with the Red Cross emblem around one arm. This one girl, a brunette, asks me, What's your name, Marine? My voice cracking, I say, Don, what's yours? I'm Peggy. She hands me a chocolate donut and asks, You want a coffee or juice with that donut? No, thanks. I'm good. The girls will talk with any guy who wants their company. I want to sit down and ask her about home, find out what's going on back in the world. But my shyness holds me back. It's one thing I still haven't lost since being here. That keeps me silent. I say no more, and with my donut in hand, I walk away. Holloway pulls on my arm. Check this, Don. I'm buying a car. That stops me cold. You're what? I'm buying a car. Come on, you can help me decide. What do you mean, you're buying a car? I'll show you. Come on. I follow him to a table where a guy sits having a cup of coffee. In front of him lie colorful brochures of hot cars. I see the Mustang GT350 and the 500. There are brochures on the Pontiac GTOs and Chevy Chevelle SS. The last one is what Holloway wants. He sits down and tells the guy, I want the SS with the 396 cubic inch engine. How the hell does this work? I ask. The salesman hears me and answers while Holloway picks up the Chevy brochure. You bank your money every month, right? Most of it, yeah. How much do you bank? I only take $30 a month. You're an E2, right? Yeah, I am. When are you picking up E3? I don't know. It doesn't matter. You're banking the majority of your pay plus your combat pay. When you leave Vietnam, you can be the owner of a 1967 automobile of your choice. And when you buy here, you pay no sales tax. I'm still not sure how this works, but Holloway is ready to sign. The salesman tells him, your car will be waiting for you when you get home. This is great, Don, Holloway encourages me. Why don't you buy one? Buying a car is not what's on my mind. I leave Holloway sitting with the salesman and walk outside. Davis is sitting on a bench having a smoke, so I join him. He asks, Holloway buy that car? Yeah, I think so. We both sit in silence until I ask, Say, Davis, what do you know about that cap unit? You remember the first sergeant telling us they were looking for volunteers? You all thinking about joining? Maybe. You know. When I joined the Big Green Machine, I wanted to see what war was all about. If there's a war in Vietnam, it's not around here. Davis looks at me and shakes his head. Listen, Don, you got it good here. You don't want what's out there. I stare back for a moment. 
Yeah, you're right. But still, what about those CAP guys? You know what they do? CAP is short for Combined Action Program. They set up in small units and live in a village with the Vietnamese. You mean like Dogpatch? No, small villages. Dogpatch is like a city. You work with the local PF militia, and those villages are in the boonies. PF, what's that? Popular force. They're Vietnamese militia who live in those villages. They're dinks too young or too old to be an Arvin. I reply, Army of the Republic, Vietnam. Davis looks at his watch. Go find Holloway and I'll get meat. We need to start heading back. After we round up the team, we catch a ride back to our main gate, then hump the rest of the way to our hooch. Inside, we find the squad has gone to the mess hall. Let's go, Davis tells us. We still can make chow. We catch up to Corporal Mulch and the first squad. After chow, we're back in the hooch making our final preparations for the guard. On my rack, I unpack my stuff from the PX. I slide a large amount of assorted pogey bait and a can of spaghetti and meatballs into my pack. Everything else I put in my footlocker. Corporal Mulch walks into the hooch and announces, We're on the road in ten mics. My pack, my weapon, and my deuce gear are ready. At 1900, we fall out. The six-by pulls up, and like the last three months, we climb in and ride to the bunker line. Tonight, my bunker buddy is Holloway. Since we became the first fire team, our bunkers now face dog patch. The possibility of seeing even a sapper is less likely. Once again, we settle into another boring night. At midnight, I start my second watch. June 12th, another day passes. I'll check it off my short-timer calendar when I get back to the hooch. Around 0100, I get this sudden urge to take a dump. I wake Holloway, who is not happy. I leave the bunker and all my gear behind, including my weapon, to look for the head. They move it every few days, and now it's down the line several yards. It's a pain in the ass to find it, especially at night. I find it, drop my trousers, and sit and relax. I'm thinking of home when sirens start wailing from behind the line. I shout, We're under attack! Chapter 10 Running for My Life A nearby explosion startles me. Outside the head, I hear men running and shouting. I pull up my trousers and get ready to leave when another explosion hits a few yards away. The building shakes as dirt and debris collide with it. I fall to one knee but get back up just as quickly. Inside the head, I smell the diesel fuel coming from the barrels of shit. This is not a good place to hole up. Even though it's not as flammable as gasoline, it will still burn. I open the door and start to leave when I remember. I left my rifle in the bunker with Holloway. It's too dark to run full out. I don't want to stumble or trip, so I'm trying to stay halfway between the bunkers and the berm behind the line. A swooshing sound has me stop and look up. I watch as an incoming rocket flies over me on its way to Da Nang. I begin again and stumble, then fall as another rocket slams twenty yards in front of me. The force from the blast keeps me down. I start to get up, but more explosions send me back into the dirt, with my arms and hands covering my head. More rockets flying past. I look up again and see the sky filled with enemy missiles. Then I hear the far-off explosions as the rockets hit Da Nang. This is the first time the enemy has sent rockets into our line of bunkers. Ground attacks will follow. Sappers are coming. I've got to get back to Holloway. I'm on my feet and moving. Off to my left, between the bunkers, the rice paddies light up. Artillery illumination shells are exploding over them. The brightness spreads past the bunkers, casting shadows across the access road. It's giving me enough light to run faster. I no sooner begin than another rocket hits. Back on the ground, I look behind me. A hundred yards away, I see more explosions. The enemy is walking his rockets down our line, and they're heading straight for me. I look for the closest bunker, find one with an open hatch, run and dive in, stumbling to the ground. Without warning, a dog attacks me. The animal bites and clamps onto my leg above my boot. I scream in pain. What the fuck? Someone else in the bunker yells commands to the dog. He must be the handler. Finally, the animal obeys and lets go. 
Upset, I holler, what's with your dog, man? Though it's dark, he's close enough for me to see his collar insignia. He's not Marine Corps. Who the hell are you? Sappers are coming, he shouts. How the hell was I supposed to know who you were? I could have shot you, you know. Who the hell are you? I yell back. I'm Airman Nice. Your Air Force? He nods while hanging on to his animal, who is still trying to get at me. Grabbing my leg in pain, I ask, What is the Air Force doing in Delta Company's AO? My unit received a request for dog handlers, and I volunteered. The Marine who was here with me left to get info on what's happening. What's happening? We're under fucking attack, that's what's happening. I look down at my bleeding leg and glare back at the Air Force puke. A Marine enters the bunker, eyes cast down as he tells his Air Force partner, We're on alert for a possible... He stops when he sees me. Who the fuck are you? And what are you doing in my bunker? The airman tries to explain. My dog attacked him when he ran in. His leg is bleeding. The Marine pulls up my trouser and looks at the wound. You're going to need stitches. You need to get back to your bunker. What's your company? Delta. You were about to say something about an alert. What was it? The sergeant becomes tight-lipped. You're a dumb shit. This ain't Delta. This is Bravo Company. What the hell are you doing this far down the line? I had to take a shit. I kept walking until I found a head. Now tell me what you've learned. Sappers. HQ expects they'll hit us as soon as the bombing stops. The sergeant is pissed. Every company has its own head. You walked right past Delta's, dipshit. He looks around and asks, Where's your weapon? In my bunker. I didn't think I needed to take a shit. The airman interrupts. Hey, listen. The rockets have stopped. The Marine and I lock eyes. We know what's coming next. They wouldn't hit the line with this many rockets if they weren't going to attack, the sergeant says. Moving forward to the bunker's firing slit, he quietly adds, Sappers are coming. I stay seated, watching the dog, while the airman tries to keep it quiet. I have no intention of provoking another attack. I tell the dog handler, Give me a bandage from your med utility pouch. He does, and I wrap the bite to slow the bleeding. I look down at my watch. We've been getting hit for 30 minutes. The sergeant nods, staring across the rice paddies. An hour later, the enemy still hasn't appeared. A man walks past the bunker yelling, All clear! Relieved there is no ground attack, I'm out of the bunker, limping back to Jimmy Holloway. I hobble into my dugout and Holloway screams, Where the hell have you been, Talbot? Without answering, I limp over to the rack and pick up my gear and weapon. Holloway points at my blood-stained, bandaged leg. Hey, Don, you get hit? Shit, man, I wish. When the rockets landed, I ducked into another bunker. A dog inside bit me. Holloway stares for a moment, confused. I let that settle in and then tell him, I'm heading over to see the corpsman. I'll tell Gunny you're alone here. I walk to the lieutenant's bunker and find him, the corpsman, and the company gunny. Doc checks the bite, puts on a clean bandage, and tells me, You need stitches. He arranges for me to get a ride back to the battalion aid station. The lieutenant and the gunny want to know what happened, so I explain. The three of them share a good laugh at my expense. After the jeep arrives, I take a short trip to battalion aid. The doctor at the sick bay removes the bandage and checks the wound. This wasn't caused by shrapnel. It looks like an animal bite. What happened to your leg, Private? A dog bit me, sir. The doctor orders the corpsman, Give him a tetanus shot and an anesthetic. I'll clean and stitch him up. The corpsman grabs two syringes and fills them with the medication ordered. While injecting me, the doctor asks, How'd this happen? I ran into a bunker unannounced. I guess the dog didn't like that. The doctor stops and turns toward me. So a dog did bite you? I nod. This dog, you know where it came from? I do. It's an Air Force handler's animal. As he begins the stitching process, the doc asks, What exactly happened, for the record? Rockets were falling all around me. I dove into this other guy's bunker. His dog didn't know who I was. It was an accident. Since it happened during an enemy attack, you can get a purple heart, if you want. I don't reply, and he says, 
You're done, PFC. I'm going to give you a light duty chit for seven days. When it's up, you come back and see me. He stares down. You want that purple heart? While the corpsman bandages my leg, I answer, For a dog bite? No thanks, sir. I hope I never need one, but if I do, it will be because I actually got wounded. The next evening, I'm sitting on my rack when the squad returns from guard duty. Davis is the first one in the hooch and sits on his rack, which faces mine. How's the leg, Don? Still hurts. You know about this? Yeah, Gunny came around and told us what happened. Sorry I got bit. No problem. Mulch sat in for you with Holloway. Corporal Mulch walks by. You owe me a beer, Talbot. I had to stand your watch instead of being in that cozy tower. You got it, man. As he walks away, I shout, Two beers, Corporal! Two beers on me! He raises his hand to acknowledge my offer. Meat drops his gear in his area and walks over to my rack, sitting next to me. They giving you a purple heart? Fuck no! They offered, but I said no. Why the hell not? I shrug. You know, man. Then I smile. With that and a quarter, I can buy a cup of coffee. Meat walks away, shaking his head. Davis, on his way to the shower, stops and sits next to me. That's a good call, Don. Refusing the PH. So, after last night, you still want to volunteer for CAP? Maybe I'll think about it for a while longer, I laugh. Yeah, well. Davis gets up and heads for the showers. I watch him walk out the hatch and wonder, is that what I want? To see what a firefight and war is like? Last night I got scared, more scared than I've ever been in my life. Last night I came close to dying. But the sappers never came, and the line didn't get attacked. No one fired a weapon, not a single round downrange. For now, I stay right here. For now, I'm going to stay bored and alive. For now, I'm going to enjoy a week of light duty and try not to feel guilty watching the squad go to work every day without me. Something tells me I'll get over it. Chapter 11 Ten Days is All We Got August 12, 1967, Tet minus 171. A new lieutenant arrived today. Why is it every time a different butter bar officer takes command, he needs to show he's in charge by disrupting our lives? Lieutenant Jackson is on his way back to the world. We hated to see him go. He did his 13 months in Nam and is on that freedom bird back to the world. The LT did some time with the grunts when he was here, too. That experience gave him the know-how for what was important in Nam. He knew how to lead, and he left us alone, treating us like men, marines, not kids who can't be trusted. The first thing this replacement does is order a junk-on-the-bunk inspection. He wants all our shit, our skivvies, which none of us wears anymore. In fact, I got rid of them. He wants our 782 gear lined up. That means we have to pull our magazines, canteens, ass packs, everything off the web belt for him to inspect. He wants our uniforms and everything issued to us placed on the bunk in a special order, like we're back in boot camp. Does he think this will motivate us? Not me, man. I've got to get out of this unit. I squint at a sky filled with sunshine. It does little to dampen my feelings about the bullshit day ahead. When Corporal Mulch told the squad what the new lieutenant wanted today, everyone was pissed. This boot camp stateside junk on the bunk is ridiculous and insulting. The first sergeant is late, as usual. He finally walks out of the company office and moves to the front of the formation. I watch him look upward as the morning sun hides behind a passing rain cloud. He calls Delta to attention and starts off with the typical morning report by each platoon. He needs to make sure everyone is present or accounted for. We are, so he moves on. If any of you remember a couple months back, there was a call for volunteers to join a CAP unit. Well, the call came again. Here's a little info for your brain housing group. CAP is the Combined Action Program, 
a unit formed to help PF, Popular Force Vietnamese, defend their villages against the VC. This is a permanent transfer, not TAD. There will be some training in country, so don't think if you volunteer you're leaving Nam. Any of you yahoos interested? He looks around the company from platoon to platoon, waiting. Do I have any volunteers? He continues to scan the company. This is it. This is how I can get the hell out of this bullshit company. I start to open my mouth when Davis says, Think of what you're about to do, Don. Don't be stupid. I stop and stare at my friend. The first sergeant, getting no response, begins to move on. Continuing to look at Davis, I shout, Here, first sergeant! I look away and continue shouting, Here, first sergeant, I volunteer! Who is that? Front and center, he orders. PFC Talbot, first sergeant! I leave my squad and move to the front of first platoon. Over here, Talbot. I march over and face him at attention. Stand at ease. Speaking so only I can hear, he asks, Why? I'm not sure what he wants. Why, First Sergeant? Why are you volunteering? If I tell him I don't want to stay in a bullshit company, it will only piss him off, so I tell him what I think he'll appreciate. When I joined the Marine Corps, First Sergeant, I wanted to fight. I wanted to know what war was. Maybe with this cap unit, I'll know. He looks at me with an expression that says, I wish I could go with you, and sighs. You know, Talbot, these cap guys can find their asses hanging out there alone should the village you're assigned to come under attack. I hear these PF gooks are not too dependable. He allows a long pause while I remain silent. Any questions? How soon can I go, First Sergeant? You in a hurry, PFC? Want to get moving is all, First Sergeant. Pack your shit. You leave immediately. As soon as he says that, a knot forms in my stomach. What the fuck did I just do? The Delta Company driver, a lance corporal, walks into my hooch as I'm tying off my sea bag. You Talbot? He asks. Yeah. You my ride? That's right. Let's go. I have to be back by ten hundred hours. The CO needs a ride to regimental headquarters. I pick up my sea bag and toss it to the driver. Put this in your jeep, will ya? He turns and walks out, carrying the bag. I pick up my web belt with my gear still attached and sling it over my shoulder. Then I pick up a smaller second bag with personal shit and my rifle, then follow him out to the waiting jeep. Outside, I'm hoping my squad is still around, but the whole company is gone. I think they might all be at Chow. Wherever they are, they left after the first sergeant dismissed me. A feeling of regret comes over me at not being able to say goodbye, but I know they'd be cool with my leaving. Maybe not Davis, but the squad. Yeah, they're okay with it. I throw the rest of my gear in the back of the jeep and, with my rifle in hand, slide into the passenger seat. The driver stares for a moment, then asks, What's the matter with you? Nothing, man. Let's just go. As he begins to drive, I ask, So where is this place? All I know is it's in Da Nang. I'm supposed to follow Highway 1, and when I get to an intersection with Marine MPs directing traffic, I turn left. Thirty minutes later, we turn left at the MPs station and head down the streets of Da Nang. The hustle and bustle of Vietnamese and Americans has me amazed. Bicycles, motor scooters, military jeeps, and foot traffic are everywhere. Horns blow as people cross the street without caring about the motorized traffic. They walk in front of our jeep, causing us to stop. It's worse than a busy day in Chicago's Chinatown. Unlike Chinatown, where the smells of rice cooking and restaurants serving food make me hungry, here the smells of overflowing sewers and human waste are all around. As we continue down the road and leave the city behind, I smell the sweet aroma of salt water. Is that the Gulf? I ask. You smell it? Yeah, I do. The company Gunny is the one who gave me these directions. He said you'd be close to the water. A few minutes later, we pull up to a gated camp and stop. A single Marine with a sidearm stands guard. What's your business? The driver answers, He's checking in for cap school. The guard lifts the gate and we enter. 
On the way, my eye catches an insignia off to the right. It's an eagle on a shield with wings spread open and two American flags draping down. As we move farther in, we pass wooden hooches with screened windows and doors. We stop when we spot what might be a company office. Though it doesn't have anything identifying it as such, it is the only building with lights on and people inside. Behind the building, I see a majestic deep blue ocean. The sounds of the water crashing make me want to take off my boots and walk peacefully into the sand. How can this be Vietnam, a country filled with so much violence? Farther out are huge waves. I watch as they approach the shore. Smaller and smaller they get until they crash. Their white foam splashes on the sand. The foam seems to stay for a moment, then hurries back out to sea. The sound of a seagull has me look skyward. The beautiful bird flies overhead, then turns and heads for the open ocean. Is that red beach? I ask. It's beautiful. Maybe, but it's not the beach you go to for R&R. Rest and recuperation. You go yet? I ask. No, not long enough in country. He reaches back and pulls my gear up to me. Take your shit and go, man. I gotta get back. I pull the sea bag out, hike it up on my shoulder, and pick up my weapon by its handle. I walk inside the lit-up hooch and ask, I'm new. Where do I stow my gear? A marine like me, a PFC, tells me, This is our hooch. Next door is open. I walk over and the place is dark and shadowy. Fading light from a sun darkened by a stormy sky seeps through. The smell of salt water has me going to the back hatchway. Outside is the reason for the odor. I'm closer to the beach than when I first saw this fantastic sight. We're on the water's edge. The beach is only feet away. I hear the waves crashing against the shore and their whisper as they pull back from the sand and return to the sea, gathering strength for another attack. I hope there'll be time for the beach. There are plenty of racks to pick from, so I choose one in the middle of the hooch, away from others' gear. A corporal walks in and asks my name. This guy is squared away. His boots are shined, and he has the most perfect high and tight haircut I've seen in a while. P.F.C. Talbot, I answer. Donald Talbot? I nod and watch as he takes a sheet of paper from his jacket pocket. Yeah, you're on my list. Come on, Talbot. The gunny is about to inform the unit on what you can expect. Hey, Corporal, my first sergeant said this wouldn't be T.A.D., but I don't have any orders telling me to report here. Don't worry about that. Your orders are on the way. The most important thing to do now is get you ready to report to your unit. All that other shit will catch up to you. Now let's go. The gunny wants to be finished and have you people turned in ASAP. I follow the corporal out the door and down a gravel road to another hooch. Inside are around 30 Marines. A quick check of rank around the room shows most are peons like me, PFCs and Lance Corporals. A couple of NCOs are in the group, but no sergeants. A gunnery sergeant stands in front of the Marines, who are all sitting on chairs in a schoolhouse setting. I grab a seat, and the corporal who brought me in joins another NCO behind the gunny. The gunny begins, Welcome to the Combined Action School in Da Nang. My name is Gunnery Sergeant Taylor. On my right is Sergeant Hicks, and on my left is Corporal Hallard. Myself and these Marines behind me will be your instructors. You will be here for ten days to learn what it takes to be a Cap Marine. Your classes will include refamiliarization with military topics and you'll learn all weapons used in theater today. They will include U.S., V.C., and N.V.A. There are classes on navigation, scouting, and patrolling. You will also learn as much of the Vietnamese language as possible. Such classes will include culture and history. The instructors for those classes will be Vietnamese. All other classes will be Marines. Gunny pauses before asking, Does anyone have a question? One guy raises his hand. These Vietnamese instructors, are they former VC or NVA? Every Vietnamese instructor has been thoroughly vetted and cleared by Marine Intelligence. You do not have to worry. Anyone else? The same Marine asks, That's a pretty nice beach out there, Gunny. Any chance we'll be able to use it? You will start tomorrow at 0800 and finish your day at 1600. 
You will have one hour for noon chow. What you do on your off time is up to you. No one else has a question, so the gunny warns us, You will not refer to any Vietnamese instructor as gook or dink. Is that understood? We all nod. The gunny continues, Upon completion of training, you will receive a certificate like this. He holds up a copy of a diploma from CAP school. You will also be issued a badge like this one. Again, he holds up a leather badge with the same insignia as on the front entrance coming into this camp. It's getting late. You people get settled in. Chow goes, he checks his watch, in 30 minutes. Reveille goes at 0530. Chow in the morning goes 0700. We have a busy day ahead of us tomorrow. You have a lot to learn in a very short time. If there are no more questions... The sergeant behind the gunny walks up and whispers something to him. Okay, one more thing, the gunny says. You cannot leave the camp and go into the city. Da Nang is restricted. He pauses. Do any of you people like to play flag football? A couple of hands go up. The Air Force is right down the road and they want to play a game against Marines. You should be advised, since I've been running this school, Cap has only lost one game to those pukes. And that unit paid for their error. The gunny lets that settle in before issuing his final order for the day. Have a good night, Marines. We'll see you in the morning. Dismissed. Chapter 12 Letters Home Letter to Mom August 20th, 1967 Tet minus 163 days Hi, Mom. Sorry I haven't written in a while. I'm in school. I volunteered for this Combined Action Program. We work with local Vietnamese, train them to defend themselves and their villages. The school is intense. I'm on day eight right now, and I'll finish before you get this letter. So far, over the last seven days, I've sat in classrooms. I spent the first two days learning Vietnamese phrases. This is some of what I've learned, but there's a lot more. No problem is Kong Ko Zi. Goodbye, you say, Tarm Biet. And no thank you is Kong. If I ask, can you speak English? And that is Ban Noi Ting A Duak Kong. How old are you? I say, Ban Ban Nyu Tuoi. I have them all memorized, but my favorite one is Kon Yu Mei, which means I love you, Mom. That wasn't part of what we were supposed to learn, so I asked one of the instructors if they could tell me how to say it. Cool, right? Some of the other things they've been teaching are stuff we learned in the School of Infantry, stuff like how to patrol while using a compass. I know all that stuff, but the Marine Corps always wants you to train over and over. But today and tomorrow will be fun. I get to shoot my M16, finally. I've been here for five months and I've never even fired my weapon. I know that makes you happy. But don't worry, Mom. I'll be careful. One of the weapons I'll shoot is the AK-47 rifle. That's the favorite weapon of the NVA. It's made in the Soviet Union. NVA stands for North Vietnamese Army, but the Viet Cong has a bunch of different weapons. Dad, one of the weapons we'll shoot tomorrow is the Chinese-made Type 53 carbine. I know Mom won't care about that, but I thought you might. This is a bolt-action gun, but it can be magazine-fed. It is very accurate, and the VC uses it as a sniper weapon. Then there's the SKS carbine, which is Russian. This weapon is a lot like our own M14. You can load five rounds quickly from the top, or use a magazine and feed the rounds in just like our M16. In fact, it uses the M14 round, but theirs is slightly different from ours. The one I'm really looking forward to trying is the North Vietnamese-produced K-50 submachine gun. This gun is really cool, Dad. It has a 35-round stick magazine. This gun takes a 7.63, again, a little different from our own M14. It shoots real fast, too, 1,000 rounds a minute. That should be fun. The rest of this, Mom, is for both you and Dad. After I'm finished with this school, I'll be going to a unit around Da Nang. The P in CAP will then stand for Platoon. The squad I'll be assigned to is one of four platoons. 
You'll be happy to know that of all the CAP units, the ones around Da Nang have the least enemy threat. I'm hoping for that unit. Here's my new address. 2nd Combined Action Group, 3rd MAF, Roman numeral 3, M-A-F. I don't know which platoon I'll be assigned to. As soon as I do, I'll tell you. If anyone wants to write me, I was told using that address will be enough for me to get my mail. I got your package just before I reported to this unit. All the candy was great. I shared it with the class. That's what we do here. Anybody gets a package, we share. Oh, I almost forgot. We're right next to a beach with white sand that's soft and warm on my feet. They let us do whatever we want after 1600. That's 4 p.m. for you, Mom. We spend as much time on the beach as we can. Down the beach is the Air Force. They challenged us to a game of flag football. Well, it started out flag, but it became an all-out tackle game. It was great. The Air Force took an early lead and held it until the fourth quarter. That's when we scored twice and won the game. That's good, because our gunnery sergeant warned us that if we lost to those pukes, we'd be field day in all night long. Instead, Gunny got a keg of beer and built a huge fire, and we partied on the beach. I wish I could tell you what I'll be doing. All I know is we'll be living in a village helping the PF to keep it safe. Oh yeah, PF stands for Popular Force. I guess the Arvins draft the young men as soon as they're age appropriate. I think the PF troops will be old men and kids too young to join the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. That doesn't sound like they'd be much help. But don't worry, Mom. I'll be with the toughest and the best there is. Nothing's better than a U.S. Marine grunt. So, Mom, how are Bobby and Fred doing? I haven't gotten any letters from them for a while. I'm glad they're still too young to be drafted. Tell Sis that when I get home, I'm checking out her so-called boyfriend. Well, I guess that's it, Mom. I want to get a letter off to Sherry. She sent me a picture of herself and I promised I would write. Tell everyone at home that I'm doing okay and I'll see you all in 236 days. I love you guys. Your son, Don. Letter to Sherry, August 20th, 1967. Hi, Sherry. I got the photo you sent me. You are bitchin', girl. I told my mom you sent a picture, but I didn't tell her you were in your bikini. Wow. I'm in a new unit now, but I'm still not sure what my address will be. For now, it's just 2nd Combined Action Group, 3rd MAF. I know you hate all the acronyms, so... MAF stands for Marine Amphibious Force. This unit will be cool. We go and live in the friendly Vietnamese villages and protect them from the Viet Cong. It sounds dangerous, and probably is, but hell, Sherry, that's what I trained for. I've been going to this school to be a CAP Marine. That stands for Combined Action Program. Once I finish here, I'll be assigned to an Echo Platoon, something between 1 and 4. Those are the ones who stay in the villages. Sherry, I want to share something with you. Something very personal. Because you are and have always been a good friend. You see, the first sergeant from Delta warned me. He said the Vietnamese would likely run if the village I'm assigned to ever gets attacked. He said they cannot be depended on. We could be all alone in a firefight. The thing is, Sherry, I'm not afraid. I know a lot of guys here are. They don't say it and they try not to show it, but they are. I see it in their eyes. The head instructor here, a gunny, told us what to expect. Okay, I'm going to change the subject. Do you remember Kenny Braver? He and I went to enlist in the Navy together. You remember Kenny, a short guy always getting into trouble? Or maybe that was me. Ha ha. Anyway, I got a letter from him last week sometime, and he's somewhere around France or Spain. Makes me think maybe the Navy might have been a better choice. Anyway, if you want to write him, I think he'd like that. Here's his address. Seaman 3rd Class Kenny Braver, USS Truxton, Class DD-1, FPO San Francisco, California, 96601. Well, Sherry, I've got to go. 
Tomorrow will be a busy day, and I want to get a quick letter off to Kenny before they turn our lights out. Take care of yourself, write back, and I'll see you in 236 days. Dawn. Letter to Kenny. August 20th, 1967. Hey, bro, I did as you asked and asked Sherry to write you. Maybe she'll send you a photo. And no, man, she and I ain't boyfriend and girlfriend. We're just friends. But after that picture she sent, well, that'll have to wait. So, how you been, buddy? How's that Navy chow? Did you squids ever do PT on board those ships? Seems to me if I had Navy chow to eat three times a day, I'd start getting fat. Ha ha. So listen, I was thinking about that day you and I went to the Harvey Post Office to enlist in the Navy together. You remember your stupid-ass brother told us they had that youth program. You enlist by 18 and you're out in two years. He's the reason I'm sitting in Vietnam. If he had told us if you're over 18 then the plan won't work for you, maybe I wouldn't be here. But, hey man, I'm glad I'm a Marine. I'm certainly more of a badass than you, ha ha. So listen, Kenny, I'm in a new school learning how to be an instructor to the Vietnamese, teach them how to defend their villages from Victor Charlie. That stands for Viet Cong to you non-hackers. We're a squad of grunts, and with the PF, we make up a combined action platoon. PF is the popular force of Vietnamese militia and Marines. The problem I've heard is when the shit hits the fan, the Marines stand and fight, but the PF run away. You see how that might be a little dangerous for us. It goes hand in hand with what the first sergeant said to me before I left Delta Company. What he said made me feel like I made a mistake volunteering for this unit. I know what you're calling me. You're calling me a dumbass for volunteering. Well, what the hell? I had to get out of that company. I needed something more than junk on the bunk inspections while being in a war zone. So after the first sergeant tells me those PF guys don't stick around when the shit hits the fan, I got a knot in my gut. So listen. I had a dream last night that something bad was going to happen. Crazy, huh? Well, in this dream, I get shot by a gook. I didn't die or anything. You know, you never die in a dream. Anyway, after the first sergeant tells me this shit, I listen to the gunny here along with all the instructors that tell us every day to be on alert when we're around the village residents. They could be VC. These instructors know they're all former Cap Marines, so I guess I'm a little nervous. If anything happens to me, I want you to tell my family I was brave. You tell them, even though I might have been afraid, I was always a Marine. I did my duty as a Marine. You tell them that, will you, Kenny? Okay, man, they just announced five minutes until lights out. I gotta end this. You take care of yourself and try not to get fat. I'll be seeing ya. Your best friend, Don. Chapter 13 Foxtrot 7 Reporting In August 21st, 1967 Tet minus 162 days I'm back in my hooch after morning chow. My gear, packed up last night, sits on my rack. School's over, and in a few minutes I'll fall out for the last time here in Cap School. On top of my sea bag is a manila envelope. As I start to pick the envelope up, someone from the other end of the hooch shouts, What's this envelope for? I got one too, I yell back. Looking around, it seems every rack with gear has an envelope. Sergeant Hicks sticks his head through the hatchway, yelling, Let's move, Marines! Formation is now! I wrote to Mom last night, told her I got promoted to Lance Corporal finally. It was effective August 1. Company Gunny explained why it took so long. I reported in without orders or my record book. Everything had to catch up to me. Mom will be happy. Hey, Sergeant, I have a letter to mail. I got time to run down to the post box? Negative, Talbot. Give it here. I'll mail it for you. I walk past Sergeant Hicks and hand him my letter. What's this envelope for, Sergeant? That's y'all's certificate of completion and a badge you will wear on your breast pocket. Everybody gets one. Get your asses moving. 
We have a new class coming in and y'all need to get the hell out of here. Outside, I stack my sea bag along the side of our hooch and fall in formation. Parked close are our three six-by troop carriers and a jeep. Gunny walks out and stands in front of the class formation. He shouts, Aten hut! His eyes scan us from left to right. At ease. All right, Marines, listen up. Each of you should have received an envelope on your rack after chow this morning. Inside is your certificate of completion from CAP school. Your name, rank, and serial number are on it. Open the envelope now and make sure everything is correct. If it is, put the certificate back in the envelope. If not, hold it up and we'll fix it. I look around as I pull out the certificate. No one is holding up a hand. Mine is good to go, so I slide the document back in the envelope. Gunny holds up something small and colorful. Pull out this badge. I do as I'm told. The badge is cool. The letters C-A-C across the bottom, flown over by an eagle with two American flags waving from its talons. Take the badge and connect it to your left breast pocket button, the gunny continues. If anyone does not have a badge, raise your hand. Gunny gives us time for everyone to comply. I proudly button the badge to my pocket. Sergeant Hicks and Corporal Hallard will collect the envelopes. We will send your certificates to 3rd MAF headquarters along with your record books. After the envelopes are collected, the gunny continues. When I call out your name, you'll get your assignment. Some of you will be heading north by chopper going to 3rd CAG. You will load up into the 1st 6 by. If you are heading south for 1st CAG, you will load into the 2nd and 3rd trucks. If you are staying in the 2nd combined action group, you get the jeep. The gunny looks over his record. Only one Marine stays in the second CAG, and that's... Lance Corporal Talbot. Your platoon is Foxtrot 7. You'll be right here at Da Nang. You got lucky. You'll still have access to Freedom Hill. I break formation, grab my sea bag, and throw it into the Jeep. The driver, another Lance Corporal, gets behind the wheel. Let's go, Talbot. I get in, and we start heading out, back to Highway 1. The ride to my new home is short, less than 30 minutes. My driver's name is Lance Corporal Mike Redinger. He has bushy hair and wears glasses. He's a small Marine, probably a house mouse in boot camp. I ask him, Hey, Redinger, say, man, call me Tiny. That's what everyone calls me. Okay, sure, Tiny. This place I'm going to, can you give me a heads up what to expect? He wrinkles his brow. You want to know something? His eyes on the road ahead, he says, Your compound commander is Sergeant Palmer. Second in command is Corporal Cruz. What unit were you in before joining CAP? I was with MP Battalion Delta Company. Right there at Da Nang? I smile. Yeah, I guess this is all the nom I'll ever see. I'll bet that's why you're here. Foxtrot 7 is only a couple miles from the airfield. They might think since you've already been around Da Nang, you'll fit right in. Or maybe the green machine plucked your name out of a box and here you are. Up ahead I spot a huge village and a big river running close by. This waterway is at least 40 feet wide and marshland flanks the far side of the village. We pull up to a razor wire gate and stop. From behind I hear the roar of engines. Turning I watch a navy patrol boat speed by leaving a massive wake behind. That's a swift boat, says Tiny. You'll see them hauling ass down the Kaudo River. Across that river is a village called Lojang. I've got buddies there. My eyes still on the river, I spot what looks like a sandy beach. That beach looks tempting. Tiny doesn't hear me. He and the gate guard, who is Vietnamese, are having some kind of discussion. I turn back to see what I missed. I gaze beyond the gate to an area filled with fighting holes and bunkers. They stretch across the perimeter behind a fence covered in barbed wire. Three buildings stand, two platoon size, one smaller. All are protected by a six-foot sandbag wall. The barriers face the river. In the middle of the compound, a tower sits on stilts with a ladder running to the top. Sandbags are stacked around the lookout section of the tower. The guard is wearing tiger-striped camouflaged utilities and carrying an SKS carbine. Tiny motions for him to open the gate, and he does. We drive in and stop. 
As I get out, I take another look at the village. Mamasans are stirring black pots of what I'm sure is rice. Old men squat on the ground, smoking and chewing opium. There are women of all ages and young boys. Everyone wears black pajama-style outfits with straw hats, just like the VC. I see no young men anywhere. Hey, Tiny, what's the name of this village? I ask. You don't recognize this place? This is Dogpatch. My familiar smile fades. I'm confused. I've been through Dogpatch a lot. I ain't ever seen this before. Of course not. You've gone through the main part that connects to Da Nang, Freedom Hill. We're in the boonies, man, but this is still Dogpatch. We're way out. Where are you from, Talbot? I grew up in Chicago. In Chicago, do they have suburbs? Yeah, of course. Well, this is the suburb of Dogpatch. A muscular Marine a little taller than me walks up, sporting a regulation haircut. I'm Sergeant Palmer, compound commander. Lance Corporal Talbot, Sergeant, reporting in. Welcome aboard, Talbot. What's your first name? Don, Sergeant. We don't go with rank out here. First name, last names are good, or nicknames. Palmer turns his attention to Tiny. You got anything for me? Just this. Palmer opens the envelope and sighs. More changes. Why can't they leave everything the way it is? It seems to work fine. What kind of changes? Tiny asks. It's a heads up. Something will be happening in October. Captain Jocelyn wants us to be ready for pop-up inspections. We need to make sure wire is good to go and our equipment is as well. Just more bullshit. Another man walks up. He's tall, maybe six foot two, and wears glasses. He greets the driver. Hey, Tiny. Hey, Doc. This is Don Talbot, FNG. I ain't no fucking new guy, I answer with sarcasm. How much time you got in country, Doc asks. Five months? Doc says, come on, Don. I'll show you where to stow your shit and introduce you to the rest of the team. I grab my sea bag and follow. So you're not a Marine? You're a corpsman? Yep. Name's Gifford. Guys call me Tuck or Doc. We walk for a moment and he adds, I guess you're proud to be a Cap Marine? Yeah, I guess. Why? That badge? He stops and points at my chest. Yeah, how come I didn't see Palmer wearing one? It looks cool, but there are two reasons you don't wear it here. First, it gives Charlie something to zero in on when you're on patrol. And second, the word CAC in Vietnamese means cock, dick, penis. You get it. I don't answer. I remove the badge and stuff it into my pocket. I follow Doc around the sandbagged walls and enter the middle hooch. Inside, four Marines are sitting in the center of the room at a card table playing a game of spades. There are cots scattered across the inside, each with a footlocker. Most have personal gear on them, but some are empty. You guys, this is Don Talbot. Doc goes around the table introducing everyone. This is Pete Cruz, Dennis Hammond, Johnny Bruce Jackson. Just Bruce, he says, raising his hand to say hi. And this guy is Joe. The guy asleep on his rack is John Murphy. Call him Murph. Where's Berger? Joe answers, I think he's in the tower, Doc. He likes it up there. Doc walks me over to the other side of the room. You can take this rack, Don. In cap school, we were told a full squad would be at these villages. I count nine, including me. Yeah, I don't think any cap platoon out here has a full squad. What you're told and what you get are two different things. One thing Palmer insists on is weapons ready. Make sure yours is clean and good to go. I'll see if I can get you tower duty tonight. Doc walks away and I size up my new team. The guy sleeping on his rack is Murph. From what I can see, he's thin with a huge mustache. Hammond is also skinny. Even though he's sitting, I can tell he's taller than the others. Pete looks to be Mexican, and Joe is a clean-cut-looking guy wearing a white t-shirt. If asked, I would say he's younger than me, probably 18. Bruce is a quiet guy. He didn't say much when introduced. I don't think he likes being here. 
Hell, who does? Doc looks and sounds intelligent. Guess he better be. If we need a corpsman, he's what we get. Talbot, yells Sergeant Palmer as he walks into the hooch. You and Pete got tower tonight. Pete will show you how things work around here. Make sure you have ammo, gas mask, 782 gear, and don't fucking leave your flak jacket behind. What time? I ask. Twenty hundred. I check the time. It's eighteen hundred. Hey, Talbot, Hammond says as he gets up from the table and walks over. I have something special for you to see. It's top secret. You don't tell anybody what I'm about to show you. You got it? What the hell? I nod and follow Hammond as he heads out the hooch to the smaller building next door. He opens the hatch. I look in, and my jaw drops. Chapter 14 Learning the Ropes Inside, I see empty ammo crates stacked one on top of the other about chest high. A board lies flat on top of them. With a broad smile, Hammond says, We got us a bar. You want a cold beer? My mouth still open, I stutter, Sure. As he hands me a cold one, I ask, You guys got a bar? And you got beer? Yeah. Tiny comes by every so often and makes a PX run to Freedom Hill. Hammond walks around the makeshift bar and, bending over, comes up with two Budweiser. He sets them on the board and picks up a can opener. As the can pops, the beer squirts out. I take a drink. Shit, man, this beer is cold. Look here, he says. I walk around and he squats down and pulls back a heavy green blanket. In a hole at least three feet deep are cans of beer and Coca-Cola. I heard about keeping shit in a hole to keep it cool. That works? Your beer is cold, ain't it? I nod, taking another swig while looking around. I notice a door leading to another room. What's on the other side of that wall? Medical. Doc uses it and stores all his shit there. Back there is the area he uses to help the villagers, especially the kids. He gives out shots against infection. Shots? You mean like for tetanus or penicillin? Exactly. A while back, we had a kid step on a punji stick. Punji stick? Shit, Don, you've been here for five months and you don't know what a punji is? Give me a break, man. I never left Da Nang. Not even when we went on patrol. We were always around dog patch. I pause. So, what is it? Victor Charlie, man, you know, the Viet Cong. They take a piece of bamboo about two or three feet long. He uses his hands to demonstrate. They sharpen one end, put a bunch of them together in a hole, and stick them straight up. The hole is big enough to step in, and it's hidden, concealed. You don't see it until you're in it. Booby traps? I mutter. Yeah, booby traps. A marine who steps on a punji, he's out of action and we're a man short. What about the kid? What happened to him? Not him. A little girl. Hammond pauses and his smile fades. The kid's foot had a hole clean through from toe to heel. He gives me a minute. She lost a lot of blood. An instinct to protect those who are weaker overwhelms me. The thought of the little girl with a hole through her foot pisses me off. Hammond continues. We tried to get a chopper in to medevac her, but command said no. We got a helo pad in the rear of our compound, but we ain't ever used it. They sent a truck. It took three hours to get here. Doc did his best to patch her up. She was bleeding a lot. He was afraid she'd bleed out, so he put a tourniquet on, used up most of the saline fluids trying to keep her hydrated. She was in a bad way when she left. They took her back to Da Nang. She okay? She ever come back? Nope, we ain't seen her. That was last month. He took another swig of beer. She was lucky, though. How so? Doc didn't think they laced the punji with poison. They do that, you know. They cover it with poisons from plants they find in the jungle. I ain't seen any jungle around here. That's right. Lucky she was. Lucky we are. 
Hammond smiles. I got something for you, man. He goes into the Corman's area and comes back with mosquito netting. This'll help you sleep at night. The bugs are a pain in the ass. As we walk out, I ask, where's your electricity come from? We got a generator out back. Come on, I'll show you. At the back of the building, a generator runs. Its cables go to all the hooches. The generator is about 10 meters away and surrounded by sandbag walls to protect and muffle the noise. A few meters behind is another small building, also surrounded by sandbags. Next to it is the helicopter pad. At the edge of the helo pad is a single pole with a round wash tub connected to the top. With the bottom of the tub cut out, it makes the perfect basketball net. I smile when I see it. You guys play basketball? Hell yeah, Talbot. You any good? Not great, but I can shoot. What's in that building? That's where we keep our calm gear and supplies for the generator. We also keep some of our ammo in there. Do you guys have an ammo bunker? Nah, we keep it everywhere. Do you see the bunker at the back of the compound over there by the wire? I see what looks like a two-man sandbagged bunker. Do we man that one too? Yeah. We keep our ammo back there with the comm equipment. There's more ammo in the tower. We also keep ammo in both hooches. We got it spread around. Come on, it's getting late and I want to eat chow. One thing we have enough of around here is sea rations. Next to us is another hooch about the same size as ours. What about that other hooch? What's in there? Sometimes the PF stay in camp. When they do, that's theirs. Before we leave, I spot a pile next to the helo pad. What's that? He looks back. Our garbage dump. When it gets big enough, we burn it and bury the ashes. Back there is also the head. He points at an area along the side wire closest to the village. You can piss anywhere you want away from the hooches, but you need to shit, you use the head. Back at Da Nang, we shit in fuel oil. Same thing here. We share the duty of burning it. Doc's in charge of saying when. Walking back to the hooch, I ask, You're not carrying your weapon. When Sergeant Palmer came out to meet me, he wasn't either. How come? Are we not allowed? Back in the MP battalion, we weren't allowed to carry our weapons loaded. Is it the same here? No, you can carry and you can lock and load. The village is friendly and we've never gotten any enemy activity during daylight. But when you're on guard, you're definitely locked and loaded. I begin to wonder if I'll see any action here. It was why I volunteered for CAP, but there doesn't seem to be any more VC activity here than back in Da Nang. Hell, at least back there we came close. Here, I don't think we'll even have to worry about rocket attacks. We walk into the hooch and Sergeant Palmer tells me, Tiny will be making a PX run soon. Doc takes care of the list. Tell him what you want, give him some cash, and Tiny will try to get what you need. You might want an air mattress. It comes in handy out here. He looks down at what's in my hands. I see you got some mosquito netting. You won't need it tonight. Set it up tomorrow. One more thing, Don. Did Hammond show you our bar? I nod. Good. Everyone chips in for beer and soda. Doc will tell you how much. He pauses. You got any questions? Yeah, one. Are we the only ones out here? Tiny mentioned another platoon across the river. Is there anyone else? Yeah, down the road. He points at the south. We have another cap platoon. They're near HQ at Ha Vong. Turning around, he looks the other way. Northwest is a third. They're about two miles down the road. This is Dogpatch, and across the river is Lo Jang, right? He nods. What do the other two platoons protect? They're all part of Dogpatch. Those villages might have names. Hell, this village might have a name, but to us, they're all Dogpatch. It's what's between Da Nang and these rice paddies and any VC. If those guys at Lo Jang get hit, they'd be alone out there. Now you're getting it, Don. To get to them, we'd have to cross the Cam Lee Bridge, then travel a couple of miles down a dirt road, and finally hump 500 meters through rice paddies to get to them. It wouldn't be easy. The guys here feel secure. 
I realize that, but I'm not with a company of Marines covered by artillery and air power anymore. I'm with less than a squad, and if we get hit, we'd be in a world of shit. No one is coming to help us at a moment's notice. We either hold or die. Sergeant Palmer and most of the guys leave the hooch and head for the bar. Murph is still sitting on his rack across the room from me. I don't know where Chow is, so I say in a raised voice, Hey man, I'm Don Talbot. He looks up with sleepy eyes. I'm... Murphy, I know. Doc told me. You know where I can get some chow? Sea rations are back there in the corner under the tarp. He points at the rear of the hooch. There on the floor, concealed under a cover, are boxes of sea ration. They look old. Like World War II old. I don't bother checking the dates. I find spaghetti and meat chunks and take them back to my rack. Murph says, There's a water buffalo out back. Did you see it? I nod. You need fresh water for your canteens. Better get it now. It'll be dark soon and we're blackout at night. Except for the tower. You get a spotlight up there. Thanks. My canteens are full. I check my watch. The time is 1930. I open my chow and gobble down the spaghetti along with some peaches and crackers. As I'm finishing, Pete, who I'm sharing tower duty with, walks in. He's dressed in full gear, including a flak jacket. Let's go, Talbot. We gotta be in the tower in ten minutes. Meet me at the ladder. I take my web gear, make sure everything is still attached, sling it over my shoulders, and lock the belt. Next, I slip a magazine into my weapon and run for the hatch. Hey, Don, yells Murph. Don't forget your flak jacket and helmet, man. Palmer will have your ass. I grab the jacket and helmet, put them on, and rush out while thanking Murph. Don't worry about it, man. It's your first day, he says with a smile. At the tower, I stop and look up the ladder. It's at least 40 feet straight up. The sun has fallen and darkness is already taking over. Pete is standing next to the ladder when the Marine who is in the tower comes down. I think his name is Berger, but the guys call him Burge. His feet hit the ground and he nods to Pete but says nothing to me. He walks away, heading for the hooch. You first, Talbot. I sling the weapon over my shoulder, grab the ladder with both hands, and start to climb. I never thought of myself as afraid of heights, but as the sun begins to set, I get nervous. I try not to show any fear. I learned back in boot camp that if you're scared, you keep it to yourself. I keep telling myself under my breath, I can hack it. I can hack it. Halfway up, I stop and look down. A rushing feeling goes through my balls. I start to sweat and feel dizzy when I hear Sergeant Palmer yell from below, Don't look down, Don. Keep your eyes up. Keep moving. Too late. I'm not sure I can. Still looking down, I start to feel nauseated. My hands soak with sweat and my grip weakens. My eyes closed. I can feel myself falling. Chapter 15 Finding Courage Take it easy. You're all right. Don't look at the ground. Look at me. It's Pete Cruz on the ladder below me. This is just like the old course back in boot camp, Talbot. Remember that damn 30-foot ladder you had to get over? That scared the shit out of me. My focus shifts to him. Me too. But you made it over, right? Yeah, I made it over. Pete smiles and chuckles. The first time I climbed this ladder, I almost pissed myself. But hell, you think it's hard going up. Wait till morning when you gotta go down. Calmed by his humor, I smile, look up, and grab the next rung. A minute later, I'm at the top and stepping into the tower. I exhale a sigh of relief and stand in the middle of an eight-by-ten-foot mini-bunker. The floor is a wooden deck. Around me are sandbag walls, each about five feet high. The only opening is the hatchway I climbed through. Above me is a roof made of plywood and tin. Four four-by-four four wood beams hold it up. I move to the forward wall and look out over the land. The tower is so high I can see everything for hundreds of yards. Behind me are the rice paddies. 
On my left stands the village. I see every hooch, both large and small. In the middle of the village, a group of kids play around what looks like a schoolhouse. I look to the right, toward the river, and it's spectacular. Amazing, isn't it? says Pete, who has climbed into the bunker and is standing next to me. That's the Suimangquan River. Looks peaceful. And so big, you know. Yeah, it's quite a sight. It's calming to just watch it flow. When I look at it, sometimes it's hard to believe there's a war on. Yeah, is my only response. I turn around and point behind us. What's that green stuff in the rice paddy? It's their rice. I thought so. Is it ready to be picked? Soon. In a couple of weeks. That's when we have to be on alert. The VC want the rice and they'll try to take it. I watch as Vietnamese from the village enter our compound through the front gate. Each of them is carrying a weapon. I spot an SKS carbine and a couple of American M1 rifles, and one guy has an AK-47. I wonder how he got that weapon. What's going on, Pete? Is that the popular force Vietnamese coming here? Didn't anyone tell you? The PF comes into our compound at night to help us guard the perimeter. No, Hammond said they used the hooch next to ours. I've seen a couple walking around, but they weren't carrying weapons. It kind of spooked me is all. They show up every night. If they don't, then we know we're going to get hit. I stare at Pete. Back at school, the instructors told us we couldn't depend on them. So that's true? Well, they're not VC, we hope. Some of them will fight. Those that live here might fight. Let's just say it's better to keep them in front of us, know what I mean? I look to the river and smile. In the west, the sun sets. The sky turns a spectacular red and orange as it rushes eastward down the river like a battle cry to the night. An apocalypse filled with color, fitting for a land at war. Soon those colors cover the mountain a click away, turning its drab green and brown into a rainbow of color. Say, Pete, is that Marble Mountain? Yeah, ever been there? Nope. You? Yeah. Tiny took me on a PX run to Da Nang's Freedom Hill. We went to Marble Mountain for lunch with the air wing. Their chow is almost as good as the Navy's. You know, I was almost an O331. That's a machine gunner. I smile with a nod, showing him I know. That was my MOS in boot camp. But when I graduated, I found out it got changed to 0311. That was fine with me. I didn't want to carry that heavy gun through the bush. But if I had been an 0331, maybe I'd be a gunner on one of those choppers up there. Grow my hair long and eat good chow. We both laugh. Pete's story is like mine. Sometimes I wonder what and where I'd be if I had done things a little differently. Maybe I'd be in the Navy with Kenny or in college with my sister. The final glimmer of daylight fades as twilight falls. I check the time. It's 2130 hours. Pete asks, You bring anything to eat while you're up here? No, I barely had time for dinner. He hands me a sea ration chocolate candy bar. Take this. It'll help you get through the night. Here's how this is going to work. Say, what's your first name again? Don. Okay, Don. At 2200, we start our watch. You're first. We'll be two hours on and two hours off. When you're on watch, you pay attention to the village. That's where the VC would come from. But you also watch the river and behind us, the rice paddies. Pete points at the compound's rear and asks, You know about the bunker back there? Yeah, Hammond showed me. Say, who's manning that bunker tonight? I don't know. Probably Doc and... I don't know. Just know we have people back there, so don't get trigger happy. I nod and grin. Pete asks, Why the hell are you always smiling? Everyone asks me that, but look, man, most of the time I don't even know I'm smiling. It's the natural thing for me to do, I guess. Hmm, he says, and then motions me over to the spotlight. I watch as he reaches underneath and turns it on. A beam of light shoots across the front of our compound as darkness approaches. Bright, isn't it? He asks. 
Yeah, lights up everything. He turns the beam toward the river, but the beam cannot illuminate it. Sometimes the VC will plant a sniper out there. We get those once in a while, he warns me. No one told me about snipers. The word from headquarters is to watch the village. The VC will infiltrate it. There's no wire to stop them. Plant a sniper there and start picking us off. He sees these words trouble me. His next words are an attempt to calm me. You can relax, Don. Since I've been here, there's never been any enemy fire from the village. The village? The people we're supposed to protect? Wouldn't they stop the VC? Yeah, well, war is hell. Look under here, Don. He points at the bottom of the light's casing. This switch turns the light on and off. He shuts it down. You bring your poncho? I shake my head. I forgot that, too. I don't think it's going to rain, but you'll need it to sleep. Your poncho helps with the mosquitoes. You can use mine while I'm on watch. You got bug juice? In my pack. On my rack. Here, take some of mine. Doc's got a crap load of this. He hands me the small bottle and asks, So where are you from? I apply the bug juice to my face. A town called Harvey, but I grew up in Chicago. Shy town Illinois, right? Yeah. We lived there until I started high school. Then we moved to Harvey, Illinois. I lived there until I joined the Corps. How about you? San Antonio, Texas. Lived there my whole life. Texas, huh? That's a big-ass state. Were you close to the Mexican border? Not really. About 150 miles. I tell him, When I graduated from infantry school, a few of us got liberty and went to Tijuana, Mexico. Hooked up with some girls, you know? That was a good time. You ever been there? Shit, man, every Marine who's ever done time at Pendleton's been to Tijuana. So yeah, I've been there. You ever go into Mexico from Texas? The Texas border into Mexico is a little different than going to TJ. The border's the Rio Grande, you know? I nod. Pete smiles as he begins to tell a story. Once, after high school, before I went to boot camp, some friends and I took a ride to the Rio Grande. We were going to try and make it to Nuevo Laredo, Mexico. One of my buddies said he knew some chicks that lived outside Nuevo. They liked to party and we wouldn't be disappointed. He laughs. He tells us the shortest way to their place is across the Rio Grande. I asked him how in the hell do we do that, and he tells me this time of year the river drops so low that you can walk across it. So we did. We got across the river a few miles from Nuevo and started walking. An hour later, we spot these Mexican police cars, their lights flashing and racing toward us. We got scared and tried to cross back over to the U.S., but the river got back a lot of its water. He chuckles. We almost drowned. When we got back to the car, it was dark and we were still soaking wet. The guys all wanted to kick Billy's ass. He's the guy who came up with the stupid plan. By the time we got back to San Antonio, we were all laughing our asses off. I thought maybe you were born in Mexico. Fuck you, Talbot. I was born in Texas. Pete pauses for a few seconds, then adds, My parents became U.S. citizens a long time ago. My little sister Anna and I were born in the U.S. Mom and Dad came from a little town called San Sebastian Bernal. They would always tell us how great it was there. How the grass is always green and the hills around so beautiful. But when we asked them to go there, they'd tell us, We can never return. How come they left? Money, I guess. Not much future there. You can't eat beautiful, you know? Yeah. You ever want to go there? Someday me and Anna might. Hey, you want to see her picture? Sure, man. Pete pulls out his wallet and hands it to me. I look and see a picture of a beautiful little girl with long black hair, wearing a red dress and an adorable smile. She's cute. How old? In the picture, eleven. But that was two years ago. Pete stares at the photo as the last of the sun's light fades away. I can see he's homesick. Out here, that feeling can come over you when you least expect it. He looks back at me. It's almost 2200. I'm going to get some shut-eye.
As he moves to the backside of the tower to bunk down, he adds, Keep your eyes open. You smoke? Yeah, I do. You can smoke up here, but keep the butt below the wall. It's not like the gooks don't know this tower is here, but you never know who might be lying at the riverbank with a sniper rifle waiting for some dumbass to light up and blow him away. Don't be a dumbass. And one more thing. Keep the light off the PF. They don't like being lit up in their fighting holes. I nod and watch Pete lie down and pull the poncho over his head. My attention returns to where the wire fence should be but is no longer visible. From behind me I hear the whooshing sound of a pop-up illumination. I turn to watch it climb high over the rice paddies. When it ignites, the paddies light up. With a sigh, I return to the forward position, looking out toward the river. I still hear it flowing by, but in the darkness, I can't see it. I have always found guard duty boring. It was boring in boot camp and boring when I was in Delta Company, and it's boring here in the tower. When you're on guard, you can't read a book, listen to music, or do anything to pass the time. You stare into the night and wait for an unseen enemy to kill you. I snicker. To help pass the time, I let my mind wander back to home. I take a quick extra look at my watch. The time is 22.30. 10.30 p.m. here is 10.30 in the morning yesterday back home. It's weird to think their time is yesterday. Gotta wonder, is that my past? Okay, so yesterday, uh, no, my time. My brothers were, no, are in school. Shit, this blows my mind. Anyway, they're in school, my sister's at college, and my dad is working. This time of the morning, Mom is cleaning the house. If I was home, I'd be... Hey, what's that? Something's in the wire. Coming from the village side. I turn to Pete. He's sound asleep. Should I wake him? It might be nothing. The light. Turn on the light, you dumb shit. Turn on the fucking light. If I turn it on and it's a VC, I'm going to get shot at. I point the light so it will shine where I hear the noise. I don't want to wake Pete. If I do, he'll say I can't hack it. I ready my weapon, moving the selector first to semi-automatic, then to fully automatic. With my left hand, I place the rifle to rest on the sandbagged wall. My right hand is on the light switch, the beam pointed on target. I flick the switch on. I whisper... Shit! Oh, shit! What do I do? Chapter 16 Foolhardy or Courageous? I look down to where the beam of light has settled. Squatting on the ground is an old Vietnamese man. He's so close to the fence, my first thought is that he's trying to cut his way in. Is he a sapper? My eyes search for a weapon or a bag of explosives. I see neither. I let go of the light, bring the rifle to my shoulder, and aim it. The guy smiles and bows his head, a Vietnamese sign of respect. I keep my rifle aimed in, but when the guy waves to me, I know he means no harm. I stare over the top of my weapon and wave for him to move on. He stands, pulls up the bottoms of his black pajamas, bows again, and goes back into the village. That's when I realize he was taking a dump. As he leaves, I wonder if I did right to let him go. Maybe he was VC. Maybe he was sizing us up for an attack down the road. I shut the spotlight down while sighing with relief. The immediate danger is past. I place the weapon on safe and set it butt down on the deck. With shaky fingers, I light up a smoke and stare into the darkness. Pete hasn't moved, and I don't think anyone saw anything. No one needs to know what happened here. I'm still new. I need to prove myself to these guys. The rest of my two-hour watch goes off without a hitch. At 23.50, I awaken Pete, giving him ten minutes to stretch and wake before his watch begins. So how did it go? Pete asks. Everything was fine. No problems. You used the light? No, no need. Pete looks at me and wrinkles his forehead, but says nothing. We exchange places. When he turns the spotlight on and searches the perimeter, I ask, You see something? No, just scanning the area. 
Pete turns to me. Why didn't you use the light? Do you remember how to turn it on? You didn't check the perimeter once? I light up a smoke. I thought only if I hear something. Yeah, well, up here we're on our own. Pete motions with his thumb to the compound's rear bunker. Those guys back there, they got illumination to light up their darkness. We got this baby. He pats the light. It can get boring up here and it helps to see what's out there. So I can search the perimeter whenever? Yeah. Remember to keep the light off the PF, but yeah. My cigarette finished, I lie down and pull the poncho over my head. I could have had the light on all night. Let it rest. No one needs to know. My eyes close and I'm soon asleep. Two hours later, I'm awake and back on guard. This continues until 0800 when my last watch ends. You ready to go down? Pete asks. Yeah, I'm hungry. Okay, go, man. With my web belt, flak jacket, and helmet on, I sling my weapon. Pete said the climb would be tougher going down, but as soon as I hit the first step, I have no problems. Halfway down, I look up and see Pete as he steps out and heads down the ladder. Once we're on the ground, Hammond walks up. We're invited to a party. There'll be dinner and drinking tonight. Oorah! I'm surprised. Hey, Hammond, we get invited to dinners? Yeah, man. And these mama-sons can cook some great dink food. He pauses at my worried look. What's the matter, Don? You ain't afraid to eat at the dink's hooch, are you? Laughing, Hammond walks away. Come on, Don. Pete motions me to follow him back to the hooch. Let's get some breakfast. You've been there before, Pete? To the village? Sure. We get invited all the time, and sometimes we don't get invited but show up anyway. He laughs. This one time, we were on patrol and ran into a bunch of villagers partying at some dink's hooch. We were all packing, helmet, flak jacket, weapons, grenades, everything. That's a lot of shit. Well, we were on patrol. So, what happened? When we walked in, the villagers stopped partying and stared at us. I think they were afraid because of what we were carrying. I went over to a table where they had their beer, took one, and chugged it down. The dinks all started laughing, and we crashed their party. That was a great time. I don't like rice. Pete shakes his head. What you'll get there is better than sea rations, Talbot. They have fish and thin bread like tortillas, but thinner. They have dipping sauces, and the food is good. You don't have to eat rice. I know rice is their main dish. Still, a meal at some gook's home sounds exciting. Like Pete says, I don't have to eat the rice. Hammond is walking ahead of Pete and me when he turns back. We're due for a patrol. Then Hammond drops back to walk with us. Pete acknowledges, yeah, it's been a while. You guys ever run into VC on these patrols? I ask. Not yet answers Hammond. Sometimes we find shit that says gooks were along the river. But to answer your question, no, we've never made contact. Things around here are calm, man. I've been here over a year and- What? I interrupt. Over a year? You're short? Going home? No, extended. Confused, I ask. How'd they extend you? That ain't right. Relax, Don. I extended myself another twelve months. You extended yourself? Why? I still had a shitload of time left on my contract. I'd rather be here than back in Pendleton with heavies breathing down my neck. When were you supposed to go home? Earlier this year, January 28th. I headed back to the world, did 30 days leave, and came right back here. Now my last day is February 28th next year. You extended so you wouldn't have to deal with some staff NCO? That's just crazy, man. After you've been in Nam, dealing with heavies back in the world ain't worth it. Besides, nothing ever happens here. Pete butts in. You keep saying that, Hammond. You'll jinx us. Something will happen. Hammond responds by raising a fist and extending his middle finger. You got any time left when you finish this tour? I ask. Two months. But that's the beauty of this. Anyone who extends their time in Nam has their contract cut short. 
When I get back to the world, I'll get discharged ASAP. After we walk into the hooch, I head straight to the pile of sea rations and grab something for breakfast. Hammond and Pete walk to their racks. I open a box of rations and eat while thinking about Hammond. He's been here for 18 months. When he finally gets back to the world, the Corps will discharge him. I'll have more than six months left on my contract when my tour ends. Maybe I'll extend. Like Hammond says, nothing ever happens here. The day passes, and by 1600, we're on our way to dinner in the village. Palmer reminds me to bring my weapon and a bandolier of magazines. Hammond and Joe are carrying two sandbags stuffed with beer. How much beer you got, Hammond? asks Palmer. A dozen cans? You think they'll have their own beer tonight? They always do. What about Boom Boom Girls? asks Bruce. Most likely, Hammond grins. It's time for fun. The Nguyen family is celebrating their daughter's wedding. How'd we get invited to a wedding, Sergeant? Are there really Boom Boom Girls there? That's all Bruce thinks about. So, are there? Yeah, there are. There's a hooch in the jungle just outside the village. The chief allows them to come because he knows some of the guys, like Bruce, want them here. As far as being invited, these people hate the VC, Don. They're always trying to stroke us, keep us happy with dinners and parties and boom-boom girls. And we keep them safe. As we walk through the village, I realize it's like the dog patch I know back in Da Nang. There are no streets here, only walkways so narrow we have to walk single file to pass through them. It's a lot more primitive here. No one is selling anything. There are no businesses or restaurants and definitely no bars. None of that exists here. Well, Boom Boom does. There's one thing different. Hey, Sarge, why are some of these hooches built on stilts? That river can swell during the monsoons and flood this area. Stilts keep those hooches dry. Why aren't they all up? Money, Don. Money buys you the good life, even in Nam. We stop at a stairway leading to a huge hooch built on those expensive stilts. Up there I can hear laughter and singing. As we enter, the thoughts of poor people, poor country, vanish. Inside the place, at least forty villagers are having a good time. The bride's father walks up to greet us, and I recognize him as one of the PF soldiers. He bows and smiles, speaking Vietnamese. I only pick up a word or two, but understand him when he introduces himself as Gan, and his new son-in-law-to-be, Chi Man. I look at the groom, who's missing a hand. He sees me staring and pulls his arm behind his back. I smile and then follow the guys to a shelf where bottles of beer and food are waiting. The party is lively, and we're getting along with everyone. There are no young men at this party except for Chi Man. In fact, there are no young men in this village. I know the reason. The Arvins take them at sixteen. Those who are still in the village are like the groom missing a body part from the war. Doc grabs two beers and hands me one. I ask him, confirming what I expect. Gan's new son-in-law lost his hand in the war? Doc nods, most likely. This hooch is huge, Doc. I guess our PF is rich, huh? Doc looks down at me, his brow wrinkled. Rich? You mean Gan? Shit, Talbot, he's not rich. What about this hooch? It's one of the biggest in the village. And it's on stilts. This isn't his. The village chief lives here. Gan is a PF, and you're not rich when you're part of the militia. The chief does this for all the popular force gooks instead of paying them. Isn't the popular force paid by the U.S.? Maybe, I don't know. But if they are, that money would go through the chief. Do the math. We're having a great time getting drunk, and the food isn't bad either. There are bowls of rice, which I avoid, fish rolled in thin bread and then dipped in a couple of different sauces. One sauce, Nook Leo, tastes like peanuts but without the crunch. It's mixed with rice, so I eat very little. 
Another one is a spicy red sauce and reminds me of hot salsa minus the tomatoes. It's very good. They call it nook jam. Strange, though, I know nook is the Vietnamese word for water. I guess it can mean sauce, too. At 2100 hours, the party ends. Hammond and Bruce are off with a couple of ladies. We're all half drunk as we walk back to our compound. Palmer and Pete left early to cover radio watch and relieve a PF who speaks excellent English. He watched our gear. I guess Palmer trusts him. Back at the hooch, Sergeant Palmer stands with the radio receiver to his ear. I hear him say, Copy that, sir. He looks across the squad. S2 wants a patrol tomorrow. In dog patch? Easy, answers Pete, laughing. Palmer places the receiver back on the radio. Not this time. We're going to the river. Intelligence thinks VC and NVA units have been building up around us, leaving supplies hidden for something in the future. We're going to see if it's true. So what's that mean? asks Hammond. It means the gooks might be planning something in our AO. HQ needs to know where. You think we'll see some action? asks Pete Cruz, second in command. Palmer doesn't answer. Y'all get some sleep. You'll be briefed in the morning. Pete, hold on, I need to talk to you. Chapter 17 Patrolling the River Hanging back, I hear Ed tell Pete, I need you to be ready tomorrow. The patrols we've been running haven't been by the book. Things are changing, Pete. I have a feeling the war is coming. I need to know I can count on you. You know it, man. I get it. We've been skating. From now on, we go old school. The sergeant smiles. Cool. That's what I need to hear. Go on, man. Get some shut-eye. I'll see you in the morning. Pete smiles as he heads for the hooch. Palmer sees me hanging around and scoffs, Hit the rack, Talbot. I turn to obey but stop when he says, Wait one. This way. He signals me to follow him. Together we walk to Doc's hooch. Sarge turns on the light and moves to the corpsman's desk. There he pulls out a map and sets it on top and says, I want you to see this, Don. I watch his finger trace along the riverbank. This river has many ways we can go. See how it bends and twists its way from the rice paddies back to the village? See this? This is jungle. The threat of ambush is high here. He puts the maps away and steps outside for a smoke. I join him and we both look up at a night sky filled with a billion stars. Shit. Things around here have been too easy. Tomorrow we start for real. It's coming, Don. I know it. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next month, but it's coming. He looks at me and sighs. I'll see you in the morning. Before I go, I ask, Hey, Sarge, you seen combat? Ever been in a firefight? His eyes turn cold and he swallows hard. Is that what you think, FNG? I need to have combat experience to lead you? Hell no, Sergeant. I thought maybe you could tell me what to expect tomorrow if we run into any VC. Palmer says in a softened tone, You know all you need to know. If we make contact, you'll do your job. I'm not worried about you. So maybe you don't worry about me. Now, turn in. Get some sleep. I walk away with a sense that Palmer has seen combat before. He's tight-lipped about who he is. Maybe tomorrow I'll learn something more. August 24th, 1967. Tet minus 159 days. It's still dark in the morning when the squad forms up. Sergeant Palmer gives us a short patrol brief. Last night, Captain Jocelyn gave a frag order for a patrol through Dog Patch, the rice paddies, and then the river. Why so specific? asks Murphy. We ain't never run a patrol from a fragmentation order before. Pete jumps in. You heard what Palmer said last night. Gooks are building up for something around here. Tell them, Sarge. Tell them what Sergeant Cosley found near Lo Jang. Palmer looks across the squad before saying, you all know Sergeant Cosley from Echo 4. He doesn't exaggerate his reports. 
Two days ago, they were on patrol a click west of Lojang. Buried in a tunnel complex were large foodstuffs and other shit. What'd they find? asks Hammond. Enough food to feed a battalion for a month. There was AK and RPG ammunition along with medical supplies. It looks like something is being planned by the NVA. NVA? There's NVA in our area? asks a worried Joe. Yeah, it looks like it. The markings found on the foodstuffs were from North Vietnam and China. We're all quiet. By the looks on everyone's faces, I don't think anyone in the squad has dealt with an enemy force as well-trained as the NVA. I know I haven't. Hell, in Delta Company, there were only VC, and I never even saw one of them. Palmer said those supplies came from China, which tells us the war will soon be at our front door. Okay, listen up. I want everyone to start carrying extra bandoliers of ammo when we're on patrol. Who's carrying the radio? I am, Sarge, answers Burge. Palmer tells him, Okay, grab an extra smoke and CS gas. Make sure your radio is working and you have all the antennas, an extra handset, and battery. Burge gives him a thumbs up. Murph, grab the M79. Take as many M40s as you can carry. Take buckshot, too. Copy that, Sarge. Everyone ammo up and bring an extra chow. In a quiet voice, he adds, just in case. We remain silent as we gather extra ammo and chow. Even Doc decides to add more meds to his FAC, first aid kit, just in case. Outside and ready, Palmer sets the order in single file. Burge, you're with me. Then Doc, followed by Bruce. Then Murph, Hammond, and Pete. Joe, your tail end. Talbot in front of me, your point. I try to hide the shocked look on my face, but walking point was why Palmer showed me those maps. Though I'm nervous, I fall in at the number one position. Sarge lays his hand on my shoulder. Always look left, right, and back to the front. Don't worry. You'll do fine. I've got your back. It's not my back I'm worried about. The patrol is finally ready and Palmer orders us off. I swallow hard and start walking through Dogpatch. The villagers stare as we walk past them. Mothers pull their children into the hooches. Old men look away as we walk by. I have the feeling they know something we don't. At the end of the village, we enter the rice paddies. Everyone spread out. I want firepower to our front. Get on line. In our new formation, I'm on Palmer's left, and Burge with the radio is on his right. Everyone else has spread out. Each man is walking on a different dike, trying to stay out of the water. If I were a VC, I'd booby-trap these dikes. They must know we don't like to get our feet wet. I step off the dike and into the water, keeping the thought to myself. Pete notices and, as if reading my mind, says, The gooks don't set traps on the dikes, Talbot. The villagers are out here every day working. You don't need to worry. I look left at Pete and step back up on the dike. The day drags on, and soon the river comes into view. I'm back at point when the squad returns to single-file formation. It's not long before I notice something along the riverbank. I stop the patrol and Palmer moves up. What's up, Don? There, I point. Footprints. The sergeant pats my shoulder. Good job. He moves forward to check them out. The squad drops to a knee and forms a 180 around us, putting the river to our backs. Pete moves forward and the three of us study the prints. Looks like maybe six, says Palmer. At least that many, maybe more, Pete replies. I stare down and notice the prints start at the river and head back toward the rice paddies and the village. They go that way, I say. Could they be fishermen? Palmer answers. Maybe. See there? He points at marks on the shoreline. A boat came in here. The sergeant looks around. But where is it now? Pete adds, See how those footmarks are deeper there than the footmarks at the river? You think they carried the boat away, maybe back to the village? But why? Sergeant Palmer doesn't answer. Move out. 
As the river twists and bends, a tree line comes close to where we need to go. Don, you remember what I told you about jungle? asks Palmer. I nod. Looking back to the squad, the sergeant warns, You people stay alert. Watch that tree line. We pass the danger point without incident and soon reach our farthest point for this patrol. Palmer turns us toward Dogpatch and we start our hump home. With no other sightings of enemy activity, our compound soon comes into view. I let out a sigh of relief. Once there, Sergeant Palmer holds a debrief, asking if anyone saw anything they want to report. No one does. He and Corporal Cruz put together a message. They send it back to headquarters reporting what we found. My first patrol was easy. I admit I was nervous walking point, but I gained a lot of experience. I think that was what Palmer wanted. I'm still the new guy, and though I've run patrols with Delta Company, this one was different. We return the ammo, shower, and grab some chow. Then everyone hits the rack. Joe and Burge pull tower duty, and the PF take the perimeter. Time passes. I can't sleep. I go outside for some fresh air. Murph is there talking on the radio. He jumps when he sees me. I can tell something's up. Hey! Shit, I thought you were Pete or Palmer. He exhales a sigh of relief. Why, what you doing? I'm listening to the bullshit channel. Some guy said he heard gooks are threatening a big something this coming Tet. Really? What do you mean bullshit? You haven't heard of it? No. Who's on it? Everybody. He looks at me like I'm an FNG again, then smiles. Hey. I smile back. Gooks are doing something on Tet. This is the bullshit channel. So, that's bullshit. Not happening, right? I guess we'll find out, he says with a smirk. So you talk plain over the air? What's the frequency? It's 45.0 to 55.0. Sometimes it changes because the heavies find it. Then you just have to search. I find out that this secret radio frequency is for the average grunt or peon. With this, we can talk openly like we're on a phone conversation back in the world, with no restrictions on what we say or how we say it. This is cool. Murphy tells me, Listen, Don, when you get Radio Watch, make sure neither Pete nor the Sarge catches you using this channel. You'll screw it up for the rest of us. Why, don't they listen too? Yeah, they do. But they frown on you not paying attention to the radio when you're on watch. I give him a thumbs up and take a seat while listening to what the talk around Nam is all about. I've got to take a piss. Cover for me, will you? Sure, Murph, go ahead. As he moves away to relieve himself, I listen to the radio. At first, the talk is about some boot lieutenant and what he had his platoon do today while they were on patrol. This guy interrupts with news on the upcoming Tet holiday. You people need to hear this. I just came from an S-2 meeting with my battalion CO. This talk the NVA has been stashing supplies all across the South. Something big is coming our way, devil dogs. Something big. I'm so enticed by the news, I don't see Palmer standing a few feet away. Murph walks up and sees him. Oh, shit. Talbot, I told you to watch out for... I thought you were on watch, Murph. I am, Sarge. Talbot was just covering for me while I took a piss. Turn the bullshit net off and put the radio back on battalion frequency. Murph turns the frequency back. Palmer adds, Since you two seem to make such a great pair, you stay with Murph tonight, Talbot. Share the watch. Palmer returns to the hooch. Murph grumbles. That could have been worse. Say, man, I inquire, how long you been here? Six months, why? How long has Palmer been here? What do you know about him? Palmer? Pete would be a better guy to ask, but from what I've learned, this is his second tour of duty. He was part of the landing force in 65, saw action in the Battle of Van Tuong, Operation Starlight. He lost some buddies. That was where it all started, Don. Those were the first American troops to land in Nam, and Palmer was one of them. He pauses. 
Why do you want to know? I was talking to him yesterday before the patrol. I asked if he ever saw combat. I think I pissed him off. Murph shrugged. I ain't never seen combat, man. But if I had, I'd be one of two things. Proud that I did, or sorry that I did. I guess there are things about what happened back then the Sarge doesn't want to talk about, you know? I don't reply. Murph is right. I guess if someone had seen combat and they don't want to talk about it, you keep quiet and let them be. You got a girl waiting for you, Don, back in the world? No, not really. I have a bunch of girlfriends, but they're only friends. What about you? Weeks turned to months as we continue to run our patrols through September and into October. Once in a while, we come up with something indicating a possible enemy in our area, but nothing significant, nothing big, and nothing close to what Cossie found. I know, like me, the guys are thinking this state of alert is nothing but bullshit. And no one talks about what the gossip or the mention of Tet on the bullshit network was all about. Since that night, the talk has disappeared. The patrols are relaxing again. Even Palmer seems stress-free. I believe we are all slipping back to life before Cossie found all that NVA shit. I overhear Hammond say, You know, Palmer, Cossie may have this all wrong. We haven't seen anything like what he described. Yeah, maybe. Still, what he found was significant. We'll see. October brings a change. The Combined Action Program is undergoing a major reorganization. Command creates the first Combined Action Group in July. Lieutenant Colonel Day will command the second Combined Action Group in Da Nang and the third Combined Action Group in Fubai. All three CAG headquarters are reporting directly to 3rd MAF. Though we've been using Echo as our platoon identification for a while, it's now official. From this point on, we are known as Echo 2. All the other units will now be officially using Echo as their designations. We're told we can write home and give the Echo platoon as part of our address. November finally arrives, and we hear rumors Colonel Day might stop by on the 10th, the birthday of the Marine Corps. Palmer says we'll have to spruce the place up, and none of us looks forward to that. However, when we learn they'll be bringing steaks and cold beer, I guess we can live with a police call. But before any of this happens, there's another patrol. We get a frag order for tomorrow. It's taking us across the river and into the Lojang AO. Chapter 18 A Truck Ride Away November 3rd, 1967. Tet minus 89 days. We got an order to expand our patrolling north across the river. HQ wants one Echo unit running a patrol in Lojang's AO every week. Coordinating with Echo 3 and Echo 4, we each take a turn. This week, it's ours. It's the night before our patrol across the Kaudo River, Sergeant Palmer decides to brief us now rather than in the morning. He walks into the hooch and finds everyone here. I'm playing spades with Murph and Joe. Hammond is trying to play a guitar Tiny brought him on the last PX run. Pete and Bruce are chowing down, and Burge is naked from a shower he just took. At 17.30, we get the brief. Okay, listen up. Everyone understands where we're going tomorrow. This area has seen more enemy activity in the last couple of months than any of us have at any time here in Nam. Most of us have never been across the river. Hammond and Pete have as passengers with Tiny, but not humping. Palmer continues, Tomorrow morning we're going north by truck across the Kaudo River. Tiny will pick us up at 0500. We'll cross the Can Lee Bridge and he'll drop us off a click down Highway 1. From there, we hump to a goop graveyard, patrol the jungle around it, and head back. Any questions? No one says anything, so Palmer goes on. There's something I need to share with y'all. The squad remains quiet. The area we're patrolling is the same area Sergeant Cossey found the stash of food and ammo. 
We'll be the first Echo team in that area since Command wiped out the stash. 3rd MAF needs to know if there's any enemy activity going on since they took out those supplies. We don't know what's out there. The squad takes what Palmer says in stride. No one seems worried about where we're going. For me, the possibility to fire my weapon at the enemy, now that's exciting. Everyone is up and on the road at 0430. Palmer goes by each man, assuring himself we are ready. Finally, he says, Fire team leaders, check your teams. Something feels wrong with my pack, so I ask Burge, Hey man, straps ain't right. Check them out, will ya? While Burge helps me, I ask Palmer, How far will we be from Echo 4? More than a click. Why? With my usual smile, I say, Only trying to think ahead, Sarge. You let me do all the thinking, Talbot. You keep your eyes open for Charlie. Copy? Copy that, Sarge. Am I walking point? He doesn't answer, just points at a truck heading our way. That's our ride. We all watch the six-by pull up and stop at our front gate. Tiny jumps down, smiling. The whole squad heads across the yard to gather around him. Hey, Palmer, he says. I got orders to haul your asses over the Cam Lee to Highway 1. Where are you guys patrolling today? Check it out. Palmer reaches into his pocket and pulls out a map which he unfolds and shows Tiny where he's taking us. There's supposed to be a side road at coordinates 016715. You know it? Yeah, sure. It's the road I used to reach Echo 4. We're humping to a graveyard and patrolling the jungle around it. I know that graveyard. I can take you within a hundred yards of it. Thanks, man, but we're supposed to check out the area leading to it. It's where Kasi found all that gook shit. You got calm with you? Yeah, Burge is humping the radio. Why? Give me your frequencies, I'll monitor y'all's radio. You ain't planning to stay the night, are you? Hell no, but thanks. We'll let you know when we're ready. We should be back by sundown. We'll meet you at those same coordinates you drop us off at. You don't hear from us by then? Come get us. He turns to Burge and says, Give Tiny our frequencies. Everyone else on the truck. Let's get rolling. I want to be across the bridge by sunup. We climb on board and Tiny starts the truck moving down the road. I've seen the bridge before from a distance when I visited Echo. It was with Tiny, and I rode shotgun for his regular PX run. I allow my mind to wander back to that day. Greeno, he's from LaGrange, Illinois, and only been here about a month. Shot the shit about Chicago and places like Riverview Park. I'll see him again after this patrol. If the colonel shows up for the Marine Corps birthday, we'll all be together. And Staff Sergeant Ramos. He's a tall dude, over six foot two inches. Their compound commander. And Basso, his wife and kid, wants to get back home to see them. Yeah, man, we all want to go back. Basso thinks he's a short timer with three months left. Doesn't want to go on any more patrols. Staff Sergeant Ramos told him when he hits 30 days... Not before. Basso got excited when I told him about the Mustang Cobra coming out in 68. Murphy thought Cobra was the coolest car name ever. My attention returns when the truck turns onto Highway 1 and the bridge comes into view. A huge tower sits over the entire south entrance. As we pass under it, I see M60 machine gun barrels sticking out. Many Marines are in that tower. The Camley Bridge is narrower than I imagined. There's only enough room for our vehicle to cross. Any vehicle coming the other way would have to wait its turn. The bridge spans the entire Caudo River. At the north end, another tower awaits. I also notice if an infantry unit tried to cross this bridge while under fire, they would have no protection. They would be completely exposed. After we cross, I ask Pete... Who guards that bridge? I heard it's Delta Company, 1st MP Battalion out of Da Nang. He chuckles. Hey, isn't that your old unit? I don't answer, but wonder if my old 1st Platoon is in those towers. Highway 1 is a little more comfortable since the engineers paved it, more comfortable than the bumpy dirt roads we took getting to it. 
Sergeant Palmer gets to ride in the cab with Tiny. About 20 minutes later, we come to a dirt road and stop. I look at what is more a trail than a road. There are holes, tire tracks, and grass. Palmer jumps down. Let's move, people. The sun's rising. Tiny waves goodbye and drives off. With the truck gone, there's nothing but silence. Palmer calls us together, almost whispering, Listen up. From this point on, we need to keep quiet. We're taking this road to the graveyard. I want a V formation. Hammond, you're on point. Burge is on my right. Me and Doc in the middle. The rest of y'all fill in. Everyone takes a spot. I'm left of Palmer. As the patrol starts, I'm relaxed, not nervous. I've made so many patrols, they've become routine. But this one feels different. No one is talking, and the silence has me paying special attention to everything around me. The rice paddies are ahead, and the jungle is on my left. Less than an hour after we begin, the sun's rays and heat are at our backs. An hour later, Hammond holds up a fist and the squad stops. Palmer calls Pete forward, and together they discuss what's ahead. I think it must be the graveyard. Pete looks through binoculars. Say, Ed, there's a lot of woods around that cemetery. Isn't that where Cossie found those gook supplies? You think we... You want to go around the graveyard, not straight in. Yeah, maybe we find more gook shit. Sergeant Palmer thinks about what his number two suggested. Yep, sounds like a plan, Pete. He faces the squad. Form up single file, same order. We'll make our way around the graveyard and then cross over to patrol the other side. Y'all got it? The other guys and I nod. Palmer has Hammond turn left. Twenty-five yards later, we step into the jungle. As I follow them in, I'm surrounded by trees, plants, and animals. Insects, reptiles, and birds are everywhere. Though I'm sweating, there's a cold here that chills me. I look up, searching for the sun, but the jungle canopy has hidden it. The only light here is twilight. I trip and stumble to my knees. Weeds have wrapped around my feet. I need to watch where I step. I also have to keep my eyes on Burge and hope he keeps his own eyes on Palmer. If I lose contact with Burge, I'm fucked. This jungle is so thick I might never see the enemy before it's too late. When a beam of sunlight shines down, I look up. But the breezes that pushed the trees apart to allow it in have vanished, and the twilight returns. The jungle is quiet. The occasional rustling of a tree or the sound of brush moving as a small critter runs past is all there is. Behind me, I hear someone fall. Motherfuck, I hate this shit! Then Pete warns Joe, Watch where you're stepping, man, and keep quiet! Watch where I step. Keep my eyes on the man in front of me. Be careful you don't touch a tree or branch. Something deadly could be crawling on it. And most of all, watch for the VC or NVA. Joe's right. This is bullshit. What the fuck? I exclaim as I look down and see something slithering over my boots. Keep the noise down, Talbot! Pete whispers hard. Something was on my boots! Palmer stops and comes back. Keep it down back there. We're looking for bad guys. With all the noise you're making, the gooks will hear us. We could be ambushed. This shit is real, people. He stares us down and we all realize it's time to put up with the discomfort and get on with the mission. As the jungle thins, I search 15 yards past Burge. If an enemy was 25 yards ahead, or only 20, I'd never see them. Nobody would. We come to a small clearing. Palmer says, Take a break. Anyone wants to eat, do it now. I look at my watch. It's noon. No one is eating, but long drinks of water are welcome. I pull a sea ration candy bar from my pack and gobble it down. Ten minutes later, we're off again. An hour or more goes by before Palmer raises his fist. We all stop. Through an opening in the trees to my right, I see the graveyard. Across from it is another tree line 75 to 100 yards away. The sergeant and Pete study the site while the squad waits behind them. When it's time, Palmer tells us, 
Okay, listen up. We're going to cross here. We need to get to those woods on the other side. I want a single file. Everyone stays five yards apart. The sergeant turns to our point man. Let's go, Hammond. Move out. We leave the safety of the jungle and enter open space. All our patrols have been along the river and through rice paddies. We've come close to some tree lines, but never ventured in. I've never felt afraid when exposed to an unseen enemy. In fact, I never thought about that danger. Everywhere around Echo 2 has always been safe. Until now, that is. The enemy could be in this jungle waiting for us to get closer. An ambush could cost us all our lives. I shake my head and clear my throat. I want to hesitate, to stay hidden in the jungle. It's basic grunt. When you step into the open from a concealed area, you run the risk of being killed. With a cold sweat, I don't hesitate. When it's my turn, I leave the jungle behind and follow my squad into the open. We enter the graveyard, and I notice the headstones have no markings. I find this strange and wonder why. I try not to step on buried sites, but there are so many it's impossible. Past the graveyard, the jungle looms ahead. As my adrenaline flows through my veins, I'm no longer afraid. I realize I want there to be enemies in these woods. I want to fire my weapon. I want a confirmed KIA. As we enter the bush, the jungle thickens again. No one wants to lose sight of the man in front of him, so we're almost on top of one another. I'm doing good watching Burge in front of me when I see Palmer grab Hammond's shoulder. Our point man, startled, turns back to see why. Palmer has placed a finger over his lips, indicating for Hammond to keep quiet. Turning back to the squad, Sarge signals for everyone to get down while lowering to his knees. He points at his eyes and then back at the jungle in front of us. I know what he's trying to tell us, but looking past him, all I see is green foliage. Then I hear them. Vietnamese voices. Palmer snaps his finger and points at something next to us, on the ground. I look and can't believe what I see. Chapter 19 First Contact Only feet away is a well-used trail heading deep into the jungle. The talking we hear could be the enemy heading this way. Tension etches on my teammates' faces. It's clear the guys look scared. I know I am. The trail bends to the right about ten yards ahead. We can't clearly see them. Other than maybe Palmer, no one has been this close to the enemy before. Palmer snaps his fingers again and we focus. He signals us to stay low, points at his weapon, and then holds up a fist. He wants us to wait for him to shoot first. I stare down the path and see the enemy approaching. As they get closer, their voices become louder. I pick up a word or two of what they're saying. Village. Girl. Home. And then one of them laughs. Through the jungle foliage, I get a glimpse. There looks to be two, but they fade in and out like shadows in the night. I focus on the weapons both are carrying. They're definitely VC. I've never set up an ambush before, but I'm pretty sure we're supposed to be farther away from the kill zone and hidden. If they spot us first, it won't be an easy kill. It'll be a gunfight. Palmer must figure the same. I watch him raise his weapon toward the enemy. He's going to engage before they can get close enough to see us. I aim in, placing my sights on the second man. My thumb moves the selector switch, pushing it to semi-automatic. Now I wait. My mouth is dry, my hands wet. I feel cold. Suddenly Palmer opens fire. I pull the trigger again and again as fast as I can. The sound of the whole squad engaging startles me, but I keep shooting. My target disappears, and now I'm firing into the area they were walking. Though I realize both are down, I continue to pull the trigger. In that instant, I'm changed. I have no fear, no wondering if I can take a life or not. The sound of the battle excites me. I want more. I want to rush toward the enemy and kill them all. Eighteen trigger squeezes later, the bolt locks to the rear. With another magazine loaded, I aim in but hold fire when I hear the sergeant shouting, Cease fire! Everyone stops shooting. The jungle is once again quiet. The silence surrounding us is deafening. 
We all continue to aim our weapons at an area where a moment ago the enemy was walking. Palmer orders, Don, Burge, check them out. Burge and I stand and move into the trail. We both keep our silhouettes low to the ground in case one of them is still alive. Burge is first to go around the bend in the trail, but he stops cold and stares down. I move close behind and look over his shoulder. Holy shit, Burge. You ever seen anything like that before? He shakes his head, keeping his eyes on the bodies. I can't help but notice the green jungle around the trail is splatted with blood. The destructive force of the 556mm round on the human body is evident. I move past his frozen stance. The two VC are so riddled with bullets, it's impossible to recognize what they were. I call back to Palmer. They're both dead, Sarge. Then, noticing what they're carrying, I yell, One of them has a backpack. They both have satchels. Palmer and the squad move forward. He tells us, Search him. I take a knee next to the one I know I hit. His face is mush, and only an ear on the right side of his head remains. His chest is torn open and all I see are ribs. Nothing else. No heart or any organ I can recognize. His legs and trousers are intact. It's the only way I know he was a human being. The thought that some of my rounds were what tore him apart doesn't seem to affect me. But I'm not searching him. I'm trying to put this all together. Shouldn't I feel something for what just happened? Perhaps I should, but in that moment of combat, I felt nothing for this man. Taking his life was what I had to do. Then my humanity starts to take over, and I wonder how I could do such a thing. From behind, Sergeant Palmer shouts with a whisper, Talbot! Why aren't you searching that gook? I don't look back. I put all my feelings away and go through his pockets. I don't know what I'm looking for, just hoping to find anything he might have hidden. But there is nothing. Behind me I hear Pete. Sarge, check this out. I turn around and see Pete has opened the backpack. Looks like calm gear. Palmer tells Burge, Call Tiny. I want out now. Take their weapons and the radio. What's in those satchels? Pete opens one and says excitedly, Jackpot. He turns and smiles at Palmer. Explosives. What about you, Don? I open the satchel and report, Same here. Looks like they were going to hit something or someone tonight, Pete says. Palmer nods. Most likely Echo 4. Blow the explosives in place. Take any paperwork y'all found, the radio and those weapons. We're out of here. Burge reports, Tiny's on his way, Palmer. I told him about the firefight. He's relaying the info to headquarters. Get him back on the radio. Tell him to come down the road toward the cemetery. We'll meet up. I pull back bloody fingers on the dead VC, who's still clutching his M1 carbine. After removing the satchel, I hand it to Bruce. The squad moves out of the jungle and into the open. At a quick pace, Palmer leads us back to Highway 1. A sudden explosion startles us. I turn back and see Pete and Hammond emerge from the bush. The enemy munitions are destroyed. We're not in any formation, just a mob hurrying back. None of us know how many enemy troops are in the area. The way those gooks were walking, relaxed and not worried about anything, they had no idea Marines were nearby. Thirty minutes later, a truck approaches. There's Tiny, yells Palmer. When the six-by arrives, we climb in back, and so does Palmer. The sergeant yells, Go, Tiny, get us the hell out of here! Tiny turns the truck around and heads home. On board, we relax. The danger behind us, we're all smiles and high fives are exchanged. I hold the M1 carbine high in the air and someone yells out, Talbot, you rock, man! Another yells, Cool weapon, Don! That was some badass shit! shouts Hammond. Those gooks were planning on hitting somebody with those charges. Over the sound of the truck's engine, Joe yells, Could have been Echo 4 or maybe us. Sergeant Palmer, we did good today, right? Palmer turns and looks at Murph. Yeah, we did good today.
With our leader's assurance that this mission was a success, our smiles soon turned to laughter. I watched the guys sitting next to one another, recounting what they did in the firefight. We all share in those kills. It wasn't one Marine's bullet, but the entire squad who's earned a KIA. We've taken our first lives today, and we're celebrating. Who's got the other weapon? Palmer asks. No one answers. Come on, you all know we have to turn them in. Who's got it? Pete holds the weapon up to the roar of the squad. It looks like an AK-47, but Bruce asks, What the hell is it, Pete? It's not a 47, says Hammond. Sure it is, man, answers Pete. No, I don't think so. Any markings on it? asks Hammond. Doc, who's been quiet for most of this patrol, answers. It's not an AK-47, Pete. It's a K-50 submachine gun, a rare weapon for a Viet Cong soldier. That's an NVA weapon straight from the Soviet Union. Palmer asks Doc, You think the one carrying it was NVA? Doc pulls from his pack a souvenir he took. He shows it to the whole squad. This is an NVA helmet. See the red star in the middle? So he's NVA? I ask. He was definitely NVA. And he was the one carrying the radio, Doc warns. Why's that important? The VC seldom carry comm gear. They don't use maps like we do. They know the terrain they're fighting in, and they know it well. The NVA are well trained by the Chinese and the Russians. They read maps and know coordinates. If the NVA is patrolling with radios and maps, then they're planning something big. Could be against Echo 4, maybe Da Nang. Burge jumps in. Check this out. He pulls out what looks like a map. I found this on the guy with the radio. Palmer adds, I think they were sent out to find the buried foodstuffs. That map is important, Burge. You take care of that. S2 will figure out what they were doing out here. One thing I can tell you guys, they were out here to radio something back to their HQ and then blow something up. I think the NVA has been out here since Kasi and Echo 4 found that shit. We all stop celebrating. Things around here are changing. The NVA is in our area. Dogpatch and Lo Jang have always been quiet. Now a firefight has taken place only a thousand yards from Echo 4. I think more firefights are coming. Not just across the Cow Do, but around Dogpatch as well. I sit back and sigh, contemplating what we did and what may come. Chapter 20 Wash the Blood Away We return to our compound and turn in any extra ammunition. We drop backpacks, web gear, and rifles on our racks, strip down, and wrap our towels around. We got water? I ask. Yeah. Delivered while we were gone. Hammond, Murph, Joe, and Palmer shower first, says Pete. We go next. While we wait, I think about what happened today. Pete walks next to me. You having a problem, Don? You okay? Yeah, man, I'm cool. No problems. Listen, man, what happened out there today? That was some hairy shit. You need to talk about anything, anything at all. You let me know. Cool? Yeah, cool. But I'm good to go. Pete offers a calming smile and walks away. As soon as the others finish, Pete, me, Burge, Doc, and Bruce walk in for our showers. The water's been sitting in the heat of the sun all day, so it's warm. Not hot, but comfortable. I turn on the spigot and let it run over my body, washing away the jungle and cleaning a dead man's blood off my hands. The guys sharing this water are laughing and joking like nothing has happened. They don't seem to have a problem with what we did today. This is what it's like to kill, to take a life? It wasn't hard. It was easy. Too easy. Bruce shouts from the other end of the showers, Hey Don, they gonna let you keep that M1? Doubt it. Maybe I'll take it apart and mail it home, I reply laughing. Better not even think about that. They'll bust you and throw away the key, warns Doc. So what the hell, Doc? What they gonna do? Cut my hair and send me to Nam? 
Everyone laughs, and Doc snickers with a grin. The joking around has freed my mind from the killing I did today. Now I'm just like the others. I'm hiding what is going on inside of me. The struggle within, attempting to lose my humanity so I will kill again in the next firefight. I finish my shower and return to the hooch. I'm alone and cannot stop thinking about those two dead men. The vision of their twisted and torn bodies is stuck in my head. My stomach churns, sweat beads in my hairline, and my hands start to quiver. I start to second-guess my actions. But what else could I do? Out here is not like being in the safety of America. Out here you either kill or go home in a body bag. Chapter 21 Birthday Celebration November 10, 1967 Tet minus 82 days. I rise at 7 a.m. Outside, the sun is shining. The PF has already left their bunkers and fighting holes along the perimeter. Joe is on radio watch and talking with someone. He signals me over. Roger that. I'll let Sergeant Palmer know. He puts the handset down and looks up at me. Colonel Day isn't coming today. After what happened a few days ago near Lojang, it's too dangerous. Tiny is supposed to make a run with something for us later. Pete has been standing close enough to hear Joe's message. We'll have our own party when Tiny gets here. Palmer going to be okay with that? Palmer going to be okay with what? Sarge asks. Pete turns to Palmer. Battalion isn't sending anyone out here for the Marine Corps birthday. Joe got the message it was too dangerous for the colonel. You write down the message, Joe? Yes, Sarge, I did. He hands him the radio message book. Palmer reads the message. They don't mention the colonel. It only says visits to forward positions are canceled. And there'll be something heading to your pose later today. We can have our own party, right, Sarge? asks Joe. Palmer stares at him a moment, then answers, Yeah, sure. Don, take over radio watch. Joe, go in and get everyone up. We'll still do our cleanup. By then, Tiny should be here and we'll see what he brings. Sea ration breakfast takes away my morning hunger. I clean up the area around the radio while the rest of Echo 2 polices the compound. At noon, before anyone starts eating lunch, Tiny's truck shows up. Palmer and the rest of the team head down to the front gate. I take the handset and announce to HQ, I'll be down for a few mics. Then I run over to see what Tiny brought us. In the back of his truck are food containers. What you got, Tiny? I ask. Steaks, beer, cake. Come on, you guys, get your shit off my truck. I got more deliveries to make. Joe climbs into the truck's bed and starts handing down the containers. Hey, Tiny, Joe asks. You got a delivery for Echo 4? Yeah, man, of course. Why you ask? Ain't you afraid after what we ran into over there? That area might be too hot for the colonel, but not for us grunts. He laughs and climbs back into his rig. I'll stop back in a couple of hours to pick those up. Tiny drives away and the team hauls everything to our hooch. Palmer takes control and says, All right, open them up. Let's see what they gave us. Inside are 12 steaks, baked potatoes, and corn on the cob. In a cooler are nine cold beers, one for each of us. The best part of the meal is a small cake. On the cake, written in frosting, is the Marine Corps emblem and the words, Happy 192nd Birthday. After grabbing a steak, a baked potato, and corn, I'm in heaven. The steak is a little tough, but tastes so good. The corn and potato are well done, and the beer tastes great. Of course, we have our own beer, but that was only enough for one more each. Hey, Talbot, ain't you on radio watch? Palmer asks. Grumbling, I answer, Fuck, Sarge. Can I take the chow with me? Sit down and eat with the rest of us. I'll take care of the radio. Palmer walks out and I guess leaves HQ a message that we'll be down for a while. Then he walks back in. I watch him sit and start eating. I smile, knowing my squad leader will always do what's best for his troops.
I've been in the core more than a year. This is my first ever celebrating the core birthday. I'd like to do this again, not here, but back in the world. You know, this is my best day in Vietnam. Why's that, Don? asks Palmer. Because today the war went away. There is no patrol, no dealing with the enemy. All there is, is us. And the food. I know that won't last. I know the war is coming. But for today, for this moment, everything's cool. Hey, Hammond, you ever celebrate the Marine Corps birthday? asks Burge. Once, like this, in Nam. Same food, but back then we got three beers each. Our company commander was there with us. This is better. No heavies to weigh us down. How about you, Sarge? Burge asks. Why are you asking me? Because no one else has been in the Corps long enough to be around for them. I've been to one, back in the world. Had to wear my blues. Better food than this and a lot more alcohol. You got to be in a ball? Questions Hammond. Yeah, and I got laid too. Palmer laughs. All the guys are laughing at what Palmer just revealed. You're a fucking liar, Palmer, echoes Hammond. And it was the colonel's daughter, Palmer says. Now the guys are laughing so hard you would never think we were so close to an enemy who wanted us dead. After our birthday party, we go back to protecting the compound. Burge and I take the tower, and Pete and Doc go to the rear bunker. I don't know if what the Sarge told us is true or not. He never admitted it one way or the other. But it sure made us all laugh. It brought us together. This was a great day. Chapter 22 Air Force Invasion November 18, 1967 Tet minus 74 days. The past week has been boring. No patrols, only routine guard duty. I haven't heard anything going on with any of our sister Echo teams either. All seem quiet, and that's good. At 10 a.m., Tiny drives up and parks in front of the compound gate. In the bed of his truck sits six guys. Joe notices their uniforms and shouts, They're not Marine Corps! We haven't heard anything about visitors. By the look on Palmer's face, neither has he. We're standing around watching the sergeant walk them through the yard to the PF hooch. Four of them are carrying huge bags over their shoulders. The other two are carrying a larger and heavier black bag between them. Joe, who's standing next to me, says, Looks like the PF are sleeping in the village tonight. Who are those guys? What do you think they're doing here? Then it came to me. I know that uniform. They're Air Force. How do you know, man? When I was with Delta, we got hit with a shitload of rockets. Away from my bunker and needing to take cover, I dove into another bunker and a dog handler's animal bit me. He was Air Force. And those guys are Air Force. But what are they doing here? Don't know. Air Force, huh? Here comes the Sarge. Ask him. I corner Palmer as he tries to walk past. Hey, Sarge, what the hell? Why is the Air Force here? Supposed to be running some type of communication tests. They got orders from Colonel Day, so get used to it and stay out of their way. How long are they going to be here? Joe wants to know. A few days, they say. Later that night, Pete sets the guard. Murph, Hammond, you two have tower duty. Talbot, your radio watch. You know what's expected of you, Talbot? Yeah, Pete, I do. No talking on the radio. Stay away from the bullshit channel, and if I sleep, keep the handset glued to my ear? That's right. Get set up, do a radio check with battalion, and then... whatever. I show a thumbs up and begin my pre-check of our communications. I make a good radio check with battalion, then turn the volume up all the way. With the squelch on, I set the handset next to my ear and begin the watch. The radio is set up outside near the front entrance of our hooch, which gives me a perfect view of the Air Force's hatch. It's a normal quiet night at first. Then at 2200, the Air Force comes out of their hooch and start putting together a huge antenna. To see, they use a battery-operated light. A master sergeant walks up and asks me, You guys got a light up there, right? Yeah, a spotlight. 
Can you ask them to shine it down on us? We only need the light for maybe ten minutes. I don't know, that's a long time for the light to be on. Just ask them, will you? I walk to the front of the tower and yell up, Hey Hammond, you awake? What do you want, Talbot? There's an Air Force Master Sergeant that wants you to shine the light on his men working. What does Palmer say? To my surprise, Palmer is behind me and tells Hammond, Do as he asks. The light shines bright on four Air Force pugs setting up an antenna. They put it up fast, and it's almost as high as the tower. Palmer tells the Master Sergeant, You can't leave that there. It will interfere with the lookouts. No problem, Sergeant. We only need to make one contact, then it'll be gone. Tomorrow we'll find a more permanent place to keep it while we're here. Palmer comes up to me. If it's not down in ten minutes, you knock it down. Got that, Don? I nod. Fuck me. How am I supposed to obey those commands? Luckily for me, the Air Force has the antenna down, stored in the huge bag, and carried back to their hooch. The next seven days are just as boring as the seven before them, and the Air Force continues their silence. This morning I watched Doc go into their hooch because one of them had an accident. Don't know what happened, but I guess if they need a doctor, he's what they get. Day seven, and what we referred to as the Air Force invasion, is coming to an end. They took down their giant antenna and packed away their secret radios. They're getting ready to leave. Tiny will pick them up in the morning. In the meantime, Joe and I pull guard duty in the tower. I'm first up the ladder waiting for Joe when this Air Force guy shows up. Holding up his rifle, he asks, Hey, buddy, how about a hand? I take the weapon and help this guy with bushy, almost white hair step into the bunker. Once inside, he stands up straight. I have to look up to see his face. He's tall, must be over six foot four inches. Like me, though, he's skinny. A little irritated, I ask, What you doing here? He puffs, Ah! Then he smiles. I volunteered. I wanted to see what it was like up here. Where's Joe? Your sergeant. What's his name? Palmer. He says only two up here at a time, so I guess the other guy gets the night off. Figures. Joe runs late and he skates. I hand him his weapon. You know how to use this? Yeah, Jarhead, I do. I may be in the Air Force, but I'm still trained, same as you. I look at him and snicker. Not the same as me. He smiles. I know how to shoot. What's your name? Phil. Yours? Don. As the sun begins to set, Phil walks forward and gazes out over the compound. Look at this. This is cool. You can see for miles, and that sunset. Wow. I give Phil a complete rundown of what we do up here. I tell him about the spotlight, show him how and when to use it, talk to him about the PF around the perimeter and when we begin our watches. Before the first watch, I ask Phil, What the hell are you guys doing here? It's been over a week. All we've seen you do is talk on those radios. Who are you talking with? We're communicating with planes. They're very high. What for? What are they doing? Practicing? What kind of planes? And what are they practicing? B-52. They're practicing bombing runs. You know, arc lights. You know what an arc light is? Yeah, of course. When a B-52 drops his bombs, the explosions form an arc of light. It's supposed to be something to see from a distance. They planning on dropping anything around here? No, too many friendlies. This is just practice. Our equipment allows us to verify the run and see how accurate a drop would be if it was for real. Cool. How they doing? Ah, uh, it's a secret. I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. We both laugh. The following day, Tiny picks up the Air Force, and we never see them again. Chapter 23 Trouble is Coming November 28, 1967, Tet minus 64 days. We got a frag order for a patrol in our sector. 
It's not an overnight and is basically along the river. This reminds me of our first patrol. We haven't seen any VC in our area. As far as we know, neither have any of the other Echo platoons. Palmer is taking no chances. He is preparing as if we're going into battle with a platoon of NVA. I'm loading grenades and carrying 20 magazines. Doc is sitting next to me loading up when he says, Where are you from, Don? Wow, you don't know. I'm from Chicago. Where are you from, Doc? Dallas, Texas, home of my Cowboys football. Can you call it football? My Bears are doing great. Your Cowboys ain't doing so well. Not as good as your Bears, but we're getting better every year. I think we'll have a champion soon. When they do, I'm going to that game. Hey, I was wondering, how do you become a corpsman? He looks at me and smiles with a chuckle. You know, I was a senior in high school when I took my SAT. I did pretty good. So after I graduated, I signed up at U of D, North Texas. Before I started school, I got my draft notice. Why didn't you get an exemption for college? I ask. I didn't want to fight the draft board, so I decided to sign up. There was no way I was carrying a rifle, so I joined the Navy. When I took the ASVAB test, I scored really high, and they said, you're going to be a corpsman. Did you tell them you didn't want to carry a rifle? Yeah, Don, I did. Well, this senior chief said the chance of me being assigned to a Marine Corps unit was slim at best. And here I am. Shit, Doc. Looks like that didn't work out too well for you. Doc doesn't answer. He just sighs. You sorry you're here with us? Doc shoots me a look that says, how dare you? Look, Don, I don't think any of us want to be here, except maybe Hammond. He smiles. But you guys are my responsibility. You're all my family. I must keep you safe and well. There's a long pause between us before I ask, You got a girl, Doc? Hell no. I got a dozen. He laughs. Let's go, you two, yells Palmer. We need to get this patrol moving. I want to be back before dark. With the team finally set, we move out. Palmer decides to leave one man back to monitor the radio. He picks Burge, and the rest of us start our hump. We run the patrol through Dog Patch, the rice paddies, and the river. It's like I'm back with Delta. Once again, there's no sign of any enemy. These patrols are becoming so routine, we're allowing ourselves to become relaxed. Our attention to our surroundings is decreasing. We're not as sharp as we were when we ran into those two VC we killed. The next night, we gather around the radio to listen to the bullshit net. Over the last several days, the artillery coming out of Da Nang and the surrounding bases seems to have increased. Joe tries to find the proper frequencies, but he's having a hard time. You got the right frequencies? asks Palmer. Yes, yeah, Sarge, I do. Hey, I got it. Pete acknowledges positively, Nice job, Joe. With sarcasm in his tone, Palmer adds, It's about time. He grabs the handset and asks across the net, Anyone hear anything about some big battles going on around Nam? From the radio comes the answer, yeah, I heard around Quezon something big is coming. Like what? Recon teams from 3rd Recon Battalion can't go anywhere outside the perimeter of Quezon without making contact. This gets me thinking. It might not be too much longer before we see action again. Chapter 24 Staying Frosty December 1st, 1967, Tet minus 61 days. Tiny pulls up to our gate with resupplies. Anyone not on duty hurries down to unload his truck. Hey, have any of you heard about the shit going on around Nam? What's that, Tiny? Palmer asks. It started early November, lasted like three weeks. Hundreds of army dudes got killed. It's the largest battle of the war so far. Where'd it happen? asks Pete. Central Highlands. I'm still unfamiliar with some of the country, so I ask, where's the Central Highlands? It's a string of mountains near Cambodia and Laos, Palmer tells me. 
That's a long way from here, man, adds Bruce. Pete mentions, yeah, I don't think it has anything to do with us. Palmer warns, probably not, but we need to be ready if it comes our way. There's been a lot more shit popping up around Echo 4. The gooks seem interested in Lo Jang. Captain Jocelyn wants patrols to keep up. He doesn't want our minds on Christmas or home. Now get these supplies into camp. Tiny, you take it easy. He nods and climbs back into his truck. Driving away, he yells, Stay frosty, Echo 2! Back in the camp, Murph wants to know, What's going on around Echo 4, Sarge? They find another cache of shit? No, but their last patrol did find a deserted base camp at the west end of the Lojang area. They reported it's large enough for 50 to 100 VC. Captain mentioned how Sergeant Cossey has been marking the area with predetermined fire missions. H and I, Pete softly injects, and Palmer nods affirmatively. I know nothing about artillery, so I ask, what the hell is H and I? Harassment and interdiction. Palmer goes on to explain why Cossey might call in those artillery missions. This allows him to call in artillery on a suspected enemy position quickly, using those predetermined coordinates. You can use them for defense, covering likely enemy attack routes to your position, or... Or what? I ask, worry in my voice. Or use them for suspected enemy staging areas. Joe needs to know. So what? Cossie thinks they're going to get hit? You think that's why we've been hearing an increase in Artie? Asks Doc. Maybe. I don't know. Hey, Sarge, so what we doing? Burge questions. For now, while we're here, we do like Tiny said. We stay frosty. No one fucks off while on guard. Night radio will be a four-hour watch. No more sleeping while on duty. We got another patrol in a few days. That's as far as I know. Across the bridge near Lo Jang? Bruce grumbles. Negative. Echo Four's handling that. We're covering the river. All right, it's getting late. Pete, you handle the tower and rear bunker guard duty. Copy that, Pete responds, then looks at me. Hey, Talbot, you ever pull rear bunker duty? No, Corporal, I don't think so. Calling him Corporal instead of Pete is my way of telling him that that duty sucks. Good, you got bunker duty. Joe, you go with him. Joe and I enter this run-down bunker that covers the rear of our compound. It's worse than the ones in Delta Company. This bunker is literally a rat's nest, and they are running everywhere. How do you deal with all the critters here? I ask. You leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. Why doesn't Palmer get someone to clean them up? He's tried. HQ tells him as soon as something is available, they'll let him know. You know, Joe, this is the first time I've been in this bunker. Really? So what? You've only gotten tower duty? Yeah, pretty much. That and radio watch. I gaze out the front firing holes at the rice paddy stretching more than a click away. Beyond them, I see what looks like jungle. This is something. Is that jungle out there? Are you shitting me, Talbot? You ain't never even been back here? Not one time? The closest I've been is when I arrived and Doc showed me around. Looking at the back of the bunker, I see a great deal of ordnance. Look at all this ammo. We get hit, we'll never run out. We got it stored here and in the generator bunk, the tower, our hooch. You need to know this. If we're under siege and someone yells for ammo, you need to know where to go and get it. Oh, hell, man, I knew there was ammo back here. I just didn't realize how much. Joe and I settle how we'll split up the watch as darkness blankets us. I'm first. You ever use a pop-up illumination, Don? Nope. We didn't have them when I was with MP Battalion. He picks up an alum, pulls the tape that holds the top on, and then removes a silver tube from inside. Joe takes the top cap off and places it on the bottom of the flare. Now watch. He moves to the bunker wall and, while holding the flare pointing up and out, he tells me, All you do is pound the bottom of the flare into the sandbag. Hard. Make sure the flare is pointing up and out. Got it? Yeah, just do it. 
Joe slams the flare into the sandbag and pow, it flies high into the night and ignites, lighting the ground below. When the parachute deploys, it slowly sinks to the ground. With my newly obtained knowledge of how to deploy an illumination, we settle in for the night. Joe lies down on a cot in the back of the bunker while I watch the rice paddies for Charlie. A half hour into my watch, I decide to light a flare. I follow the directions perfectly. The flare climbs high and bursts. The rice paddies light up as the illumination floats down. So cool. The watch is like all the other nights I've spent on guard. Boring. Except I get to play with some rockets. That's fun. December is the same as every other month I've been here. A few useless patrols, guard duty, and complete boredom. No enemy sightings. That is, until a few days before Christmas, when Sergeant Palmer calls us together. Christmas is Monday, and the captain told me there's supposed to be a ceasefire. We go out Christmas Eve. An AO was flying over an area west of here and spotted what he thought were VC or NVA. According to the captain, there are irrigation ditches at the coordinates he gave me. Headquarters wants them checked out. Chapter 25 Something's Coming December 24th, 1967, Tet minus 38 days. We're up early, loading our ammo, water, and chow for the patrol. No ride from Tiny this time. Hammond pulls guard duty in the tower until we get back. One of our radios went down a couple of days ago. With only one working, Palmer decides the tower needs it more than we do. Makes sense. Our range is only a few miles, so without the compound to relay for us, it's useless. Don your point. I've walked point plenty since my first patrol. It doesn't bother me anymore. As we move off, the sun is rising at our backs. I see my shadow, and my thoughts drift to an earlier time back home. June 8, 1959. It was a Sunday and my eleventh birthday. I wasn't expecting anything that year. Mom told me I couldn't have a party. Like any other Sunday, Mom got my brothers, my sister, and me up for church. After our morning head calls, we all met at the breakfast table. Dad was sitting there reading the paper and drinking his morning coffee. Mom stood at the stove, where she prepared and then served the family a big platter of pancakes. Finished, she sat down. I had a big frown, wondering why no one was wishing me a happy birthday and where my presents were. Then, when my dad, who rarely spoke during breakfast, said, Today's your birthday, isn't it, Don? I smiled and nodded. Sure is, Dad. I looked over at Mom, who was trying to hide a smirk. My father put down his paper and surprised me by saying, Would you like to do something special today? Just you and me? With a mouthful of pancakes, I nodded. Yeah! Well, finish your breakfast and get dressed. I looked at Mom and asked, What about church? Oh, you can miss this one time, she said. I finished the last bite of pancakes and ran to my room. Behind me, my brothers and sister were all complaining. Why did I get out of going to church and they couldn't? I didn't care. I got dressed and returned in a flash. Dad was already in the car waiting. Mom yelled after me as I flew out the back door, I'll have a cake for you when you get home, Donnie. She always tried to make our birthdays the best. Outside, the sun was shining and the day promised to be hot. As I ran for the car, I watched my shadow race along in front of me. I got in and my dad started driving. Dad never did anything alone for my birthday before. He always left that to Mom. I couldn't figure out what was going on, so I asked. Where are we going, Dad? He wouldn't answer. He only kept saying, you'll see. But as he drove, I noticed he turned down Western Avenue. I knew that road and thought, it can't be. We talked during the ride. He asked me about school, Little League baseball, and my chores around the house. It wasn't long before I started to recognize some of the places we were passing and again thought, 
Could we be going to... Nah, Dad didn't even like that place. I was trying not to think about where he was taking me, but then he asked, Do you know where we are, Don? I stretched and looked out the front window. A smile filled my face when I spotted a ride called the Parachutes rising high in the air. Excited, I watched the chutes climb to the top, stall a moment, and then drop. I answered, I think so. Still too afraid to say it out loud, afraid it wasn't true. But when we pulled into the park entrance, I knew it was. We were at Riverview Park, the best place ever. I remember shouting, Oh, Dad, is this my present? We're going to Riverview? He looked at me first with a frown and then with a smile and nod. Right there in front of us, I saw the sign, Riverview Park, the giant towers with the American flags flying high. My mouth dropped open, and I flew across the seat and hugged my dad. Hey, Don, shouts Sergeant Palmer. Get your head and ass wired. We're going this way. Sorry, Sarge. He's right. I was drifting. This ain't Chicago. This is Vietnam. And that shadow I'm seeing isn't a kid's. This one's carrying a rifle and wearing a helmet. We pass through an open area, rice paddies on our left and tall grass to our right. A few hours in, I spot what looks like the ditches we've been heading for. I hold up a fist, halting the squad, and Palmer comes forward. Is that them? I ask. The sergeant pulls out field glasses from a case strapped to his side, peers through them, and says, Yeah, Don, that's them. He signals for Pete to come forward and hands him the glasses, telling him, those are the ditches. While Pete checks them out, Palmer puts the squad on line. He does this so our firepower will be forward, toward the target. Pete, you take right point. Don, your left point. I'm center. Doc behind me. Everyone else fill in. Palmer looks the squad over. Okay, let's go. The distance to the target is over a hundred yards. We're moving slowly, keeping our focus forward. Pete and I on the outside have the added responsibility of watching our flanks. Fifty yards out, Palmer stops and everyone takes a knee. Pete moves to his side and they're whispering something about what the Sarge saw in the ditches. Palmer turns to the squad. There's movement in that forward ditch. Pete, make a fire team. Move right into the grass and circle around. As soon as you're in position, the rest of us will move forward. Pete whispers, Bruce, Burge, Joe, you're with me. Let's go. The four of them move off to the tall grass. When Pete signals he's ready, Palmer starts us moving. We don't know if what he saw was VC, NVA, or local villagers. At this point, it doesn't matter. We're on full alert and ready for contact. Twenty-five meters out, the sergeant stops us again. I look right and spot Joe taking up the tail end of Pete's team. If there are enemy in those ditches and they open up on us, we'll have them in a crossfire. We start out again and soon we're only a few yards away. Pete's team arrives first and moves close to the ditches. He's the first to spot them. Gooks! Pete yells. Palmer and Burge hurry forward and I'm right behind them. In the ditch I see two VC each holding an AK-47. Both Pete and Palmer are screaming, Chiu Thua Dao Hang! They're telling them to yield, to surrender. In seconds, the entire squad surrounds the ditch. We point all our weapons at the two VC and yell for them to give up. The enemy knows their situation is hopeless. Their heads dart back and forth from marine to marine, faces filled with fear and eyes that scream, Don't shoot me! A few seconds go by before the one closest to Palmer drops his weapon and raises his hands. The second VC follows and they both surrender. Joe, Pete, get down there. Pete and Joe jump in and force the two captured VC to their knees. Don, you and Bruce check those other ditches. Make sure they're clear. Bruce and I look but find them empty. We move back to the squad and report, All clear, Sarge. Good, he replies. Get them up here, Pete. Search them. Tie them up and blindfold them. Hurry. The rest of you form a 360. Tie them up with what? Blindfold them with what? Shouts Pete. Use your boot laces. 
I watch as the two enemies have their hands tied behind their backs. Bruce and I supply our green bandanas and they're placed over the enemy's eyes. Once our foes are secured, Palmer orders, pick up their weapons and move out, back to the compound. The hump back to our area is a cautious one, even more so than this morning. Now that we know there are VC in this area, it leaves us jumpy. It's early afternoon when we enter Echo 2 compound. The Vietnamese popular force is standing around the grounds when we walk in. Their smiles at our return soon disappear when they notice who we've brought back with us. They move toward the two captured enemies, yelling and cursing. One PF kicks a prisoner, and another throws a punch, causing the VC to fall down. The PF are carrying weapons, and I'm thinking this could get ugly in a hurry. Palmer orders, Don, Burge, Joe, keep those people away. They'll kill them before we can interrogate. Sarge leads the captured VC to Doc's hooch. The squad follows. Inside, he sets them down on the gravel deck and finds Hammond, who has come down from the tower. Get on the radio. Call headquarters and talk with Captain Jocelyn. Tell him we have two VC prisoners. Find out what he wants us to do. Palmer orders, Don, Joe, Doc, you three stay here. The rest of you outside. Pete, make sure those PF aren't getting out of control. Then Palmer removes their blindfolds and asks, Don V. Kuabanla G. He says this over and over, but the VC ignore him. I know a few Vietnamese words and phrases, but I don't recognize what Palmer is doing, so I ask, What's going on, Doc? Palmer's asking what their unit is, how many are out there. Hammond comes into the hooch. Pete is with him. Captain says to keep the prisoners secured. He holds up two pillow covers. And keep these over their heads. He's on his way. Burge and Palmer place the covers over the VC heads. Bruce and I grab our kerchiefs back. I hold mine up with two fingers and remark, I'm not touching this until I wash it. Bruce grins and nods. Sarge asks Pete, What's the situation outside? We took care of it. Everything's quiet. Say, Doc, don't you have some plastic cuffs? Asks Palmer. Yeah, I do. Doc walks to his desk and pulls open drawers until he finds what the sergeant wants. He hands them forth. Here they are. Palmer takes one set and tells Doc, Put these on that gook and give Joe back his bootlaces. Palmer does the same to the other VC, handing Pete his laces. That was some nice work out there, Pete. You did a good job on that flanking move. And Joe. Hey, Joe. Joe turns around and faces the sergeant. You too, man. Pete, tell the squad everyone did a nice job today. Oorah! Oorah, Pete says. We all repeat, Oorah! Bruce and I catch prisoner guard duty. While we wait for Captain Jocelyn to show up, Bruce asks, You ever think a couple of years ago you'd be doing this? Hell no. I wouldn't have thought I'd be doing this last month, or even last week. Yeah, me neither. What do you think this means, Don? What? You mean these prisoners? Yeah. We made contact last month, and now we have these VC right here in our backyard. Something's coming, man. I don't know what, but something. Yeah, looks like it. Say, Don, you think much about home? Sure, man, all the time. Probably too much. How about you? Yeah, me too. I got a girl. I think I love her. Thought she loved me too. Bruce pauses. I can see he's holding back some deep emotions. I got a letter last week. She told me she can't write anymore. Her college friends told her the war is wrong. That sucks, man. I want to smile, but with the hurt in Bruce's eyes, I keep my smile to myself. I hear a couple of vehicles pull up outside. Check it out, Bruce. See if that's them. Bruce stands and walks outside. He returns a minute later following the captain. Another Marine wearing an MP armband follows Bruce in. This is the first time I've seen Captain Jocelyn. He's tall, over six feet, and I can tell he works out even in Nam. He's all Marine Corps. His boots are polished and his captain bars are shiny, placed perfectly on his collar. He sets an example to the Marines under his command. 
Even his haircut is Marine Corps, high and tight. I stand and the captain asks, They've been quiet? They give you any trouble? No, sir, I answer. Not a peep out of them. He walks over to the two still sitting on the deck and replaces their hoods with two of his own. Speaking in Vietnamese, he tells them to get up and start walking. The MP grabs one of the VC and roughly pushes him through the open door. The captain grabs the other and follows. Outside, a green pickup truck with three more MPs is waiting. They separate the two VC, putting one in the front of the truck's bed behind the driver and the other to the opposite side near the tailgate. The rest of the squad is outside watching our prisoners about to leave when the captain says, Nice job, Echo 2. I'll see if I can't get you all something extra for Christmas. The captain gets in the passenger side of the truck and Palmer walks up. What do you think is going on, Captain? Why do you think they were there? I don't know, Sergeant. As soon as I do, I'll pass you the word. He turns to the driver. Let's go. What the hell does that mean, Sarge? I ask. He shakes his head. Chapter 26 A Christmas Dinner and Letters Home December 25th, 1967 Tet minus 37 days. I wake this morning and Vietnam is at peace. The usual sound of artillery fire off in the distance isn't there. The ceasefire went into effect at midnight and as far as we can tell, it's holding. I grab my writing tablet and pen and walk outside. The sun is shining this Christmas morning. I feel sad. I miss my family. An empty ammunition crate sits outside the hooch. I sit down and begin writing letters home. Dear Mom, Nothing much going on around here today. There's a ceasefire in Vietnam. It started at midnight. The guys and I are going to take it easy. No patrols. And that's good. I'm outside and the sun is shining. It's warm, not hot, but that will change by this afternoon. Captain Jocelyn, he's kind of our commanding officer, well, it was only yesterday that I met him. He told Echo 2 we've been a good team and would do something special for us today. Pete hopes it's beer. For me, Mom, I hope it's a great meal. I got the package you sent for Christmas. Most of the guys here have gotten something from home over the last couple of weeks. We share everything we get. So when you send something, it's for the whole squad. I still have two cans of spaghetti and meatballs you sent me. I'm saving them for a critical time when I need a bit of civilian chow. I ate the fruitcake. Wow! I never liked it much when I was home, and I'm surprised you sent it. I guess it's the only cake that would last the time it takes for mail to reach us. But you know what, Mom? I loved it. And so did the guys. It was really good. I couldn't believe the way Tuck ate it up. Okay, Tuck is our corpsman. You remember I wrote you about him before. He's our doc. His real name is Alan. I don't know why his name is Tuck. Most of us just call him Doc. I think it has something to do with where he comes from. It can get lonely here sometimes, Mom. A few of the guys are awake now and coming outside. They see me writing home, and now they're writing too. Pete Cruz, I told you about him before, he's our second in charge. I told you how his wife is pregnant. Well, a few days ago he told me she's due any day now. This is their first baby. He looks worried when he talks about it. I guess he wants to be there. Being here, I'm glad I'm single. Do you remember Bruce? Sergeant Ed Palmer, he doesn't like titles, so we sometimes use first names out here. Anyway, he calls Bruce... The Bruce. I asked him why Palmer calls him that, and he said because it's his name, Johnny Bruce Jackson. Well, he's not doing so good. I guess he was engaged, and he got a Dear John letter last week. Tough, but also funny when you think about it. John got a Dear John. I miss you all so much, Mom, but it's good to know that at least today I'm safe. I'm going to sign off now. Sorry for such a short letter, but I want to write Dad and both my brothers who never write to me. I got a letter from Sis when I got your package and wrote back. 
I love you, Mom. Keep those letters coming, and tell those little brats to write me. I need that. We all do. Love you. Dawn Dear Dad, I know you read the letters I send to Mom, and you will sometimes add something to the ones she sends, but I never get one from you. I guess I shouldn't complain. This is the first letter I'm writing to you alone. I want to write to you because I need to share something, and I don't want anyone else in the family to know. What I'm about to tell you, I haven't even written to my best friend Kenny. Last month, we made contact with 2VC. We killed them, Dad. I didn't get a confirmed kill because they were killed by everyone in the squad. We were all shooting. Killing them made me wonder who I was. I know you saw some bad stuff in the war, but what I saw that day made me think. I was ordered to search one of them. He was the one I shot. It was bad. He had no face and his chest and belly were blown open. I mean, there was nothing left. I have never seen anything like that before, and I don't want to see it again. That was our first contact. It was unusual because nothing like that has ever happened around here before. But then, yesterday, we captured two more VC not far from our compound. A couple of months ago, another Echo Squad found a lot of supplies for the enemy. Hey, Dad, Sarge wants me and the guys to put away the ammo and rations that came in yesterday. I'll be right back. It's noon, and as we finish stocking our supplies, Tiny shows up. He stops his truck in front of our gate and jumps down, yelling, Hey, Echo 2, I got a surprise for y'all! The whole squad walks over and meets Tiny at the truck's tailgate. What you got? Palmer asks. You guys get Christmas dinner. Come on, help me get it down. After Tiny climbs into the bed of the truck, he starts handing us three food containers and a red cooler. A couple of guys start to open the containers, but Sarge stops them. Leave those buttoned up, he says. Take them to the hooch, Doc. You're in charge. Don't do anything until we're all together. As Palmer and I help close the truck's tailgate, Tiny says, Something is going on here, Ed. I shouldn't tell you this. He stops and looks around to be sure we're alone. When I was in S2 this morning, I overheard the colonel giving a brief to his battalion officers. Palmer and I exchange a glance as Tiny continues. Some recon team stumbled across an NVA base camp near a place called Quezon. They barely made it out alive. They reported there were hundreds, maybe thousands of NVA troops. Both Sarge and I become concerned. Tiny adds, This has been happening all over Nam, like the food cache Echo 4 found, remember? We both nod. Why don't you stay for chow, man? Palmer asks Tiny. Thanks, Ed, but I can't. I gotta get the other teams their Christmas dinners. I need to get back to Da Nang before sundown. You guys take it easy. And hey, wait one. I almost forgot. Captain Jocelyn added something special for you guys because of your VC prisoner catch yesterday. What is it? asks the sergeant. I don't know, but if your guys find it first, there won't be anything left for you two. Tiny climbs back into his rig and drives off. Palmer and I hurry back to the hooch. We walk in and find the squad is not following Ed's order to wait. Everyone is holding a beer in their hands. What the hell, Doc? I told you to wait. One of the guys peeked in the cooler, and before I could stop them, everyone had a beer. He pauses a moment. Come on, Ed, ever since Colonel Day took over, we can't get any beer here. It's been a while. Palmer looks across the room at a happy squad of Marines. Go get our beer, Don. I hurry over and grab two Budweiser. I hand one to Ed. Here you go, Sarge. Then I open mine and take a swig. Open those food containers. See what we got. Palmer orders. The squad shares a great meal and a couple more beers each, and then returns to compound living. Sarge puts the guard together, and I go back to finishing my letter to Dad. I'm back, Dad. We got Christmas dinner delivered. It was great. We had chicken and steak, mashed potatoes, gravy, and stuffing. They gave us corn on the cob. I had two. It's getting dark, and I can hear artillery fire in the distance. 
Guess the ceasefire is over. Nothing around us, though. We're still safe. Please don't let anyone else see this. I wouldn't want them worrying even more than I know they already are. So, anyway, just felt I had to say this to someone. As I said, there has never been any reason to think the area I'm in is in any danger of VC or NVA units. Thanks, Dad. Love you. Don. P.S. You can tell everyone about the dinner we got. They'd like that. Chapter 27 Sharing a Wet Day January 4, 1968 Tet minus 26 days It started raining yesterday and hasn't stopped. This is like the monsoons all over again. It's miserable. The ground is mud. The fighting holes surrounding our compound have standing water. The worst parts of this are the heat and humidity. I can't stand how hot it is inside our hooch. We sit and sweat. I'm hungry. I grab my Chef Boyardee spaghetti and meatballs and a canteen of water and head out the hatch. Outside, I feel the heat, but the air is refreshing. I make a run for the tower, climb the ladder to the top, and enter the bunker. I smile when a cool breeze flows over me and look up at the roof, keeping me dry. Sitting, I open the chow with my trusty John Wayne can opener. It is the last of my civilian food that Mom sent. I'm surprised when Pete sticks his head in the tower bunker. Hey, Don. He climbs in and sits. What you doing? With a fork of spaghetti about to go into my mouth, I look at him sideways. I'm chowing down? Yeah, I can see that. He's silent for a moment or two while I stick a meatball in my mouth. Nice up here. Cool breeze, he says. Say, you know Hammond is getting short. I stop eating and look up. Yeah, I know. So what? I've only got three months left myself. I thought you got here, uh, last September. No, it was August. But, you know, I arrived in country last March, so come April, I'm out of here. Okay. Me too. You too? Yeah, me too. I'm out of here in April. So why are you telling me about Hammond being short? Is he leaving early or something? Nah, not him. I don't know. I'm just thinking about home, I guess. He's quiet, a homesick look written over his face. I know what that's like. We all get it. I changed the subject, trying to help him. Say, you got a picture of that new baby girl you've talked about? With a broad smile, he says, Hell yeah, I want to see. Pete pulls out his wallet and hands me the picture of a tiny baby wrapped in a white blanket. Man, she's beautiful. What's her name? I ask, handing back the photo. Paula, that's my wife, says we can wait till I get home. We'll pick a name together. His smile fades, and I can tell he longs to be there with them. He stares at his baby girl and begins to caress the picture as if he's trying to touch her. What day in April are you going home? He looks up. Hmm? What? Your date home, man. On the Freedom Bird. When in April are you supposed to go? He puts the photo back in his wallet. April 18th. What's your date? April 13th. Won't we go back early, you know, to check out and shit like that? Yeah, about a week or so, he says. They want us cleaned up before we head back to the world. What about Hammond? What's his date? Not sure. The middle of February, around the 15th. So he'll get orders back to Da Nang around the 7th or 8th. Man, he is short. That puts him at five weeks, maybe six. I take a moment and watch as Pete's smile fades. Then with a grin, I add, But look, man, the sooner he leaves, the sooner we're gone, too. Sergeant Palmer yells from below, Cruz! Corporal Cruz! Pete, where the hell are you? Pete stands and looks down over the front sandbag wall. I get up and stand next to him. Right here, Ed, what you need? Get down here. We're going out tonight. You too, Talbot. Pete and I exchange a concerned glance. Going out this late means only one thing. 
a night ambush. I pick up my empty can of food and my canteen and follow Pete down the ladder. On the ground, Palmer tells him, We only need six tonight. Ask for volunteers. Hammond is short. Leave him here. Yeah, Pete answers. Don and I were talking about him. He turns to me. You up for this? I shrug and answer, Sure, count me in. He nods. You, me, and Ed, that's three. Pete and Ed head back to the hooch while I'm off to the garbage pit. The rain has stopped, so my walk is a dry one. On the way back, I think about my volunteering. Didn't have to say yes. Could have said no. Yeah, you're an asshole, Talbot. Back at the hooch, Joe, Bruce, and Hammond are hanging around Pete. I walk over and Joe asks, Hey, Don, you coming too? I smile. Yeah, you guys would get lost without me. Yeah, right. Hey, you walk in point? They chuckle. Fuck, I hope not. Y'all get your shit together, Pete says. We're out at 1800 hours. Everyone grab a frag. Don and Joe, you both take a claymore. I'm curious, Pete, I say. I thought Hammond was staying behind because he's a short timer. What can I say? I told him he wasn't going, but he insisted. The guy is so damn gung-ho. We move out on time. I get stuck carrying the radio. It's about 40 more pounds of weight on my back, but at least I'm not walking point. The rain stopped, so now the hump is a little easier, but the clouds overhead threaten us with more inclement weather. We move through the village to the rice paddies. An hour later, a clump of trees we've passed before on earlier patrols is on our right. This is where Palmer wants us to set up. We've not been in these trees before. In here we find tall grass on dry land separating the rice paddies from the foliage. Palmer splits us into three groups. Pete, you take Don and set up forward in the high grass. You'll have a good sight of the area to our east. Stay vigilant. If gooks show up tonight, that's where they'll most likely come from. Copy that, Pete answers. Bruce, you and Hammond set up back there, in the trees, about ten feet from Don and Pete. You make sure no one comes up behind us, and you'll be close enough to help them if we get hit. Everybody stay frosty. I got a bad feeling. What about you, Ed? Where are you going to be? Pete asks. Joe and I will set up in the high grass a couple of yards from you. We'll protect your flank. You know where to set the claymore? He asks. Facing east. What about yours? I'll set mine to cover an area to our front and east. That'll give us a nice kill zone. He pauses. Everyone poncho up. I know it's not raining now, but it could start. We stay dry, we stay effective. None of us likes wearing these damn ponchos. The thickness of the material keeps you dry, but I swear it's 20 degrees hotter when you're under them. Pete and I set the claymore about five yards to our front. The angle will set the back blast into the rice paddy and the pellets into the enemy. This is the perfect place to set up an ambush. We have a full view of the fields to our front and protection to our rear. The twilight is fading and darkness will soon surround us. I'm in contact with our compound. Echo 2, this is Papa. Over. Go ahead, Papa. Hear you loud and clear. Over. We're set. Now we wait. Over. Palmer looks over the top of the grass and signals me to cut it short. He whispers, We're going silent, Echo 2. You keep someone monitoring this radio all night. Over. Roger, Papa. You guys stay safe. Echo 2 out. I turn down the radio volume so only I can hear it. Clouds cover the sky, blocking any possible moonlight. Before total darkness can take over, Pete and I set up our watch. It will begin at twenty hundred hours. We'll be two on and two off. The night drags on and the rain begins. I'm glad Palmer had us put on these ponchos. In the distance, I see flashes of artillery fire light up the sky. Someone must be in contact. I poke Pete and point. He looks and then puts a thumb up. I have first watch. My first two watches have passed without incident. It's my third that brings danger. Shortly after the rain stops, the sky clears and the moon casts its light on the fields in front of me. I check the time. It's 0500. 
The sun will be up soon, so the likelihood of the enemy approaching is doubtful. I'm tired. It's hard to stay awake. I look over at Pete, who's sleeping, and wish it was me. My eyes keep closing. I shake my head from side to side, attempting to keep them open. I'm in the middle of a big yawn when I see something moving through the rice paddy toward our position. Then the sound of slow, sloshing water catches my attention. When I hear a Vietnamese whisper, I know it's coming. My eyes open wide when I see a group of three men carrying weapons and wearing VC bamboo hats. On their present course, they'll move right into our kill zone. I poke Pete awake and whisper, We got company. Three VC in the rice paddy. They're coming right at us. He sits up, rubbing the sleep from his eyes, and peers down the paddy. He puts up two fingers, signaling a second group. He motions for me to take them out. I look twenty yards past the three and see what he sees. Another six to eight VC are moving slowly through the water. I give him a thumbs up and we get ready. We can't notify anyone else in our squad. The enemy is too close and may see us moving around. The last time in this situation I was nervous. My hands sweated and my mouth dried up. This time, neither is happening. As the enemy approaches, my adrenaline kicks in. I feel a readiness for contact as I wait for our Claymore mine to explode. The enemy is close. I hope Ed and Joe see them. I'm jittery when the lead VC only feet away turns toward our grassy area. Blow the Claymore, Pete. Blow it now! I jump as the claymore explodes. I regain composure and start pulling the trigger as fast as I can on the second group. I hit two of the VC and watch them fall. My magazine runs dry and the bolt locks to the rear. By the time I reload, the whole squad is up and shooting. Pete has changed his direction of fire to the second group, and now Hammond and Bruce are firing on them as well. The adrenaline has me feeling invincible. Like in my last firefight, I'm excited. Killing the enemy has given me a sense of power I have felt only once before, the last time I took a life. Palmer yells, Cease fire! Cease fire! We all stop, and the quiet returns. I start to move out to check the enemy, but the sergeant stops me. Stay where you are. There could be more out there. We wait for daylight. I remember the radio and pick up the handset to hear... Papa, 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 this is Echo 2. We heard gunfire. What's going on? This is Papa. We've made contact. Pete shoves me and points toward Palmer, who's pissed. The sergeant runs a finger across his throat, demanding silence. I put down the handset. Guess we wait for daylight. As the sun begins to rise in the east, the paddies turn bright, and I can see there are no enemies. Palmer orders, Check the bodies. I walk out of my concealed area and count only nine VC, but only four were carrying weapons, the first three and one in the second group. Five of the enemy were carrying supplies, most of which is ammunition. Search them all, shouts Palmer. Take everything with us. What we can't carry, we blow in place. There's way too much and I realize how this enemy I'm fighting is so determined to complete a mission of victory he carries more than what we can, or what we're willing to. Pete walks up next to me. With all the fire brought down on those VC, I'm surprised we didn't hit some of that ammo and set it off. I look at him and smile. Come on, me, you, and Joe have got to inventory what we're leaving behind. We make a record of what is left behind. Palmer has us pile it high. We use white phosphorus grenades to ignite it. Before the phosphorus grenades can explode, we run away as fast and as far as possible. At a safe distance, the fire from the grenades sets off secondary explosions. The enemy munitions go up in flames. We watch as their rounds start cooking off. It's a great fireworks display. When it's over, Palmer has Bruce and me check the pile. We have to be sure we leave nothing behind. Once we're back at the compound, Palmer and Pete contact Captain Jocelyn to give him a sit rep. The rest of us pile the gook ammo we brought back into our ammunition shed. When we finish, we head to the showers and then hit the rack. 
Lying there, my eyes closed, I hear Joe say, What the hell is going on? It's always been quiet around here. Now, in less than two months, we've had two contacts and a prisoner catch. I don't like this shit, guys. Something's coming, I tell ya. Something's coming. Yeah, Doc adds. What say you, Sarge? Are we in jeopardy of attack? Can we trust the PF? All of you listen up. We're Marines. That means you too, Doc. Whatever's coming, we will handle. As far as the PF, we keep them in front of us, just like always. A short pause. Who's in the tower, Pete? Murph and Hammond. Bruce and Burge are covering the rear bunker. Radio? That would be me, Don. I'll wake you at 0200. You're my relief. Copy that, Pete. As I close my eyes, I think about Joe and what he said. I get the feeling we're all thinking the same way. I know I am. I start to wonder about my desire to see action. Our encounters so far with the enemy have been exciting, but no one from the squad has been hurt. I wonder about that day. If someone I know is wounded or killed, how I'll feel then. Chapter 28 War is Everywhere January 21st, 1968. Tet minus ten days. I woke up this morning to a ruckus outside the hooch. I check the time. It's 0200. I get up and find Palmer, Pete, and Hammond around the radio. Hey, man, what's up? Hammond answers, You remember that combat base up north of here, Kaysan? The one having all that gook activity? Yeah, I guess. They're taking artillery and mortar fire. You're picking that up on our frequency? No, man, the bullshit net. One of the operators on Hill 881 can see Kaysan. He's broadcasting live what's going on there. People are picking it up and relaying it all over Nam. It started a couple of hours ago. I was listening to the usual crap on Battalion's comm and picked up communications from someone else. They were talking to Division, reported Hill 861 was being overrun. I went and found the bullshit net, and an hour later, I heard the Marines on 861 repelled the enemy attack. It also said they were hand-to-hand. -hand. That's when I decided to wake up Palmer and Pete. Where is Hill 861? I ask. Overlooking Quezon. Pay attention, Talbot. Both Hills 881 and 861. Palmer explains, I needed to know what was happening. I sent a message to HQ and asked if the combat around 861 had anything to do with us. They came back saying there was no report of anything happening on the hill I mentioned. That's bullshit, Hammond protests. Palmer continues, With nothing about Quezon or Hill 861 on our comm, we moved to frequency 75.95 and found the bullshit net again. Pete adds, We wanted to hear more of what Hammond heard. The voice on the radio says, The devil dogs on 861 kicked those motherfucking gooks off their hill. Another voice adds, I heard hand to hand. Hey, you Army or Marine Corps? Who are you talking to? Another asks. The guy who said devil dogs kicked the gooks off their hill. That was me, man. I'm Army. Artillery. You Marine Corps? Yeah, green machine all the way. What's your unit? Pete grabs the handset and barks out an order. We don't give out that information over this net. Everyone keeps their names and unit information private. Good call, Pete, Palmer tells him. You some kind of officer? Someone asks over the radio. Before Pete can respond, another voice. That guy's right. We can talk clear here, but remember, gooks could be on this net too. Keep that info in-house. Hammond adds. Those guys on 861 are being overrun, hand-to-hand -hand combat. They're hardcore, man. Hardcore. Fucking a devil dogs. Hoorah, Pete mutters. Another voice from the radio breaks in. Hill 881 is getting hit. They've gone silent. Palmer takes the handset. Getting hit how? What about Quezon? There is only radio silence until we hear... Hill 881 is getting hit with RPGs, and NVA are in their wire. 
Did you get that from 881? Palmer asks. Negative, from a relay. Hill 881 went quiet. I picked that up from some guy around Hui City. That's all I know. Someone answers. Last I heard, 881 was taking RPGs and mortar fire. Like that guy said, they went quiet. Hammond asks, What the hell, is this shit real? Yeah, it's real, answers Pete. Think we need to worry, Ed? Palmer stares at Pete for a moment, then gets back on the radio. Anyone heard anything new on Quezon? Someone answers, Last I heard, the mortar fire had stopped. The sergeant explains, Quezon is up near the DMZ, like a hundred miles from here. I don't think there's anything for us to worry about. Hammond, put the radio back on our frequencies and check in with HQ. Hammond does as he's told, and the rest of us head back to our hooch. Before Palmer leaves, he calls up to the tower. Keep your eyes open, Joe. The next few days has Vietnam erupting all along the DMZ, but that is north of us by quite a distance, so the squad isn't too worried. But knowing that two days ago Echo 4 made contact with a small unit of VC has us wondering what is coming. Chapter 29 January 31st, 1968 Tet, the Vietnamese New Year A new FNG showed up yesterday. He's a replacement for Hammond, who's rotating home on the 10th of February. I overheard Palmer tell Hammond to start packing his shit. The new guy's name is Paul Horse something. He's a little guy, smaller than me. I noticed the shield with the eagle over the U.S. and South Vietnam flags. It's attached to the button on his breast pocket, the same way mine was the day I got here. I shake my head and smile. Doc is showing him around the same as he did me. Inside the hooch, I sit on my rack and open a can of beef stew for dinner. A can of crackers and peanut butter sit next to me. I chow down. I'm still eating when Palmer walks up. You got radio tonight, twenty hundred to zero two. I nod in response. Radio watch isn't like duty in the tower. I sit outside our hooch and listen for anything that might relate to Echo 2. It's rare when anything does. Palmer ended the dozing off, so I'm sitting here waiting for any news from Battalion. I check into the bullshit net a couple of times. There are reports of guys talking about some recon team in a night firefight and Spooky laying down cover fire. I would love to see that plane in action. I heard it shoots so many bullets it can cover every square inch of a football field in seconds. But again, nothing that should concern us comes on the radio. It's 2 a.m. and my relief hasn't arrived yet. While I wait, my mind drifts to the new guy, Paul. He's straight from the world and knows nothing. He did train here in Nam, same place I did. He and Hammond get along. They're both from Texas. Like any other FNG, he pulls tower duty. Burge is up there, too, showing him what we do. I remember my first night in the tower. I couldn't even climb up the damn ladder. I shout aloud, Shit, what the fuck is that? Explosions come from Da Nang. That's not normal artillery fire. Burge is yelling from the tower, Rockets and something else. Hey, Don, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. What's that something else? I don't know. Could be recoilless rifles. He uses the binoculars and yells back, Yeah, that's what they are. Call it in. How far? I need to tell them how far away. A click. No more. Ed, Pete, and the entire team, awakened from all the explosions, rush outside the hooch. What the hell is going on, Don? asks Sergeant Palmer. Da Nang is getting hit. Burge says he sees rockets and what looks like 57 or 75 millimeter recoilless rifles firing on Da Nang. Ed steps closer to the tower, looks up and shouts, Can you see those rockets, Burge? Yeah. How far from our position? Best guess. What is their direction? A click, no more. West of here. They're close. The explosions illuminate the sky to the south and east like a strobe light. Over the radio, we hear units around Da Nang asking for support. Some are calling for airstrikes. Other units around Hoi An and Tam Ki are reporting enemy ground attacks. What's going on? asks Joe, who arrives late. Where were you? I ask. 
making a head call. What's going on? Anxious, I answer, it's all over Vietnam. What's all over Nam? Attacks, gooks attacking everywhere. Our conversation is interrupted when Pete asks, What do you think, Ed? Quang Tri, Hue City, Chu Lai, Hoi An, Tam Ki, yeah, everywhere. He looks down, pauses, then returns to Pete. Hoi An is close. From Da Nang, we hear an explosion so loud it causes us to exchange worried glances. What was that? I ask. You think some VC got through the wire, Ed? Pete asks. Could those be secondary explosions? Palmer turns to me. Get hold of Romeo 6 Alpha, Captain Jocelyn. Tell him we have eyes on the launch site of those rockets firing on Da Nang. I do what Palmer tells me. Romeo 6 Alpha, this is Echo 2, over. With the radio on speaker, everyone hears the captain's reply. Echo 2, this is Romeo. We're getting hit. Sappers lit up Bravo Company's combat operations in the airfield. I have no information on anything in your area, but stay frosty, Marines. Keep monitoring the radio, but keep traffic to emergency use only. If something comes your way, call. I'll try to get you help. Romeo 6 Alpha out. He didn't give me a chance to say anything, Sarge. Yeah, I heard. Should I call him back? He said to stay off the radio unless it's an emergency, Pete adds. Artillery landing off to our right causes secondary explosions in the jungle. This has Ed shouting up to the tower. Hey, Burge! Yeah! Burge shouts down, looking through binoculars. You should see this! Was that our Artie hitting those rocket sites? He leans over the side. Must have been. We got him! Behind us, the sky above Da Nang shines with white light from the blasts. To the south, Hoi An, only a few miles away, is getting hit hard. What the hell is happening? asks Bruce. Palmer says, Y'all listen up. The gooks are attacking everywhere around us. Da Nang is under attack and is still taking fire. As of now, we are not. Let's keep our shit together. To start, I don't trust the popular force. We keep them in front of us. He pauses for a moment. I can tell his thoughts are working at high speed. He lets out a sigh and calms himself. Right now, we're still okay. As long as we stay alert, we'll stay okay. Pete, at first light, I want you to walk the perimeter. Check the wire and claymores. Joe, you and Don check the rear bunker. Make an ammo inventory. Copy that. Tomorrow, we'll get this place ready. For now, I want two-man teams spread out along the wall until sunup. Doc, you and I will do inventory. We need anything, we put in a resupply request ASAP. Doc tries to tell Ed what resupply may be like now with all the attacks. If this is some VC offensive, I doubt a simple supply run is going to happen. Palmer stares at him for a moment and then looks away. I want one radio in the tower starting immediately. Don, get it up there. After another pause, he says, Leave the other radio here. We need to monitor it 24 hours a day. Anybody want to add anything? Hey, Ed, do I have to stay up there? I ask. Yeah. He looks at his watch. It's 0330. The three of you can keep a constant lookout over the whole compound. There's a full moon tonight, so you should be able to see a long way. How long do we stand 24-hour watch on the radio? Asks Bruce. Palmer turns up the volume and we all hear, We got gooks in the wire! For as long as we hear that. Chapter 30. The War Turns South. February 1st, 1968. Tet plus two. At 0730, daylight arrives. The compound is quiet. From up in the tower, I look down. Along the wall are the two-man teams sitting on the deck. A couple of guys are dozing. Beyond the wall, I see the popular force still in their fighting holes. Palmer yells, all clear. Pack it in, people. Pete, check the wire. Talbot, you and Joe get to the back bunker. Paul, take over tower duty. The rest of you get something to eat and crash. I need one volunteer to relieve Paul in the tower around noon. I'll do it, answers Doc. Copy that. I climb down the ladder and meet Joe on the ground. Burge is right behind me. How was it up there, Don? Like always, there's nothing out there. At least, not now. Come on, let's get this shit done. I need to eat. What I wouldn't do for bacon and eggs. 
Hey, Burge, you heading for some chow? Yeah, as soon as I grab a sea ration box for the new guy. Copy that. I watch Burge walk off. Joe and I head for the back bunker. Inside, we find a sealed wooden case marked 556 cartridges and break it open. There are two cans inside. Each contains bandoliers. How many per bandolier do you think, Don? Ah, uh, let's see. Ten rounds per clip, two clips per slip, ten slips per bandolier. That's, uh, two hundred, right? And five bandoliers make a thousand rounds per can. Two cans per box, that's two thousand rounds. We have four boxes. Shit. That makes 8,556 rounds. Yeah, I guess. Why do you think the dinks don't take this shit? First off, those weapons they use, it's the wrong millimeter. Second, Palmer would hang them by their balls, I say, laughing. Let's get back and report what's here. I don't see anything else, do you? Ha! Huh. You think we need to bring any back with us? You grab one box and I'll grab another. Let's go. Joe and I make our way back to Doc's quarters where we leave the ammunition. At our hooch, we find the guys chowing down. I walk up to Palmer, who is sitting on his rack and eating. Hey, Sarge, there are four full boxes. We have 8,000 rounds. Is that enough? No, Don, that's not enough. Grab chow and then go back. Pick up two boxes and put them in Doc's hooch. We're short there. Copy that. As I walk away, Sarge asks, Hey, Don, one more time. How many rounds are in that bunker? Two boxes, 4,000 rounds. He thinks for a moment and asks, Didn't you first say 8,000? I did. But Joe and I figured you'd want some of that brought forward. We already put two boxes in Doc's hooch. Palmer smiles and says, Get something to eat. Chapter 31 More of the Same February 3rd, 1968. Tet plus four. We've been on patrol every day since January 30th. We've made contact or had sightings of VC almost every day. Today is no different. This morning, no more than a hundred yards out, gooks walked up on us. We could see them in the rice paddies. I'm wondering, why can't they see us? Whether they do or not, I don't know or care. As soon as they're close enough, we open fire. Even though these firefights have become routine, we haven't taken any casualties. It's almost dark when we get back. Before we pile into the hooch, Palmer shouts, Listen up, y'all. Everyone take the next hour and clean your weapons. When finished, give your rifle to a buddy and he'll inspect it. Then you'll inspect his. So team up and get it done. Some guys nod, but most stay silent and still. We all know the importance these days of having a weapon you can depend on. Cleaning mine after every patrol is just something I do. I've been with Echo 2 for seven months, and we were never told to clean our weapons until now. Out here, you learn pretty quick what happens if you get careless and let your weapon go. A jammed rifle in the middle of a firefight is a death sentence, not just for yourself, but your buddy standing next to you. These sightings and firefights on every damn patrol have me wondering what the hell is out there. I begin to break down my weapon. As Palmer walks by, I look up. Say, Ed, why do you think you need to tell us to clean our rifles? Does it matter why, Don? I'm compound commander and I give the orders. Okay, Sarge. But what's going on? A month ago we never saw a VC. Now we can't go on a single patrol without running into them. It's like every patrol. Yes, yeah, Sarge, why now? asks Burge. Outside, we hear outgoing artillery fire. It's coming from Da Nang. Those shells are landing across the river north of Lojang. Palmer sits next to me and lets out a long sigh. You both know. Then he raises his voice so the whole squad can hear. Listen up. I don't know what's coming our way, but we need to be ready for whatever it is. A month ago, we'd go on patrol and it'd be like a stroll in the park. Now we can't go 500 yards without making contact. He looks around. Make sure you're ready if things go south. Despite what's going on around us, the squad seems relaxed. When Palmer warned me about things going south, he meant big trouble was coming. I have no fears. If anything comes our way, 
We'll handle it. February 5th, 1968. Tet plus six. Palmer said we'll have a night listening post tonight at the river's bank. I heard that before, but usually that still means a patrol. It's 0700 and I'm eating breakfast when I hear Paul in the tower screaming at the top of his lungs, Gooks! Gooks! Those inside the hooch exchange worried glances, then grab their gear and head outside. What I see astonishes me. There are hundreds of VC or NVA coming from the river. On the river itself, I see small sampans with enemy troops on board heading for our shoreline. We head for our assigned positions along the wall. At the front gate, three PF soldiers are trying to get in. Palmer yells, They could be VC! Don't let them in! I'm thinking if they were VC, they'd be shooting at us. Pete tells Palmer, I recognize them. They're from the village. Let them in. We need the help. Palmer tells us to open the gate. With a small contingency of popular force, we prepare to defend our compound. You guys see what I see? yells Burge. Those are civilians. The VC are forcing those villagers to walk in front of them. What the hell do we do, Sarge? Before Palmer can decide, the popular force rush into their fighting holes and open fire on the enemy. Palmer yells, Do your best not to hit the innocent. Open fire! There are too many. The enemy is firing. Rounds are popping all around the compound. Doc has been on the radio requesting air support since the attack started. Above us, a two-engine aircraft starts his attack run, firing miniguns and rockets into the VC. From the sky, there is no separation of innocent and enemy. The villagers are trying to run away. A small girl desperately tries to keep up with her parents, but falls. I witness her father turning back, but dropping dead before he can get to her. Devastated by our air support, the gooks break off their attack. Behind them, they leave a field of death. The battle over, there is only a silence as still as death. We hear a baby's cry in the field and see the dead mother still holding the child tight. The blood from the slaughter stains the ground. So much. So much. Doc breaks rank. With his medical bag in hand, he heads for the gate to help those still alive. Palmer yells at him, Stop, Doc! That's an order! With a look of sorrow, he says to the sergeant, Some of those people are still alive, Ed. Let me help them. I'm sorry, Doc, but there could still be VC lying in wait for someone like you. You go out there, it could be you going home in a body bag. Gunfire from the field has us looking. Outside the wire, the PF is walking among the fallen and firing their rifles into those lying on the ground. Will you look at that? Murph declares. If there are any civilians still alive, those PF guys are wasting them. Suddenly, a Vietnamese who is lying among the dead stands and runs for the river. A hail of bullets from the popular force brings him down. At sundown, several people from Dogpatch go out to the peninsula and search the bodies of the dead. They lay a dozen corpses at our front gate. Palmer and Pete go out and tell them to stop. When they return, Pete tells us, Those are their relatives from Lo Jang. The NVA forced them to come across the river. Why are they bringing them to us? I ask. To be buried. Sarge told them to do their burying out there where they fell. I watch the villagers of Dogpatch bury the dead late into the night. I turn in knowing tomorrow there will be more bodies to bury. Lying on my rack, I stare up at the ceiling. We were tested today, and we passed. We held our position. Pete walks up and tells me, Hey, Don, let's get a smoke. This is weird. Why is Pete taking me outside for a smoke? Pete is my best friend in the squad, so of course I go with him. I grab my lucky strikes and lighter and head out of the hooch. Pete already has a smoke lit. I shake a cigarette loose and pull it out with my lips. Pete puts his lighter to it. So what's up? You want to talk? Did I do something wrong? No, you were fine today. But yeah, I want to talk. When you were guarding Da Nang, did you ever see anything like what happened today? I stop cold. His eyes are filled with questions, ones I can't answer. Hell no. I mean, the most we got were sappers, never anything like this. Still tense, he asks, How could people be like that, Don? 
I crunch my lips and slowly shake my head. They want to win. I think they figured with the villagers in front of them we wouldn't call in support. Pete stares a long time with his eyes down. Then he lifts them. They're animals. The VC, the NVA, they're all animals. And they all deserve to die. It's Palmer who's walked out of the hooch and is joining us. He lights a smoke. When I was with the grunts, my platoon got orders to clear this village. We detected a lot of VC activity centered around there. We went in and the village chief helped us. He gave us locations and names. A couple days later, we were sent back because there was smoke coming from that location. When we got there, the chief was laid spread eagle and burnt to death. Shocked, I say, Shit, what the fuck? They are animals. That's not all. His whole family was dead. His daughter was raped repeatedly. His wife gutted and... Palmer pauses and his lower lip quivers. They cut the head off of his grandson, a boy only three years old. Human life means nothing to them. Chapter 32 Saying Goodbye February 7th, 1968 Tet Plus 8 We got another FNG today. His name's Bob. He's a tall marine built like a linebacker. He's from California. His hair is bushy and blonde, but still regulation. Things are quieter today. We've heard only sporadic artillery and no small arms fire. Hammond is leaving in three days, and Palmer says tonight we will have a going-away party. Doc and Pete build a small fire behind the wall. With the last of our beer, the whole squad gathers around to drink and reminisce. We're all there except for Bob and Paul. They're on guard duty in the tower. The PF has the back bunker. Hey, Hammond, what's the first thing you're going to do when you get back to the world? Asks Burge. A smile stays on Hammond's face as he looks down at the fire. Y'all know Susie Rottencrotch? The whole squad bursts into hysterical laughter. Oh, no, not her! <laughs> Please tell me it ain't true! yells Joe as he falls over laughing. Hammond sees this and laughs, blowing a mouthful of beer out his mouth and nose. After pausing, his laughter fades to a smile. Maybe I'll go hunting with Mickey. Mickey? Who the hell is Mickey? Joe shouts. Mickey's his hunting dog, Doc says, laughing again. The whole squad stares at Hammond. Yeah, Mickey's my hunting dog. Being nosy, I ask him, You're going home, man. Anyone special waiting for you? He smiles but does not answer, so Doc says, Tell him, Dennis. You're leaving in three days. It won't hurt to tell him now. I'm stunned and can't believe that after all this time, I learn Hammond's first name is Dennis. I watch as he looks at Doc and then answers with a bit of shyness. Yeah, Don, there's someone special. Doc again interjects. Hammond has a special lady. The whole team is silent. Apparently only Doc knew about Hammond's love life. Finally, Joe breaks the silence. What's her name? Betty. Everyone is quiet as Hammond begins to talk about the girl waiting back home. She's been great. This is surprising news, and our questions are rapid fire. Where'd you meet her? What'd she look like? When did you meet her? Hammond's smile grows as he begins answering. I was home on leave. Me and a couple of high school buds were at this fair that came to town. We don't usually get any traveling carnivals in Mansfield, Texas, but we did a couple of years ago. It was July 4th, 1966. I still had over two years left on my contract with the Corps, and just being back from Nam, I was looking for some fun. I had already volunteered to do a second tour over here when I met her. I was looking for the roller coaster at the far end of the carnival when I spotted the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. Hammond's eyes grow bright. She was waiting in line to ride the Ferris wheel with her friend. When they noticed me staring, they both giggled. I couldn't stop looking at her. 
He stops and Bruce eggs him on. Hey man, keep going. Tell us, what does she look like? Hammond smiles. She had on a white dress, a couple of inches above her knees, brown shoes and checkered knee-high stockings. Burge butts in. Sounds sexy. I love a girl in knee-high stockings. I'll bet. Palmer pushes Burge off his seat to stop his apparent ignorance. Then, in a soft voice, Palmer says, Go on, Dennis. Hammond looks at Palmer and continues, Her eyes are so blue they'd put a clear sunny sky to shame, and the most beautiful blonde hair you'd ever seen. She had it pulled back in a ponytail with a pink ribbon, and a flower in her hair. Wow, you know what I mean? Hammond stops talking, but no one makes a sound, waiting for him to continue. That first night I felt she was the one. So when I get home, I'm going to ask her to marry me. Wow. You got any pictures? I ask. Yeah, but they're just for me. Hey, Don, interrupts Pete. You got any naked pictures of your girl? I'll sell you some. Everybody roars with laughter except Bruce. He got his Dear John letter not that long ago. Noticing him, Palmer asks, Hey, Bruce, what did that bitch back home write you anyway? Uh, you know. He tries to smile. She said she couldn't handle me. I was too much for her. All he can do is chuckle and pause. But, you know, it's just a thing. You know, ain't nothing but a thing. Everyone chimes in. Fucking A, man, she's not worth it. But Burge pushes Bruce. Come on, John, what was in that letter? Bruce looks up, a forced smile on his face. She started college last September. I knew that was her plan. He hesitates. Some of the people at her school are against the war. She says they urged her to break up with me. I see a tear in his eye. I love her, you know. I really do. His head drops for a moment. He looks back up with a real smile. Ain't nothing but a thing, he adds. Damn straight, I say. Nothing but a thing. To change the subject, Pete asks the squad, How do you guys get into this green machine? One by one, the guys tell their short stories of why they joined the Marine Corps. Most say they watched too many John Wayne movies, but I surprise them when Pete asks, How about you, Don? Why'd you join? Chuckling, I say, Man, I had no thoughts of joining the Marine Corps. After high school, there was no college in my future. I knew the draft was right around the corner, so one day my best friend Kenny tells me how his older brother, who's in the Navy, said there's this great plan. If you join the Navy after high school, you only have to do two years. Yeah, I heard about that plan, says Joe. It's called the I Seen Them Coming plan. He laughs. I chuckle and continue. So we go down to the recruiter, and the squid sitting behind his desk in his whites tells us we got it wrong. Like I said, adds Joe. He tells Kenny he can join for two years because he is 17. But since I'm already 18, I would have to join for four years. I tell him where he can take his four years. On my way out, the Marine Corps recruiter calls me over. He's wearing his dress blues and says, I can give you two years. Oh, fuck no, the two-year plan. <laughs> that must have been right after I joined, says Burge, laughing. Well, it was only two years, so I said yes, and here I am. The talk around the fire continues with stories of home. Some are funny and some are sad, but we're like a family sharing. Looking around, I realize this is my family. I have never felt as close to a group of guys as I do to Echo 2. Even my brothers and sister back home, oh, I love them. But these guys, these guys I die for. Chapter 33 The Ambush February 8th, 1968. A day of reckoning. Everybody up, yells Pete. Echo 4's getting hit. 
I'm out of my rack, dressed and outside in minutes, my rifle in hand. I check my watch, and it's 0352. Across the river, we hear explosions. Palmer is talking on the radio. What's going on? I ask. Palmer answers, Those are RPGs and mortars. It sounds like Echo 4's in a world of shit. Fuck me, anything on the radio? Negative. But if that's Echo 4, we'll know soon enough. The whole squad is out and listening. Burge asks Palmer, If Echo 4 is in trouble, what are we going to do about it? All right, I know it's early, but let's gear up the same as you would for a patrol. Take extra ammo and frags. Murph, you grab the M79. Take HE and smoke. Bring some buckshot, too. Palmer orders. Murphy gives a thumbs up. I take two fragmentation grenades and two Willy Peets. I add three bandoliers loaded with ten full metal jackets each. This doubles my regular count of 24 magazines. Now I'm set. Outside Doc's hooch, I walk over to Bruce and drop my web gear. One by one, each Marine does the same. Most guys take a seat. Some stand smoking cigarettes. We all wait for Captain Jocelyn or anyone from headquarters to tell us what's going on. As the sun begins to rise, some of the guys grab sea rations and start chowing down. A chocolate bar and a cup of sea ration coffee are good to go for me. It's close to 0800 when I hear a five-ton heading our way. Check it out, it's tiny, shouts Joe. Yeah, and he's got marines in the bed of his truck, Burge adds. The truck pulls up to our gate and stops. The whole squad rushes over, and there in the passenger seat sits Captain Jocelyn. Tiny gets out while the captain talks on his radio. Hey, you guys, yells Tiny. Echo 4 is in some real shit. They're getting hammered and need help. Who wants to volunteer? I got seven from Echo 3 and four from their PFs. Captain Jocelyn steps out of the truck to give us more details of what's going on. Listen up. At 0345, Echo 4 began taking RPG and mortar fire. They reported their hooch took a direct hit. Lucky for them, it was empty. Major Burks has ordered me to assemble a reactionary force and try to get to them. He pauses for several seconds. This is a voluntary mission. How many can I count on from Echo 2? Every one of us steps up, including Hammond. Tiny and Hammond are best of friends. As soon as Tiny sees Hammond as one of the volunteers, he yells, What the fuck are you doing, Hammond? You're short! I interrupt. Yeah, he's short, all right. Supposed to be back in Da Nang in two days, and scheduled to fly out on the Freedom Bird the 15th. He shouldn't be coming with us, Tiny. Hammond answers, I've done two tours in Nam and never did anything important. This is important. If it was me out there, well, I'm going. I've got a chance to be part of something good in this godforsaken place. He looks at Echo 2. I'm coming with you. Palmer orders Paul and Bob to stay behind. Paul, I want you on radio, and Bob, you're in the tower. Pete, round up a few popular force troops, ones we can trust and speaks English. Who's carrying the radio? asks Pete. Then, taking charge, he says, You grab it, Joe. As we climb on board Tiny's six-by, I'm not afraid. I shout out, laughing, When we get to Echo 4, we'll all be heroes! Everyone is in high spirits. There's laughing and joking. With 25 people on board, we're packed in asshole to belly button. Some of the guys complain about it. I ask Pete, You know guys with Echo 4, don't you? Yeah, I know Sergeant Cossey. He's compound commander, right? Yeah, one of the best. I smile and ask, What do you think he'll say when we show up? I don't know. Knowing him, he'll say, What took you so long? Looking around, I don't see anyone is worried. I know for me, heading out to reinforce and save another Echo Platoon is about the coolest thing I could be part of. I understand exactly how Hammond feels. Joe leans across the truck's bed and asks me, You worried, Don? About what? Hell, man. We don't know how many gooks are out there, do we? How many can there be? It's probably only a few NVA with RPGs. Look, we've been in contact on every patrol since Tet started, and we haven't had a guy even wounded. Relax, man. Have you noticed the Vietnamese all huddled together at the rear of the truck? They're not laughing. They look worried. I look over and see what he sees. My smile fades.
He continues, They're nervous and tense and seem afraid, almost terrified. What do they know and we don't? Joe sits back in his seat and I nudge Pete, who is sitting next to me. Hey, man, I say, pointing at the popular force troops. They're awful quiet. Pete stares hard at them and says, We keep them in our front. First chance they get, they'll bug out. Thinking about what Pete said and wondering what it might mean, I hear Hammond yell, There's the bridge! As we cross the river on the Cam Lee Bridge, I look above at the Marines in the towers, who seem weary. There are blast holes in the pylons on the other side of the bridge as we drive past. These Marines have been in contact for a while. At least they saved the bridge. Pete, check that out, man. Those guys have seen some shit. Pete nods as his smile fades. The truck comes to a stop about a hundred meters on the other side of the river. Captain Jocelyn climbs out. Let's go, people. We hump from here. We all dismount. The captain orders Tiny, You're not coming. Stay on the radio. We may need you to relay. Tiny complains. He wants to come with us, but obeys the captain's order. We get online, Jocelyn orders. Sergeant Palmer, you're right. I'm left. Put your PF on your flank and I'll do the same with mine. Humping through the rice fields, I look around and remember, Hey, Joe, isn't this near our first firefight? He looks around too and then nods. It's not long before we pass through the same graveyard and come to a pagoda. I don't remember seeing this Buddha temple before. Captain calls for a break. No one orders any defensive positions, and that's good. It tells me we're not worried. We're all talking with one another when I notice the PFs are gone. Hey, Captain, I say. He turns to me. The villagers are gone. The PFs, they're Didi Mao. The captain looks around. They probably figure this isn't their fight so far from their villages. Murphy gets up from where he sits and steps closer to me. He bends over and half whispers, Or maybe they think we're Buku Dinky Dao. Crazy. The captain calls out, On your feet! We want to get there before dark. Once again, we're online, but this time there are only 17 Marines. Our force was cut in half. It's not long before we come to a ditch running along the trees along Lojang. Captain Jocelyn stops us. I take a knee to catch my breath. This hump with all the extra ammo I'm carrying takes its toll. The captain motions Palmer over. What they're discussing, Palmer doesn't seem to like. Ed walks away and gets us together. Listen up. There's another drainage ditch up ahead. Captain wants us to make our way there. He says once they've moved into the trees, then we go in. We'll be on his right flank. We'll continue through the trees to the village and then the compound, coming up behind the NVA. Pete says, It didn't look like you agreed, Ed. What's the problem? We're only 17 now. That's a small reactionary force. He's splitting us up into two smaller groups, and that doesn't make sense. Captain Jocelyn took my radio, Ed. Joe complains. What the fuck? Yeah, I know. Left his with Tiny. He wants control of communications. When we move off, I look behind Hammond and Joe and see the captain leading his team online toward the trees. Isn't he supposed to wait for us to be ready before he moves? I mutter under my breath. I snap my head around as gunfire erupts to the west. Twenty-five yards away, Echo 3 has walked into an ambush. The gooks, hidden, waited until they were close to the trees. I spy one marine lying only a few feet from the enemy. The tree line lights up with muzzle flashes as the gooks fire both small arms and automatic weapons. We have to do something. When an RPG fired from deep in the bush explodes close to the team, I know they're in a world of shit. Hammond yells out, Echo 3 is in that ditch! I look and find two more marines lying in front of the ditch where Echo 3 has taken cover. Inside the trench, I spot Captain Jocelyn talking on the radio. I expect air or artillery to start dropping bombs, but nothing happens. The NVA and VC are in full assault on those Marines. Hammond yells orders. Don, you and Joe lay down cover fire. Joe and I take a knee along with Hammond. We start picking off gooks as they leave the protection of the trees to rush the squad. 
The enemy must think it's Echo 3 who's killing them and not us. I don't think they're aware we're here. I watch and fire at the NVA as they get closer and closer to Echo 3. Dozens more enemy leave the trees. There's too many. We can't stop them. Still firing, I watch the NVA reach the ditch and shoot whoever's left. Now I stare in disbelief. It's over. Echo 3 is gone. Joe, still shooting, yells, Keep firing, Don! Kill those motherfuckers! My body stunned by what I see, I look over at Joe as an explosion erupts behind me. Gunfire follows and I realize the enemy has figured out where we are. I look and see the rest of our squad in a ditch that looks a lot like the one where Echo 3 got slaughtered. Our squad mates are a few yards away and catching hell. A round zips past my head and the ground around me gets peppered by enemy weapons. I drop to the prone position and cover my head. Everything is happening so fast. I'm frozen until Hammond grabs the back of my flak jacket, pulling me to my feet and yelling, Get in the ditch! Move! Chapter 34 The Battle Continues I'm up and running for the ditch when another RPG hits close by, knocking me to the ground. I'm stunned. My hearing is gone. My mind is mush. I lie still, hoping the enemy fire will subside, but it doesn't. We're pinned down. We need to get to the ditch and rejoin the squad. Rounds keep hitting inches from my body. My hearing returns to the sound of bullets whizzing past my head. It's scaring the shit out of me. Again, it's Hammond grabbing and pulling me to my feet. Joe is ahead of us already, running for the ditch. Reaching it, we jump in. I drop several feet into a trench at least four feet wide. The squad is already engaging the enemy in the trees. Captain Jocelyn's plan is a bust. Echo 3 is gone and we're in a world of shit. Another RPG hits the upper lip of the ditch and Burge yells in pain. There's no time to see what's happened. Out front, ten yards away, a dozen or so NVA are standing in the open and firing on our position. I bring my rifle to bear and see one gook with an RPG launcher in his hands, ready to fire. I put my sights on him and pull the trigger. His weapon drops as he falls to the ground. Everyone is firing and the NVA start dropping. A few of them break for the forest, but we cut them down. I watch the last gook fall right at the edge of the tree line. I stare at their lifeless bodies and breathe a sigh of relief. They're all dead. I have no sympathy for them. Only deep anger. My thoughts are with the Marines of Echo 3. They were guys I knew, cut to pieces only feet from the tree line themselves. I smile. I'm glad I killed you bastards. I look out toward the trees, wondering where the enemy's main group is, the ones who ambushed our other team. They were a much larger force. To my surprise, a lone NVA soldier stands up from the carnage and aims his weapon at us. The whole squad opens fire. Our rounds tear his body apart until he falls backward into the blood-soaked rice paddy. For the moment, the fight is over. Doc yells for Ed. Burge needs a doctor or he ain't gonna make it. I can't stop his bleeding. I look to see that Burge is down and moaning in pain. Blood has soaked through the bandages Doc used trying to help him. Not asking for a volunteer, Sergeant Palmer says, Okay, I'll take him. Pete, keep them moving. What the fuck? No one challenges our squad leader as he helps Burge out of the trench. No one asks, Why are you the one taking Burge? I watch the two of them start crawling away, keeping the ditch between them and the enemy. Let's go, Pete, says Hammond. Get us moving. Pete takes his eyes off Palmer and says, We stay in the trench for cover. I can't help but wonder if Pete knows Captain Jocelyn and Echo 3 are gone, wiped out. I start to say something, but what difference would it make? We need to get to Echo 4. Pete leads us through the ditch as we keep our heads below the defilade. The trench is not straight, it keeps curving. A dozen yards later we stop. I move close to Bruce and Pete. In front of them is a tree in the ditch. No, not a tree, more like a pile of brush debris. Pete turns back. To get around, we need to go up and out. Let's do this. To me, the pile looks deliberate, like someone put it there to force us out of the ditch. Pete, not saying anything, climbs out of the trench. The whole squad starts to follow. Hammond and Joe are right behind me. 
Without warning, a shitload of AK-47s start firing all around us. We're fighting an enemy who are now only a few feet from the ditch. On my belly, I'm crawling as fast as I can, trying to get to the other side of the blockage. My weapons clutched in my hands, ready to fire. The enemy is so close now. They're everywhere around us. Out of nowhere, two enemy are suddenly standing next to me. They're trying to grab my weapon. I push the safety to fully automatic and pull the trigger. The bolt locks home, and the two gooks lie dead. Bullets are hitting all around me. Once I'm past the debris, I roll into the bunker and fall to the bottom of the ditch. I look up, and that's when I realize the gooks are in the trench and the trees. We're now fighting in two directions. Pete yells, Don, where's Joe and Hammond? I turn around, but they're gone. I don't know. They were right behind me. Fuck, this is bad. This is bad. Pete screams while shooting over the top of the ditch. Another RPG hits the trench, and Doc, who's right in front of me, grabs his neck. At this point, no one is in charge. There is only confusion. Each Marine is acting on his own training, to keep fighting, to never give up. Doc takes a knee as he tries to stop his own bleeding. I move past him next to Murphy to give myself a better aim at the enemy. Pete is to my right on the outside when, out of the corner of my eye, he grabs his throat. My weapon empty, I bring it down to load another magazine. There's Pete standing next to me, his eyes filled with terror. He gurgles in his own blood and gasps for air. Once. Twice. Then he drops. My weapon ready, I'm back up firing when I hear Murph say, Fuck me, I'm hit! I move toward him and stop dead in my tracks when I see a gook lying dead at the bottom of the ditch. As Murphy holds his stomach, he says in a weak voice, I got him, Don. That's a confirmed kill for me. He crumples to his knees and his eyes open wide. Don, I think they've killed me. His body goes limp and falls to the ground. Doc, holding a bandage to his wound, moves past me to Murphy and starts to give aid. I know he's dead. I saw it in his eyes. Bruce and I are the only ones fighting. Bruce yells, Forget him, Doc. He's gone. We need you. The corpsman is on his feet and firing at the enemy who are rushing our position. The three of us cut them down, but there are too many. Enemy rounds are hitting inside the trench as they get closer. I hear Bruce yell in pain as he crumples down and lies at my feet. Doc, Bruce is hit. I don't expect him to do anything. There's no time. Doc looks at me and says, Can you get to him? As I turn, a bullet strikes me. My right shoulder's hit. I can feel it burn, but my body reacts to the adrenaline. I look up and see the gook who shot me standing there fumbling with his weapon. I raise mine and fire. He goes down. Ah! I scream as something tears through my side and my back. I've never felt pain like this before. Shit, I'm hit again! The gook who shot me is on the other side of the debris behind Doc, who's still firing over the trench. I fire three quick rounds. The gook falls down. He's no longer a threat. From behind me comes the sound of an AK. I turn to face yet another NVA in the ditch. One of the rounds from his weapon strikes my left shoulder. The punch twists my body. I hear Doc yell, I'm hit! I block out the pain and fire on the gook. In three rounds, he's dead. I turn back and see Doc grabbing his back. He stumbles past me and falls at Pete's side. Doc takes the gauze from his hand and applies it to Pete's neck. There's another gook in the trench and he's pointing his AK right at me, but my weapon is empty. I'm trying to reload when Doc fires his 45 caliber pistol at the enemy, saving my life. Then Doc slumps over and stops moving. My weapon reloaded, I fire again at an enemy all around. A quick check of my friends and I realize everyone else is down. I'm all alone. The thought of surrender never enters my mind. I keep shooting. I remember something a DI from boot camp once said. The deadliest weapon in the world is a Marine and his rifle. I yell out, Hoorah! The firing stops and an eerie quiet settles in. I'm feeling weak. I know I'm bleeding from all the hits I've taken. I remember something that recon Marine told me to recall if I ever got into the shit. You know who you are. War is in your blood. Don't fight it. Killing is as easy as breathing when you're pushed. I yell out as best I can. That's right, motherfuckers. I'm still here. You want me? Come and get me. I ain't... What the... From behind the debris, another enemy is throwing something. I open fire, killing him. 
and then everything goes black. Chapter 35 Captured February 8, 1968 Evening of Ambush I open my eyes. Darkness is all around. I try to remember what happened. The firefight. VC everywhere. An explosion. Last thing I remember. That gook throwing a grenade. I killed the son of a bitch. The grenade went off right next to me. My hand. Tried to knock it away. Why am I not dead? How long have I been out? I gotta get out of here. What the fuck? Someone has a knee in my back. My hands. He's tying them behind me. I can't break free. I'm too weak. Ah, my hair. He's jerking my head up. Gotta be a VC. His face is in mine. For the first time since I've been in Nam, I'm really scared. I'm a prisoner of war. The gook smiles and starts to say something. His breath smells like rotten eggs. He continues to talk in Vietnamese, laughs, and then forces my head down, putting my face in the muddy ground. My mind races, and I wonder if anyone else from Echo 2 is still alive. I wonder if anyone will come to save me. The thought of spending time in a POW camp is too scary. Please, someone, save me! Get me out of this! Then I remember. No one is coming. Pete, Bruce, Murphy, everyone... One by one, I watched them die. I'm alone. It's difficult to lift my head, but I need to know what my situation is. An NVA soldier walks by, and I make eye contact. The red star on his helmet gives him away. He screams at me and kicks my side. The pain radiates from a bullet I took there. I cringe, but I don't let him know he hurt me. I won't give him the satisfaction. He walks away, and now I know for sure that the NVA and VC are here together. I hear them talking. They're close by. It sounds like they're all around me. I recognize a word or two of what they're saying, but it's not enough to make any sense. Minutes later, another VC comes up behind me and pulls my hair again. With my face yanked upward, he spits on me and mumbles something in Vietnamese. I gather enough strength to yell out, FUCK YOU, MOTHERFUCKER! I try to swear and call him more names, but nothing comes out. I must have pissed him off because he smashes the butt of his rifle into my back. The pain is excruciating, but again, I take it. After this guy walks away, I try to figure out my situation. My shoulders hurt. I look down and both are wet. It's too dark to see, but I know it must be blood. I remember being hit. My left hand is messed up. The grenade did this. I try to look at it, but all I see is skin peeled back and fingers twisted. I can't move them. The worst pain is in my side. It feels like a red-hot poker is jabbing through my hip. I was shot there. I killed that asshole, too. A quick check of my equipment finds my flak jacket was taken, and so were my canteen, ammo, and web gear. They even took my boots. Letting out a deep sigh, I raise my head as best I can to look around and realize I'm still in the trench. My eyes burn as sweat or blood start soaking into them. I blink several times until they're clear. A few feet away, I stare at Pete and Doc lying where they fell. Like me, they're stripped of everything. It's difficult to turn my head, but I manage to look the other way. Murphy is lying a few feet from me and beyond him is Bruce. It's the same with them. All their gear is gone. Charlie's back and he's inside the ditch with me. They're going to kill me or take me away to a prisoner of war camp unless... unless I'm already dead. Doc once said, When you die slow, if someone is with you, they'll experience you letting out a last breath and then nothing. You die. If I have any chance of coming out of this alive, it's for me to be dead. I need to fake my death. I don't know how much time passes, but it's been a while. I've kept still, hoping the gooks will notice I'm not moving anymore. Finally, another gook walks up. He lifts my head again by pulling my hair. This is my chance. I let out an exaggerated breath, then, trying to fool him, I hold that breath. He kicks me in my hip, 
my legs and my side. It hurts, but I take the pain and remain still. Then he drives the butt of his rifle into my back several times. The brunt of his thrust makes me want to scream, but I hold it inside. I don't make a sound. I don't move or even wiggle. He says something to the other Vietnamese and walks away. I don't know if it worked or not, but this is my only hope if I'm going to survive. Time has passed and I wake. I must have passed out. I hope I stayed still. I'm also afraid if one of them checked out my face, they now know I'm breathing and alive. I have to stay awake. The gooks are still close by. I hear them talking. I think I'm bleeding again. It feels like something warm is oozing out of my side. The pain is everywhere and getting worse. My heart feels like it's pounding in my chest. I don't think I'm going to make it through the night. I try to stay calm, thinking about my mom. She's going to cry when she hears I'm dead. Worse will be if I'm missing in action. I don't want to be an MIA. Not knowing if I'm dead, alive, or a prisoner, that would be harder on her than my dying. My dad will be okay. The news I'm dead will hurt him. But I know between him, my sister, and my brothers, they'll all help Mom get through it. Another gook is here. He's kicking me, trying to see if I'll move. He grabs my hand, pulling on my high school ring. It doesn't budge. He says something, and in his voice I hear frustration. He's still trying to steal my ring, and I worry that if it doesn't come off, he might decide to cut off my finger. He'll use his knife, and I won't be able to take that kind of pain. They'll know I'm alive, and they'll kill me. Finally, the ring is off. He lets go of my hand, and I allow it to flop to the ground. Time passes, and another gook starts kicking me. He, too, wants to know if I'm dead. When he walks away, I realize they're nowhere around the ditch, and they're not trying to be quiet. I hear them several feet away. They must feel confident no one's coming. I've kept my eyes shut for a long time now. I can't open them, even for a moment. If I do and a gook is looking, it would give my charade away. I keep my breath shallow. If they see me breathing, they'll know I'm alive. Every time one comes around, I hold my breath and hope they don't stay long. So far, I've been lucky. It's worked. I'm so tired. I want to sleep. But I know if I do, I could move. So I keep telling myself, Don't pass out. Stay awake. Keep your mind active. Think of home. My mind drifts to a time with my friends. Everyone I hung around with in high school. Kenny, my best friend. I should have joined the Navy with you, man. The pain from my wounds is getting worse. It hurts so bad I start to think, maybe it's better to give up. Open my eyes and let them see I'm alive. If they kill me, then I'm no longer hurting. I want my mother. In my mind, I scream, Mom! I wish I could see her one more time, feel her holding me like when I was a little boy. Hear her say, everything will be all right, Donnie. Tell her how much I love her. More time passes. I start thinking if the gooks never leave, then faking my death will be hopeless. I'll die out here alone. The next time they come to check on me, I could be dead. Hell, dying isn't so bad. Maybe I'm delirious, but if it comes to dying, I'm ready. Dying? Fuck no. Get real, Don. Don't you give up, Marine. I can hack it. I can hack it. I start to pass out again. Stay awake, Marine. You have to stay awake. Marilyn, my good friend, I haven't written to you in a while. Wonder what you're doing right now. Of all the girls back home, Marilyn has always been number one to me. Could she and I ever be... Nah, that won't happen. Our friendship is too special. I'm hit so many times I know I'm losing blood. How long before I bleed to death? In the distance, I hear a whistling noise getting louder and louder, telling me something's coming. Chapter 36 Escape The whistling stops with an explosion. It's so huge that the ground shakes like an earthquake. The bombs are detonating all around me. 
This is big stuff, not RPGs or 60 millimeter mortars. This has to be artillery. And it's ours. With every blast, I can feel dirt falling on and around me. I'm damn glad I'm in this ditch. I open my eyes just enough to see the feet of a NVA run past. Between the noise of each blast, I hear Charlie yelling and screaming. Then something heavy lands on my ass. I don't know what it is. Maybe a dead gook. The detonations seem like they'll never end. Then, as quickly as they started, they stop. The last thing I hear is the cracking and splitting of a tree as it falls to the ground. Then, nothing. No sound. Only an unnerving silence. I wonder, are they gone? I open my eyes. Still afraid to move, I listen for anything that might tell me the NVA are still here. But nothing. The enemy has fled. This is my only chance to get away. If I wait any longer, they'll return. My hands are still tied. I move them around, trying to break free. It takes only seconds for the poorly tied knots to come undone. I gather courage and roll over on my back. What was on my ass slides off. It's not a gook, but a large chunk of dirt. Looking up, I see smoke flowing past the top of the ditch. Beyond that stretches a sky filled with clouds. The moon's light can't penetrate the overcast. The darkness will aid my escape. I try to stand and walk, but fall. I try again, but the results are the same. Why can't I walk? That arty made the gooks scatter, but they'll be back. My only way out is on my belly. From the bottom of the ditch, I start my crawl back to Highway 1. That's where I'll find help. My shoulders and my hand are in pain. My elbows, my right leg, and my left hand are all that work. I use the leg to push myself forward and my hand and elbows to pull my body along. It's a slow process. Crawling through the ditch, I come to the brush that caused us to leave its cover. I remember Hammond and Joe were right behind me. There were NVA close by. I killed the two who tried to take my weapon. I hope Hammond and Joe got away. To get around the blockage, I try to reach for the top of the ditch, but it's too high. I try to stand, but I fall. Once again, I'm on my gut. I stare at what blocks my way. Out of desperation, I stick my left hand in and pull out broken tree limbs and shrubberies. Over and over again, I repeat this maneuver until my good hand is now bloody and in pain. I've made a hole just large enough for me to crawl through. As I push past the branches and sharp tree limbs, they tear at my wounds. My side and hands are all scratched and torn, but I'm finally out the other side. I'm exhausted and I haven't had any water for hours. Losing blood adds to my dehydration. As I crawl through the ditch, I find water at the bottom. It's filthy with floating bugs that crawl on my face. I can feel them on my hands. I need to drink. I suck up the liquid and swallow enough to keep me going. Finally, there's a slope in the ditch, a chance for me to crawl up and out. I use my good leg to push upward and my elbows and hand to dig in and pull my body along. But my injured shoulders scream with pain. I try to ignore it while continuing to push myself to the top of the ditch. But my body is too weak. I'm not going to make it. I stop. With my head down, I think back to boot camp, the place where every Marine learns what it means to never give up. The D.I. pushed me past my limits. I was done. I couldn't go any farther, but he wanted another mile. He screamed in my ear, You giving up, Talbot? Are you a quitter? No, sir. This private is not a quitter, sir. Then how about one more for the Corps? Aye, aye, sir. Hoorah, Marine Corps. Without even realizing it, I've moved to the top of the ditch and I'm crawling out. I quietly say, Hoorah. Now the rice paddies and then the grass fields back to Highway 1. The water in these fields is not deep. It's refreshing and cools my overheated body. I drink as much of it as I can. Hours pass. Where is that damn road? I know I'm going the right way. I know it. Finally, it's the end of the rice paddies. Now I'm crawling through the grass. 
It's not high grass, but tall enough to hide me. I continue for a long time. Exhausted, I stop to rest. Behind me, in the east, the sun begins to rise. I roll over and smile, watching it climb and chase the darkness away. The clouds from last night are gone, and the sky is becoming clear and blue. I start to wonder if I'll ever make it to Highway 1. I need a smoke. I reach into my trouser pocket and find what the gooks missed, my pack of lucky strikes. But what the hell? They feel warm and wet. I pull them out and cry aloud, Not my smokes! My own blood has soaked them through. Suddenly I hear what sounds like a vehicle. Rolling myself over, I raise my head to peek over the grass. Fifty yards ahead, I see a jeep on Highway 1. I sigh with relief and smile. I start crawling again. As the grass ends, I'm in the open. I rise as much as I can, hoping some friendlies will see me. What the fuck? I yell as the crack of a rifle sends a bullet over my head. I crawled all night and escaped from the NVA, and then my own people shoot at me? I hear Vietnamese voices and wonder aloud, Charlie took Highway 1? I look up again and realize they're not NVA, they're Arvin. A smile grows across my face and I say out loud, Army of the Republic of Vietnam! I raise my hand high in the air, yelling as loud as I can, Marine! American Marine! I'm done crawling. If I get shot, then so be it. With all my strength, I stand and fall. But before I do, I see South Vietnamese soldiers running toward me. I let out a heavy sigh as I lie on the ground. Two of the Arvins pick me up and carry my body to the highway. Then another Arvin shows up. He's an officer. There's a rank on his collar. He walks over and says, in English, Hey, you Marine? American? I nod, and he says, Where's your rifle, Marine? VC souvenir? And laughs. If my looks could kill, he'd be dead. They put me in their jeep and take me to a compound close by. There, they lay me on the ground in front of a hooch. A South Vietnamese medic comes out and gives me a shot. It must be morphine because the pain begins to ease. Before I pass out, I see the officer inside the hooch talking on the radio. Some time goes by. I'm not sure how long. The morphine must have knocked me out. I lift my head as another jeep arrives, this time with Americans. They look like army. The one riding in the passenger seat gets out and talks to the South Vietnamese commander. I notice he has two bars on his collar. Two other soldiers get out of the jeep and start checking my wounds. Who are you? I ask. I'm a medic. I see on his sleeve three stripes indicating a sergeant. Jarhead, what the hell happened to you? I got shot. I smile. They pick me up and put me on a stretcher, which they strap to the jeep. While the medic works on my injuries, the captain walks over. What's your name, Marine? Lance Corporal Talbot, sir. What unit are you with? Echo 2, Cap Platoon. Where's the rest of your team? I look at him and quietly answer, Dead, sir. All dead. He pauses, exchanging a glance with the medic. Where are they, your team? In a trench? By the trees? What trees? The trees around Lo Jang, sir. How did you get here, to the highway? I crawled, sir. All night, I crawled. In a disbelieving tone, he says, Those trees are at least two or three clicks away. My answer is only a smile. The captain sits and tells the driver, Let's go. As the jeep pulls away, he turns back to the medic. How's he doing, Doc? He's got several wounds, sir. He needs a doctor ASAP. The major turns away and I see a pack of cigarettes in his pocket. Can I get a smoke, sir? He hands me the pack of camel cigarettes. With my damaged hands, I struggle to get one out. The major takes the cigarettes back and shakes one out of the pack. He places it between my lips and lights it with his Bic lighter. Thanks, sir. I take a deep drag of the smoke, pull it from my lips with my good hand, hold the smoke in for a moment, and exhale through my nose. I ask the medic, 
Did I make it? Yeah, man. You made it. I smile. Chapter 37 Rescued February 9th, 1968. Ambush plus one. The two medics strap my stretcher to the jeep. As we speed down the road, the sergeant examines me, reporting what he finds. Both shoulders have bullet wounds, but his side is what will kill him. He reaches behind me and pulls up my shirt. His hand searches for an exit wound. There it is. Found it. And it's bleeding. I need to plug this hole. The other medic says, His face and head were hit with shrapnel. You take care of it. I've got the exit wound. Then he asks me, You got hit good, man. How did you get the shrapnel? A chai com grenade. I killed the gook who threw it. That's the last I remember until I woke up with my hands tied. You were a prisoner? Yeah, I was, I say, smiling. Really? You're a little weird, man. You think that's funny? I just keep smiling while he works on me. The jeep pulls over and the major turns to me. I flagged down an ambulance. Do you want to go to the hospital with us or them? I look up and see a vehicle with a big red cross. I'll go with them, sir. The medic tells the major, Give me a minute, sir. I need to finish covering this exit wound. The two medics hurry to bandage all my holes. Finished, they transfer my stretcher to the ambulance. Once inside, another medic checks me over. Exhausted, I pass out and wake when the vehicle stops and starts backing up. The door is open and several people grab my stretcher, pulling me out. I hear one of them yell, Get him into triage! They rush me into a building. Above the door I see a sign, NSA Station Hospital. This is the Navy Hospital in Da Nang. Inside they set my stretcher down on what looks like wooden sawhorses. A corpsman stands over me checking my dog tags. He yells out, Blood type O positive. A voice from somewhere yells back, Hang a bag of blood and start an IV. What's his triage level? While one guy checks and relays what he finds, others start cutting off my uniform. He has wounds to both shoulders, left side with an exit wound in the lower back. His abdomen is swollen, possible internal bleeding. He's a level two. Another man comes forward and the corpsman steps aside. I'm Lieutenant Commander Harrelson. All the poking around makes the pain worse. I ask, are you a doctor? Yes, I am, son. Shining a light in my eyes, he asks, how long ago were you wounded? Yesterday. I couldn't walk. Why couldn't I walk? What happened when you tried to walk? Got up to run, but fell. I couldn't stand either. He turns me over and looks where the exit wound is located. I want x-rays of his abdomen, back and pelvis, both shoulders and right hand, any place you find a wound. Can you put me to sleep, Doc? I'm starting to hurt. You want to go to sleep? I think we can arrange it. He says something I don't understand. Another corpsman picks up a syringe and sticks it in my hip. That's the last thing I remember before everything goes dark. February 10th, 1968. Ambush plus two. I wake. Though a struggle, I manage to lift my head and look around. I'm in the middle of a room at least 40 feet long. Beds line both sides. A guy lying on my right is bandaged. On my left, another has his face covered. An IV port sticks in my left arm and a bag of something is attached to it. I'm covered with a white sheet. My right hand and both my shoulders are also bandaged. Everything hurts like hell. I lift the sheet to see my stomach and chest are wrapped in white bandages. I set the sheet down as my head begins to spin, and I lay it on the pillow. A round-eyed nurse comes over. She's dressed in an all-white uniform with a funny cover on her head. Smiling, she asks, How do you feel, Lance Corporal Talbot? I struggle with the words, but ask, Where am I? What happened? She checks my bandages and vitals. What do you remember? I stay quiet for a moment. Crawling. I remember crawling. Anything else? No. 
How did I get here? You arrived in an army ambulance. I struggle until my memory starts to return. Yeah, the army. That's right. The army brought you to us. Us? Who is us? You're at the NSA. I look at her but have no idea what she means. Her smile grows and she says, NSA, Naval Support Activity Hospital. I'm still confused. Da Nang, you know, the air base? I remember the sign above the door. Okay, Da Nang. Yeah, I remember. Before she leaves, she asks, Can I get you anything? Yes, ma'am. A sandwich would be great. Hunger is a good sign, but I'm sorry, you're on liquids only. Would you like some water or juice? I could get you some chicken broth. Water will do. She gives me a cup of water with a straw and helps me lift my head enough to drink. I suck in the cool liquid, which feels great, but it's hard to swallow. I finally get it down. You just came out of surgery. It will get easier to swallow in time. Are you a nurse? An American nurse? Yes, I am. I'm in the Navy. She smiles and walks away to attend to other patients. The guy next to me asks, Hey, Talbot. How you doing, man? I turn, trying to take a closer look at him. Do I know you? I'm Sergeant Cossey, Echo 4. Hey, Sergeant, you made it out. Your guys okay? Yeah, but everyone was wounded. How about your team? I don't answer. I turn away. Is it true, man? You guys ran into a hornet's nest? I stare at the ceiling and reply, Yeah, a hornet's nest. I'm drained and soon fall asleep. When I wake, it's night. I know this because all the lights in the ward are either turned off or very dim. I close my eyes and drift back to sleep. February 11th, 1968. Ambush plus three. When I wake the following day, the same nurse is standing over me checking my pulse. Good morning, Lance Corporal. I don't smile. I try to move, but it's too painful. You can call me Don. Any chance I can get something to eat? I'm sorry, no. She picks up a cup of water and I drink. This time when I swallow, it goes right down. See, I told you it would get better. Can I walk? Did they fix me so I can walk? The doctor will be in to see you later today. He'll tell you everything that's going on. She looks back toward the doors, then at me. There are a couple of officers here. They want to ask you some questions. You feel up to it? Sure. A Marine Corps colonel and a major walk over to my rack. The colonel asks me, How do you feel, Marine? Good, sir. I guess. I'm Colonel Anderson, and this is Major Parsky. We want to ask you a few questions. Is that okay? I nod. Do you know how many VC attacked you? No, sir. There were more of them than us, and they were NVA. How do you know they were NVA? Their uniforms, helmets, weapons. They were NVA. What happened out there, Lance Corporal? Tell us what you remember. Captain Jocelyn's Echo 3 got overrun first. Corporal Hammond and Corporal Cruz tried to get us to Echo 4. The enemy put a bunch of shit in the ditch we were in. You were in a ditch? Yes, sir. A drainage ditch. We used it as a cover while trying to reach Echo 4. There was no way past the blockage in the ditch except to get out and go around. As soon as we did, the NVA were all over us. That's when Hammond and Joe disappeared. The enemy attack was relentless. They kept coming, wave after wave. They got in the ditch with us. Some were only a few feet away. I start to become animated, trying to use my hands to show what I recall. Pete went down. Then Doc was hit, but he kept fighting. Then Murph got hit. I watched him die. I got hit. And then Doc was dead. A grenade must have gone off close to me. I passed out and woke up when an NVA was tying my hands behind my back. You were a prisoner? Yes, sir. I start breathing hard. The nurse, who's been monitoring me, asks, 
Are you all right, Lance Corporal? I don't answer, but she sees the fatigue on my face. Can we finish this at a later date, Colonel? The Lance Corporal needs his rest. We've got everything we need for now. You're in good hands, Marine. As they start to walk away, the Colonel stops and turns back. One more question. You mentioned Captain Jocelyn's team, Echo 3, was overrun before your team, Echo 2. Did the captain split his force? Yes, sir. Sergeant Palmer didn't like it, but went along anyway. Ah, uh, what about Palmer and Burge? They left before things got bad. Did they make it back? Who are Palmer and Burge? asks the major. Burge got wounded in the neck, and Doc couldn't stop the bleeding, so Sergeant Palmer left with him to get help. The two officers exchange an uneasy glance. The colonel asks, Sergeant Palmer was your squad leader? Yes, sir. No, no word yet. But we'll look into it. I lay my head back on the pillow and fall asleep. Later that day, the doctor shows up and wakes me. How do you feel? Not much pain. What about me walking? Can I try to walk now? No, I'm afraid not. You were shot three times. One of those bullets entered your side and exited through your pelvis. Your ilium bone is shattered. What's an ilium bone? Ilium bone. Without it, you can't walk very well. It's why you fell. The doctor takes a deep breath and sighs. You'll need surgery to repair it. We're sending you to Japan. They have doctors there who are experts in that field. But I thought you guys already did surgery on me. Only emergency surgery. You had some damage to one of your kidneys and internal bleeding. We patched you up. But for this type of surgery, you need a doctor better qualified in that field. So they can fix this? I'll walk again? It might take you a while, but you'll have an excellent chance to walk. Do you have any more questions? When do I go to Japan? You're scheduled for tomorrow. Anything else? I shake my head. He gives a few orders to the nurse and leaves. She gives me some pills in a paper cup. I swallow them with water and soon fall asleep. February 12th, 1968. Ambush plus four. Still on a liquid diet, I'm starving. I know I'm going to Japan for a special operation, but man, I'm hungry. I figure this liquid diet will end once I have that surgery. The nurse who has been with me since I arrived is nowhere around. I want to say thanks before I leave. Three Navy guys show up. Two of them lift me onto a stretcher, and the third one leads the way. They carry me outside to a warm and sunny day. I can hear the chomping sound of helicopter blades turning as I'm carried toward a bunker wall. The sound of the chopper gets louder and louder. There it is. It's huge. I've never seen any helicopter this big before. They carry me inside and strap my stretcher down. Lying there, I watch as more wounded are brought on board. The crew chief comes over to make sure everyone's secured. Satisfied, he walks away. I can hear the turbine's engines whirling as we lift off. This is my first time in a helicopter, so I struggle to see out a window. As the ground falls away, the turning blades send out a tremendous wind, causing one of the ground crew to fall down. In only minutes, we reach the other side of the Da Nang airfield. As we are taken off the helicopter, I see a huge four-propeller airplane sitting there waiting. Its large tailgate is down, and wounded are being hurried on the plane. We don't wait long before our turn comes. We are all taken on board where Air Force crew members secure our stretchers. One of the crew tells those carrying me on board, put him on the upper litter space and the other one across from him on the lower space. Once I'm secured, I look forward. The plane is filled with injured Marines and soldiers. Still coming on behind me are four more wounded. They're being secured on the last four litter spaces available. I raise my voice and announce, Next stop, Japan. Chapter 38 Japan 
After I'm brought on board and my stretcher is locked in place, I look at what's inside this aircraft. It's as huge as the outside. Doctors and nurses are going from wounded to wounded. Stretchers are stacked three and four high. Some, only two high, look to be for the more serious. There are seats along the bulkheads, probably for the Air Force personnel. The plane's whole interior looks like a long hospital. A man wearing fatigues walks over and checks my stretcher. He hangs a bag of clear liquid and installs an IV into the port in my arm. Without a word, he turns to the next man. Hey man, what is that? I ask. Saline keeps you hydrated. A few minutes later, another man walks up. He picks up the clipboard attached to my stretcher. While flipping through the papers, he asks, Are you comfortable, Marine? On his right collar are captain bars, and on the left, a medical emblem. He's an officer, so I answer, Yes, sir, I'm good to go. He looks at me and smiles. I'm Captain Kramer, chief nurse. You need anything, let one of the med techs know. Thanks, Captain, I will. This flight will take about five hours. I'm going to give you something for the pain. After taking a syringe from a drawer attached to the bulkhead, he puts the needle into the IV port and pushes the plunger. You're going to be okay. He leaves to attend to the others. I watch as the four wounded behind me are secured, two on each side of the aircraft. A loud humming has me lift my head to see what's making the noise. It's the tailgate rising. I watch until the giant hatch shuts and locks in place. The sound of the four engines coming to life is louder than I expected. When the technician sits and straps himself in a seat at the rear of the plane, I know it's time to leave Vietnam. The airplane starts rolling. At first, it's slow. The engines become louder and the plane starts shaking. It jerks forward and I feel it picking up speed. As the nose of the aircraft lifts upward, we leave the ground. The plane continues to climb as the landing gear comes up. Shortly after we level off, the medical technician unstraps himself. He begins moving from patient to patient, making sure we're all still secured. When he finally gets to me, I ask, Am I still on a liquid diet? Is there anything for me to eat? He picks up my chart. Nope. These orders are for nothing by mouth. But it won't be too much longer and you'll have some real food. I don't understand. I was on liquid, apple juice, even chicken broth. Now nothing? What gives? You're scheduled for surgery at Yokosuka as soon as we land. Yoka what? He laughs. Yokosuka. Shocked, I ask. A Japanese hospital? No, no, it's the U.S. Naval Hospital. It's where you're going. It's the top military facility in this part of the world. He goes back to reading my charts. You've been prepped for surgery. They want to keep you that way. He looks up from the chart and asks, You can't walk, can you? No. I sure hope they can fix me. What else can you tell me? He looks back at the chart. Well, it says you have three bullet wounds and you have three exit wounds. That's good. Nothing to dig out. You've got shrapnel wounds to your face and head. He looks at them. They're all superficial and healing. He looks at the chart again. And your right hand was seriously injured also by shrapnel. You think they'll fix me so I can walk? I asked the doc back at Da Nang and he said there's a good chance. The doctors at Yokosuka are some of the best the Navy has, so yes, they'll fix you. I hope so. I don't want to be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. Say, is there any chance I can at least get a drink of water? Sorry, no can do. But ice chips you can have. I'll be right back. He walks away to an ice chest on the bulkhead near the tailgate. He pours some chips into a paper cup, then hands it to me and asks, Can you handle this with your left hand? I nod and he walks away. I take a few ice chips and watch as he makes another patient comfortable. I look around at the other wounded on board. Across from me, a guy covered in bandages moves his arms upward a few inches. Another guy in the tail is sitting up eating a sandwich and drinking a Coke. He can't be too bad off. The other wounded are all lying still. 
Like me, their wounds are nasty, but no longer life-threatening. The meds the nurse gave me start kicking in. My pain is gone, and I feel sleepy. I don't know how long I've been out, but when I wake, it's because my shoulders and hand are hurting. As soon as I'm able, I wave down the tech. You slept a long time, he says. Can I help you? My hand and shoulder hurt like hell. Can I get something for the pain? I'm sorry, we'll be landing soon and you'll get what you need at the hospital. He checks my tie-downs to make sure my stretcher is ready for landing. He does the same for each of the wounded in the tail section before he sits and straps himself in. The plane banks right and then levels off. We pitch downward as we begin to descend. Another turn, this time a quick left. At the sound of the landing gear coming down, I know it won't be too much longer. First comes a bump, and then I hear the screech from the tires as they touch down. We're on the runway and slowing. Fast. The plane makes a few turns until it finally comes to a stop and the engines shut down. Captain Kramer steps past me and the other wounded to stand at the tailgate base, waiting for it to lower. As the gate comes down, the sun outside rushes in. My day is now in front of me. From where I lie, I clearly see what's outside. There are ambulances for those who are carried off and a bus for any walking wounded. Captain Kramer walks down the ramp and starts giving orders to the people sent to disembark the wounded. When it comes to me, the captain orders, This one is due for surgery. Put him and the Marine on oxygen in the ambulance together and get them to Yokosuka stat. As soon as we're secured, the vehicle goes off, its lights flashing and siren wailing. We wind our way through city streets. I don't know where we are, so I ask the medic sitting behind the driver, Hey man, where are we? Japan. I know Japan, but where are we? Just outside Tokyo. The guy on oxygen moves a little and I ask, You get burned, man? Was it a willy Pete? He doesn't answer doesn't even move. Hang in there, buddy. You'll be okay. The ambulance stops and backs up and the doors open. Sailors dressed in blue fatigues come in to release the stretchers. The medic riding with us points at me. This one to the OR, the other goes to triage. Both are stat. They set us on two separate gurneys with wheels. As we're pushed inside, I notice the difference between this hospital and Da Nang. Unlike Da Nang, this place is modern and spotless, no dirt, sand, or dust anywhere. My wounded companion heads to an elevator while I'm pushed down a passageway. Since our time on the airplane until now, the guy has never acknowledged my presence. As the elevator doors start to close, he raises his hand and tries to wave. I wave back. I'm taken down a couple of passages and through several swinging hatchways. We burst through a final hatch and into a large room with bright lights. Many people are hustling about, all wearing masks. The guy who delivered me says, You take care, Marine, and walks out. Another person, a nurse, I guess, walks up to me, asking, Your Lance Corporal Donald Talbot? Yes, ma'am. Your service number is 2495738? Affirmative. Blood type is O positive? I nod. Please acknowledge with yes or no. Yes. Do you know why you are here? My pelvis. Operation so I can walk again. She smiles and walks away. Another person pushes the gurney next to what looks like an operating table. There's a white cloth lying over it and a large bright light hanging above. Two men come over and lift me up. Then they slide me on the table and cover me with another sheet. A nurse changes out my IV and hangs another. The bag's dark red color tells me it's blood. A man wearing a mask beneath his chin walks up and says, I'm Commander Phillips, your surgeon. I've been waiting for you, Don. You mind if I call you Don? I shake my head. His kind smile and caring eyes make me feel a little less nervous. I'm going to fix you so you can walk again, okay? I stare at him and nod. Good. Let's get started. He steps away and another man comes over. Though his mouth and nose are hidden behind a mask, 
I can see the smile in his eyes. He tells me, I'm going to put you to sleep now, Don. He places something over my mouth and nose and says, Start counting backward from 100. I'm scared. Everything is happening so fast. I hope this doctor knows what he's doing. I start counting backward and don't remember anything after 92. I open my eyes, but my mind won't process where I am. I'm confused, trying to figure out what's going on. A woman walks up and says, Lance Corporal, I'm Anson Paulette. You are in recovery and waking up from the anesthesia. Do you know who you are? I nod, but she wants to hear me speak. Tell me who you are. Lance Corporal Don Talbot. Do you remember the surgery? Yes. A man walks up behind the nurse. After she moves aside, he steps forward. Hello, Don. I'm your surgeon. He's smiling and asks, Do you remember me? Not sure. Maybe. Don't worry. I want to tell you everything went as planned. Your pelvis is repaired, and after therapy, I expect you will walk again. I smile from ear to ear, or at least that's what I'm trying to do. The doctor smiles back, turns, and walks away. I look from side to side and notice I'm no longer in the operating room. This room is much smaller. The nurse is doing something with my IV. I start to feel uneasy and anxious. My knees are bent up and I can't move them. I'm so drowsy I fall back to sleep. When I wake again, my mind is clearer. I'm no longer in what I assumed was the recovery room. A different nurse is with me now. She asks, What is your name? I look at her and stammer out, Lance Corporal Talbot. Talbot. Lance Corporal Talbot. Perfect? How do you feel? Thirsty. When can I walk? She helps me take a sip of water, then says, You won't start therapy until you're healed. The doctor will be in to explain everything to you. As soon as you're ready, you'll have something to eat. And we'll have a phone brought in so you can call home. Talk to your family. Would you like that? Yes, I would. My legs. Why? It's because of the surgery. It won't be long before you'll be able to lower your legs. Too tired to ask any more questions. I fall asleep again. Chapter 39 Finding My Way Back February 13, 1968 Ambush Plus Six I wake today with a clear head, but in pain. The aches in my shoulders and side are the same. My legs are still bent at the knees, which made sleeping difficult last night. If not for the drugs they're giving me, I wouldn't have slept at all. A woman, a nurse with red hair, walks over. You're awake? How do you feel? Not too bad. You were here yesterday? Yes. You're my patient. I'm Lieutenant J.G. Harris. My legs. This is so uncomfortable. Can I put them down? You'll be like this for a little while longer. Your pelvis was... A naval officer walks up, interrupting her. Hello, Lance Corporal. I'm Commander Phillips. Do you remember me? Yeah, I talked to you before my operation. That's right. How's your pain? It hurts in my back and side. How did it go, sir? He turns and says something to the nurse who walks away. Then he moves to the foot of my bed and uncovers my feet, asking, Can you wiggle your toes for me? I do, and he says, Good. That's good. Next, he scrapes something over my legs and asks, You feel that? Yeah, Doc, I do. What's up? How about this? He scrapes something over the tops of my feet. Yeah, I feel that too. Why? What happened? He puts the blanket down and steps forward. Did you or anyone perform first aid on any of your wounds before you arrived at Da Nang's NSA hospital? The medic who first picked me up. Why? How long after you received these wounds did that happen? The next day. You went 24 hours with your wounds unattended to? I scoff. Yeah, 
I didn't have time to do anything but keep crawling. I needed to find friendlies before the NVA found me. You're lucky. I don't know how you didn't bleed out. But the luckiest thing is the exit wound in your back. What do you mean? The bullet shattered the ilium bone in your pelvis before it exited. That's the reason you were unable to walk. The good news is it missed your spine. The exit wound measured 1.2 centimeters from the lumbar vertebrae, L5. The difference between something we could repair and something we could not. I had to put screws in during your operation to hold the pelvis together, and I may have touched your spine. But you seem to be fine. You have feeling in your legs and movement in your toes. So I'm good then. No problems? What about my knees? It was hard to sleep last night. PT will be by later today to lower them. We have to be careful to avoid any damage or pain. So, I'll walk again? Yes, I don't expect any problems. You'll have to go through some intensive therapy, but you will walk again. And my spine? All good to go? Seems to be. But I've asked a neurologist to do more extensive tests. Do you have any more questions? What about my hand, sir? The nurse returns and injects something into my IV. The doctor gives her another order as he puts on plastic gloves and begins removing the bandages. With the bindings off, I can see my hand for the first time since the night of my escape. There are scars on the fingers and palm. The back of my hand looks like Frankenstein's monster with all the stitches running through it. Move your fingers around. I do as he instructs. Now make a fist. The fist does not come together very well. Try to touch your fingers to your thumb for me. I cannot, so I ask, What does that mean? Your ulnar nerve was likely damaged from your shoulder wound. That nerve runs from the top of your shoulder down to your hand. He tells the nurse to rewrap my hand and continue with pain meds as needed. Then he says, I'll add your hand to the neurologist list and order the stitches out tomorrow. Anything else? I shake my head and he walks away. The nurse puts medicated gauzes on my wounds and starts to rewrap the hand. Do you feel better now, Don? She asks. Yeah, I do. Hey, can I eat now? Yes, you can. She finishes and says, I'll be right back. I look around and see the other wounded in the ward. This place doesn't seem to have as many beds as Da Nang. The ones here are all spaced farther apart. Several nurses and corpsmen are walking around, all tending to different patients. A guy a few beds away has both his arms bandaged, but they're only half the normal length. I know what that means. I try to relax. What happened on February 8th keeps haunting me. I haven't had any nightmares, but I fear they will come. I guess what the doc said about me being lucky is right. I should have died with my guys. Doc, Pete, Bruce, Murphy, all dead in the ditch. And Joe, Hammond, I wonder what happened to you guys. Hammond, man, you were short, going home in a few days. Why are you gone and I'm alive? The nurse is back, carrying a tray. Here you are, as promised. She sets it down on an over-the-bed table. When the dish is uncovered, I raise my voice. What the hell? This is all I get? Come on, a hard-boiled egg, jello, a cup of... What's that, broth? Is that coffee? She's quiet, allowing me to vent. Then, in a calm voice, she says, Yes, it's broth, and no, it's hot tea. You'll have to work yourself up to a cheeseburger. If you improve, you'll get something more substantial tomorrow. I realize what I did and lower my eyes. She's quiet as I stare at the plate and finally says, Okay? I take the egg and place it in my mouth whole. After not eating for several days, I see the nurse is right. I can't finish what she gave me. Later in the day, two corpsmen come over. I'm Petty Officer First Class Lancaster, and this is Petty Officer Second Class Jones. We are your physical therapists. 
I see your hand is still bandaged, so no hand therapy today. Are you going to do something about my legs? Yeah, we are. Lancaster takes charge, telling Jones, We have to do this together. Get on the other side of the rack, remove the restraints, and take hold of his leg. Now, lower it at the same time as mine. You relax, Talbot. Let us move your legs. I nod, expecting pain, but there is none. Finished, Lancaster asks, Your legs have to remain in this position for a while. Can you keep them still? Or do we have to secure them? No, I'm good. What about when I sleep? Continue to keep them still as best you can. He pauses. You're supposed to start therapy on your hand today. Dr. Phillips told me the bandages and stitches will come out tomorrow. We'll see you then. They walk away. A few hours pass before a naval officer shows up. How are you doing, son? He asks. Fine, sir. I look down at the rank on the sleeve of his blue uniform. Then I notice a cross between his rank and his elbow. I ask, You a sky pilot? He sighs. That is a title given to me by those who served in Vietnam. I have never been there myself, so I don't feel worthy accepting such an honorable designation. Though I have tried. He laughs. They say I'm needed here. At first I didn't know you were a chaplain. I see. The cross gave me away. I didn't ask for a minister. That's okay. I try to introduce myself to all those who are new here. He smiles. You might say, this is my ward. I don't respond and turn my eyes away. My name is Lieutenant Marshall. He pauses. You can call me Richard. Another pause. Your dog tags state you're a Protestant. Are you? I ask. He smiles. Yes, I am. What do you want? Do you mind if I call you Don? I turn to him with a smirk. Everybody here keeps calling me Don and then asks if it's okay. Whatever. Don, he sighs. I'm only here to see if you want to talk. I snap back. I don't. I understand you lost your entire squad on February 8th. He pauses for a minute or two, waiting for me to respond. But I only look away. It's true, then? You were the lone survivor? That has to be difficult. I continue to ignore him. I wish I had the right words for you, Don. Suffering such a loss is no different than losing family members. I turned back, snapping, They are my family, sir. Every one of them was a brother. I stare, waiting for a response, but the chaplain remains quiet. With a soft voice, under my breath, I tell him, I see their faces in my dreams. I can hear their voices, and even in the darkness. I look up at the chaplain. I recognize them. I know each and every one. I miss them, you know? The chaplain remains quiet until he asks, Can I tell you a story? He doesn't wait for me to answer. I look away. Two years ago, I was a pastor at a small congregation in a little town outside Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It was a Saturday morning. My family and I woke, like any other day, unaware of what was about to unfold. I'm sure when you started that patrol, you didn't expect it to end the way it did. I turned to him. He has my interest. My son left to do some morning errands. The boy had just returned from Vietnam. He was home safe. I was preparing my Sunday sermon when the phone rang. It was the police. He stops talking and catches his breath. Bobby, that's my son had a terrible accident. The police told us to hurry, and I knew he was going to die. I prayed. I wanted to get to see him alive one last time, to say goodbye to my son. My wife and I rushed to the hospital, but we were too late. He was... gone. We never got to say goodbye. Beginning to feel compassion, I ask, How did you get through it? Karen his mom and I, 
had the support of our family. We comforted each other. We had the support of our congregation. And we had God. I surrendered it to Him. That's all it took. You gave it to God and all your pain went away? No, Don. But it was the beginning. I trust in God and I know I will see my son again. But I still grieve, even today. I can appreciate your grief. But I will never know what you went through that day. I understand your... The hell you do! No one can understand what we went through! No one! With a smile, he adds, Did I mention my son wanted to be a minister like his dad? He wanted to be a Navy chaplain. He was attending seminary school in Milwaukee. He wanted to help those he served with, not with a gun, but with a Bible. He's silent while giving me time, then adds, Did I tell you Bobby was a Marine, like you? I look up at him. What was his MOS? A grunt like you? After Bobby's death, I wanted to finish what he started, so I enlisted and became a Navy chaplain. I want to help you, Don, if you'll let me. I shrug my shoulders. If there's anything I can do for you, you only need to ask. Thanks, sir, I'm good. After a moment, there's one thing you can do. The nurse told me I could call home. Could you check on it for me? He smiles and nods. I will, before I leave. Can I say a prayer over you, Don? I snicker. If it makes you happy, go ahead. He closes his eyes and holds up one hand while touching my arm with the other. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to restore life to the broken, dead, and dormant places that have wounded Don. Places where Don may have given up, set aside, ignored, rejected, shut down, and abandoned. I call for a restoration and a redemptive work within him at the deepest levels, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. He smiles. You need me, Don? Day or night, call. I'll be there. With that, he walks away. Shortly after the chaplain is gone, a corpsman walks up carrying a black phone. He sets it on my table and unravels a long cord. I watch him plug one end of the line into the phone and the other end into the wall behind my rack. He tells me, Go ahead. Call home. The phone has no rotary dial, so I ask, How do I use this? Just pick it up, tell the operator where in the world you want to call, and give your home phone number. The operator will do the rest. I start to pick up the receiver, and he stops me. It might take a few minutes, so don't get nervous. Where back home is it you're calling? Harvey, Illinois. Why? You know, it's... He looks at his watch. 3 a.m. there. He steps back, giving me space. I pick up the phone and hear, Overseas operator? Call the USA. Number, please. I give the number and the phone goes silent. Minute after minute passes. Even though the corpsman told me not to get nervous, I do. Not about the connection, but about what I'll say. Should I tell them where I am? Tell them I'm wounded? Tell them how all my friends are dead? The guys I wrote to them about are all dead. What if... Hello, who is this? The voice on the other end is angry. Do you know what time it is? In the background, I hear my dad yelling, Hang up the phone, Clara. After a short pause, I say, Hi, Mom. Chapter 40 Almost There Donald? Is this you? She whispers. Hi, Mom. Yeah, it's me. Oh, my son, where are you? Are you coming home? Her questions come fast. Mom, I'm in Japan. I got shot and... Oh, my God! She screams. Oh, shit. Shouldn't have said it like that. I hear a bang and Mom telling Dad, Donald's been shot. Talk to your son. She's crying and I hear my dad say, Damn, Clara, you didn't have to drop the phone. Don? Son? Are you there? Yeah, Dad, I'm here. 
Mom sounds pretty upset. Tell her I'm okay. Don says he's fine and don't worry. I hear nothing but silence, so I ask, Dad? You still there? I... I'm here. I hear his concern. I'm okay, Dad. What happened, Don? Are you sure you're okay? We were in a firefight. It was bad. I got hit on my right side. The bullet went through my pelvis, came out my back. I can't walk. Dad yells, You can't walk! Oh my God, he's paralyzed? I hear my mom yell, Dad, listen. I can't walk right now. That's why they sent me to Japan. I got operated on and the doctor said I will walk again. Tell mom I'm fine. They fixed me up fine. Clara, the boy's okay. He had an operation and the doctors say he will walk again. Our boy isn't paralyzed. Donnie, you were shot? By who, son? Who shot you? The NVA. The enemy shot me. I paused to catch my breath. I'm feeling tired, Dad. There's a lot more to tell when I get home. When will that be, son? Do you know? No, but I don't think they'll keep me here any longer than necessary. I'll be heading back to the world real soon. The Navy seaman who brought me the phone indicates it's time to end the call. I've got to go, Dad. Tell everyone I love them, and I'll see you all soon. Okay, son. Will you let us know when you're on your way home? I will, Dad. I love you guys, everyone. I hang up the phone and stare at it as my mind wanders to a dark place, a place I've been trying to keep hidden, a place where Echo 2 is all dead. The seaman walks up, unplugs the phone from the wall, and takes it from me. You okay, Marine? How did they take it? They didn't know anything about what happened to me? Why not? They only notify folks back home if you're KIA or MIA. You know, there's a lot of dying in Nam every day, especially since this Tet thing started. If you make it as far as Japan, you're going to live, usually. They're not saying anything to family until they know what's going to happen to you. Understand? Yeah, I guess. You get a phone call home once we're sure you're not going to die. So be happy. You're a lucky one. After a short pause, he asks again, You okay? Need anything? Hmm, why do you ask? The look on your face. You were spacing out. Is there a problem back home? After talking to Dad, I can't help but think about the guys I left behind. Their parents will never speak with them again. Girlfriends and wives will never hear their voices. No one will ever hold their hands or touch their faces. I've been trying to put these feelings away, but talking to my folks has brought a dark sorrow storming back. Trying not to look at him, I have to ask, So, those guys I was with, they're all dead. Their families all notified? What do you mean, all dead? My whole team, my brothers, they're all dead. I was the only one to make it out. Wow, sorry, man. We're not privy to information about how you got here. It has to be tough living through that. So, is that what's bothering you? He pauses, and when I don't answer, he continues. To answer your question, yes. Those notifications went out. It happens within the first 24 hours after the body is recovered, so yeah, I'm sure of it. He pauses. Sorry, man. You want me to get the chaplain? Nah, I'm fine. I notice other wounded in the ward are getting their evening meals. Forcing a smile, I ask, Is my chow coming? I'm hungry. He smiles back, says, I'll check, and walks away. A few minutes later, my tray of food arrives. Now that I can use the table tray over my lap, an orderly puts the food down and walks away from me. On the tray is a carton of milk, a piece of apple pie, and a plate of food covered with a hard green dome. The smell of the food thrills me. I pick up the cover and smile. On the plate is a hamburger covered in brown gravy. There is no bread or cheese, but there are peas and mashed potatoes. The smile on my face grows. It's not a lot of food, but much better than what they gave me earlier. February 14, 1968. 
Ambush Plus Six. Today I'm expecting visits from the physical therapy team and a neurologist. I'm hoping this neuro doctor will tell me I have no nerve damage and my fingers will get better. My nurse, Lieutenant J.G. Harris, has taken care of me since I got here. This morning is no different than any other. As she walks up, I say, My breakfast is late today. Any idea where it is? Not my job, but I'm sure it will be here shortly. She wraps the blood pressure cuff around my bicep and sticks a thermometer in my mouth. After taking the readings, she asks, Anything unusual in the way you feel today, Lance Corporal? No, ma'am, I feel good. I turn on my side, allowing her to access the bandaged wounds I know she's going to check. After changing the dressings, she informs me, I'm removing your IV. The doctor doesn't feel it's necessary anymore. What about my pain meds? You said you have no pain. Yeah, well, maybe a little. The doctor is taking you off morphine and putting you on a pill four times a day. If your pain returns and the pills aren't working, then we'll administer a shot. Any more questions? I shake my head. When finished, she starts to walk away. I stop her by asking, You're leaving the port in? Just as a precaution in case we have to put on another bag. But don't worry. I've never had to put one back on. You think they'll start getting me up to walk soon? The doctors want you to heal before putting any pressure on your ilium bone. You probably won't start therapy until you get to Great Lakes. They're sending me to Great Lakes? Do you know when? No, I don't. How much longer am I going to be here? I imagine they'll keep you until the doctors are all satisfied you can travel. I don't like that answer, but I have more questions. How do you know they'll send me to Great Lakes? You're from Chicago, yes? Harvey, but that's a suburb of Chicago, so yeah, I guess, Chicago. I don't know for sure where they'll send you, but Great Lakes is the Navy hospital closest to your home. The Navy wants you as close to family as possible. They do this any time there's the possibility of long-term care. You think I'm going to be in the hospital for a long time? That sucks. Look, Don... You suffered a serious injury. Your loss of blood alone that day should have killed you. You are a very lucky young man. She pauses for a moment. Your operation was a success. You will walk again. After everything you've been through, your rehab should be the least of your worries. She grins. So come on, Marine. Oora? I smile and nod. Oora. February 28, 1968. Ambush plus 20. I'm awake. The clock on the wall is illuminated. It's 5 a.m. Someone moans. A new arrival must have come in last night. I feel for the guy. Pain is something we've all had to deal with. The days have passed slowly since I learned about going to Great Lakes. I was allowed another call home a few days ago. The squids reminded me not to get my family's hopes up by telling them where the Navy might be sending me. I've had x-rays three times now. In the last report, the doctor said it all looked good. The physical therapy on my hand ended last week. I can touch all my fingers to my thumb. But now my left hand fingers are acting up. I'm keeping this to myself. If I say something, it might delay my going home. Besides, I had good news from the neurologist. No nerve damage anywhere. I figure this hand will get better, too. I continue to wait for orders to leave, and in the meantime, I lie on this rack day after day. They feed me three square meals and a snack at night, but I'm still using the damn bedpan. My legs feel strong, and I know I could walk, but they say no. Every day a Navy corpsman comes around to exercise my legs and shift my body. They tell me this is necessary to help the legs get strong and keep bed sores from forming. If they let me get up to walk, I wouldn't need any of this. I just want to try. The doctors are no longer giving me updates on my condition. Those stopped last week, too. I guess they're tired of my constant question of when I can go home. My nurse, Lt. J.G. Harris, left or was reassigned to another ward. I miss her. 
Her replacement is a male nurse. His name is Lieutenant Corsick, and he's a real jerk. It doesn't seem right for a man to be a nurse. That Air Force captain on the plane coming to Japan was one too, but at least he seemed to like his job. This lieutenant doesn't like me, especially when I refer to him as Doc. He tells me, I'm not a corpsman, I'm an officer. Whatever. I call him Doc to watch him get pissed. It's my only entertainment. He comes around only to check my vitals in the morning and then later afternoon. But only if I ask to see him, which I wouldn't. He has never been one of those who come to move me around and check on bed sores. I focus on the clock as the lights in the ward come on. Nurses and corpsmen are moving about from patient to patient. Corsic comes over, frowning, and takes my vitals. We say nothing to each other. As he walks away, another great meal arrives. Yesterday it was pancakes and sausage. Today it's eggs, bacon, hash browns, and toast with coffee. The lieutenant walks up, smiling. I'm suspicious about why he seems happy. You already took my vitals. Why are you smiling? What's up, Doc? I laugh. Funny. His smile fades. I won't have to put up with you much longer, Talbot. I stop eating and look at him. What do you mean? Dr. Montgomery will be coming by to talk with you today. Who's Dr. Montgomery? I don't remember him. You know who the Freedom Doctor is? That's him. My eyes grow large. Yeah, that's the doctor who gets us out of here. Is this what I think it is? Don't you bullshit me. Yes, he's the one who discharges you, sends you home. They're sending me home? Looks like it. I don't know when, but the doctor will explain everything. When will he be here? Do you think they would send me home today? Tomorrow? As soon as they have transportation available, you'll be on it. Holy shit, I'm going home. After lunch, Dr. Montgomery arrives. Lance Corporal Talbot? Yes, sir. Are you the Freedom Doctor? He laughs. Yes, I guess I am. I'm Commander Montgomery. We want to send you home tomorrow morning. Do you know the Great Lakes Naval Base in Illinois? Yes, sir. It's about 40 miles from Chicago. So that is where they're sending me? Yes. I have a few questions for you first. He asks about many things ranging from where I live to my family and any discomfort I may be experiencing. He wants to know what I expect to happen when I get to Great Lakes. When he finishes, I ask, So tell me again, sir, when am I leaving? There's space for you tomorrow on an air ambulance C-141 to San Francisco. And then to Great Lakes? Yes. Your only delay should be nothing more than refueling in Frisco and maybe a different crew. So tomorrow is my turn? Is that for sure? Can I call home and tell my folks? So many questions. Let's see. Yes, yes, and no. We don't want you calling home until you are at the naval base, in case anything should change or you get delayed. The base commander doesn't want family hanging around before you're there. So relax, everything should go off as planned. Tomorrow you'll be airborne. Someone will be by in the morning to get you to the flight line. He turns and walks away. I spend the rest of the day smiling while waiting impatiently for morning. Dinner on my last night is great. They give me a steak and baked potato. Everyone comes over to say goodbye. Lieutenant J.G. Harris comes by, too. Even Lieutenant Corsick comes over and says goodbye, though he doesn't smile until I say, Thanks, Doc. Chapter 41 Time to Go Home February 29th, 1968 When I wake, the ward is quiet and dark. I don't know what time my flight home will be. I only know it's today. Lying here, I think back to Delta Company, Military Police Battalion. I asked if they were going to make me an MP. That got a big laugh at my expense. Delta was one of the safer areas in Vietnam. Their mission was to hold the line. But that wasn't what I wanted. I wanted to see action. I wanted to face down the enemy, to pull the trigger. Well, 
This is the result of that decision. And my friends, my family from Echo 2, lie in a cold grave, a grave I should have shared with them. I take a deep breath and try not to think any longer about why I didn't die that day. My plan is to walk again, put it all behind me, and live a life as joyous as possible. Maybe I'll get married, have a few kids, and never again return to that place. I shield my eyes from a beam of light dancing around me. Someone is here. Lance Corporal Talbot, you awake? Yeah. Is it time? Yes, it's time. I have smiled a lot this past year, but nothing like I'm smiling now. So I'm really leaving today? That's right, Jarhead. I need you to change into these PJs. After I'm dressed, the orderly returns with a gurney and a brown bag. I need you to get on. Can you do that? Just get it close. Hang on. Let me lock the wheels. I don't wait, scooting myself up and over on the gurney. What's in the bag? Your breakfast. He sets the bag next to me. You need to be on the flight line by 0600. He covers me with a blanket and hands me a pillow. As we start toward the ward exit, my stomach fills with jitters of anticipation. I'll be right back, he says as we stop. He walks into a room filled with light. From outside, I hear him talking and laughing with others. I check my watch. It's 0530. Several more minutes go by, and I start to wonder what is taking him so long. While I wait, I prop myself up on one elbow and try to see what's in the bag. It's still too dark in the ward, so I stick my hand in and feel around. There's a banana and an apple. There's something in a plastic wrapper. When I pull it out, I can tell it's a sweet roll. There's more, a bag of chips and what feels like a can of soda. There's something wrapped in aluminum foil, feels like a sandwich. This is breakfast and lunch. There's also a candy bar and a small container of liquid. The orderly returns with another seaman who takes the foot section of the gurney while the orderly takes the head. I lie back on the pillow and ask, What took you so long? You said I had to be on the flight line by 0600. A quick glance at my watch. It's almost six now. I don't want to miss this flight, you know. He doesn't answer, but hands me a hard manila folder filled with papers. As they push me into the lighted hallway, I look inside the folder. Are these my medical records? They don't answer. The orderly tells the other guy to pick up the pace. We gotta go, Bill. This guy is all that plane is waiting for. As we haul ass through the hospital, he tells me, Give those records to the nurses on the plane. There's a C-141 waiting for you. Really? Waiting for me? Am I the only one? You ain't that important. It came in last night from Nam. It's carrying the fallen. You and the other wounded are just hitching a ride to San Francisco. That plane is a non-stop flight. Take off, land, you're there. When he says fallen, I know he means KIA. Guys who died in Nam. I'm shaken remembering my guys. I'm wheeled to an elevator exiting on the ground floor. Finally, we're outside. It's cold, and the sun is behind the clouds. Two men load me and another Marine into an ambulance. As we drive off, the other Marine says, We're going home. Yeah, we are. Who are you with? How'd you get wounded? 2-5 Bravo Company, retaking Hui City. I got shrapnel in my belly and legs. A jeep I was in took a direct hit from an RPG. How about you? Lo Jang, outside Da Nang. I got a bullet through my side, came out my back. I pause a moment, then ask, You lose some buddies? In Hui? I lost a few. You? Yeah, my whole squad. He's not shocked by my answer. I know he's seen death. So what's your final destination? He asks. They're sending me to Great Lakes outside of Chicago. You? Just down the road from Frisco. Oak Knoll Navy Hospital, Oakland. You from California? Yeah, San Diego. Shit, man, you didn't have to go far for boot. He laughs. My mom told me she didn't want me to be too far from home, so I joined the Marines. Where are you from? Harvey, Illinois, but originally Chicago.
The ambulance stops, and after backing up, the doors open. There on the tarmac is our Freedom Bird, a huge four-engine propeller plane with a giant rear gate that's down, waiting for us. An Air Force Master Sergeant walks up, yelling, Let's go! These are the last two! Get them on board! We're already late! Several Air Force techs grab our stretchers and run us up the gate and into the plane. Inside, we're both strapped in. Everything is happening so fast that there's no time to ask a question. After we're secured, a nurse walks up, smiling. She takes my medical records. Glancing through them, she asks, How do you feel, Lance Corporal? Any pain? No, ma'am, just a little hungry. They didn't feed you before bringing you on board? No, ma'am. But they gave me a bag of food. I got breakfast and lunch. That's good. We don't have anything but sea rations on the plane. She smiles. This flight will take 11 hours. We'll arrive at 0800 the same day as now, February 29th. If you need to use the latrine, someone will get you a bedpan. Do you have any questions? No, ma'am, I'm good to go. She hands me back my records. This is your responsibility. Hold on to them until you get to your final destination. As she starts to walk away, I ask her, Ma'am, will this plane be taking me to the Navy Hospital in Great Lakes? I get off in Frisco, but the plane will be flying to St. Louis, Missouri. From there, I don't know. You good? Yes. Thanks, ma'am. She smiles and walks away. As the plane's gate begins to rise, I open my bag of food, take out the banana, and peel it and eat it. Thirsty, I drink the juice. It's warm and orange. Breakfast finished, I think about how long this flight will take. Since I didn't get a lot of sleep last night, I doze off. Hours have passed when I wake. My location in the plane has no windows to look out of. It's not the tail like before, but it's still toward the rear. There are a few more wounded in the forward section of the plane, but beyond them, all I see are caskets covered with our flag. I let out a deep sigh and turn away. Knowing that we left at 0700 on the 29th and were landing at 0800 the same day blows my mind. When the techs start coming around to check our stretchers for landing, I check my watch and see the time is 0745. I'm getting excited. Soon the aircraft begins to descend. It's not long before the wheels touch down. The plane continues to turn slowly several times before coming to a stop. The pilot comes over the intercom and announces, Gentlemen and ladies, we are on American soil. Even though many voices are quiet, a roar of joy echoes through the aircraft. The ramp comes down and the wounded staying in California are removed. I say goodbye to the Marine I shared the ambulance with. The nurse stops at my stretcher. I wanted to say goodbye and wish you luck. You'll be here about an hour for refueling and a change in flight crew. Some of the wounded are getting off here, but most are going on to St. Louis. I look forward to where the dead are located and ask, What about them, ma'am? She looks back over her shoulder and sighs. Some are being offloaded here, but most are heading for North Carolina. Camp Lejeune? Yes. I'll say a prayer for you, Marine. Then she raises her voice. For all of you. She turns and walks down the ramp. It's a Thursday afternoon when I finally arrive in St. Louis. My stretcher is carried off the plane to waiting transportation. Some of those I'm with are worse off than me. I'm a little ashamed being here with them. I'm in such good shape now, compared to before. But they don't know what I've been through. We're taken to the other side of the airport and carried onto a large helicopter. It lifts off and before long we're at Glenview Naval Air Station. There we're put in special buses built to handle stretchers. It's a 40-minute ride to Great Lakes. Once I arrive, I'm hustled out of the bus and put on a gurney. The weather here is so cold that it stings my face. I haven't felt this in a long time. The hospital is huge. I'm wheeled through the rear entrance and into a large room. 
A nurse takes my medical records and hands them to a doctor. I'm Commander Farrell. He looks through my records and asks, Have you tried to walk yet? No, sir. They said that would happen when I got here. You haven't received any therapy on your legs at all? No, sir, nothing. Just some moderate leg exercises, but nothing out of bed. Well, he says with a smile, we're going to fix that starting tomorrow. Have you contacted your family yet? No, sir, but I sure want to. He turns to the nurse. Get him scheduled with both physical and occupational therapy ASAP. Then get him settled into a ward and have a phone made available so he can contact his family. He turns back to me. We'll get you walking in no time. Tell your family they are welcome to come and visit. You're going to be fine. The nurse talks to an orderly standing close by. He grabs my gurney and pushes me into an elevator. We exit a couple of floors up, and I'm pushed to a ward only half filled with wounded. Not too many guys. You don't get a lot of Vietnam wounded here? I ask. We get more than we can handle. This ward is for patients like you. He looks around. These guys are all here for therapy. Some can't walk, and some can't use their hands. But they're all going to make it. We have a lot of Marines, and soldiers, too, who aren't going to make it. And that number grows every day. So yeah, we have a lot of wounded at Great Lakes. I'll get you a phone. He walks away. The phone arrives and I start to dial the number. It seems funny calling my parents using this rotary dial. The last time I used a phone like this was at Camp Pendleton the night before I deployed to Nam. The phone rings two, three times, and then my mother answers. Hi, Mom. I'm home. I'm at Great Lakes Naval Hospital. You guys can come and see me whenever you want. Don't cry, Mom. I'm home. Yeah, you can stay. Yes, bring everyone. Yeah, sure, tell my friends too. Okay, I've got a lot to tell you guys when you get here, so hurry. See you soon. I hang up the phone and sigh in relief. I'm alone and in America. Lying back, I stare at the ceiling, thinking of Davis and Delta Company. I learned a lot from him. I laugh. That lieutenant, what was his name? Doesn't matter. He ordered junk on the bunk like boot camp. Everything laid out in a neat and orderly manner. Bullshit. I knew I had to get out of there. The cap units were looking for volunteers. My first day with Echo 2, I knew this was going to be different. These Marines were going into harm's way. Delta was all about holding the line. In Echo 2, we were family. I won't ever forget them. What about Sergeant Palmer? What happened to you and Burge? Why didn't you stay with your squad? The guys who died that day, Pete Cruz, Johnny the Bruce, Doc Tucker Gifford, John Murphy, Joe Zataki, and Dennis Hammond, you gave all that day. I gave some. My stomach begins to twist as my emotions once again send me falling into a bottomless pit. There's nothing down there but darkness. I once again try to figure out why I survived and they didn't. My family is coming, but I can't shake the shame. After taking a deep breath, I stop and think. What if I had died and one of the others lived? Would he feel what I'm feeling? Would I hate the guy? Would I want him to live a life of regret just because he didn't die? No! I can't allow what happened that day to rule my life, my future. They're all dead, and I'm not. What I do from now until I die, I will do for them. Because they're not here. And I am. I reach below the metal bed rail, find the release, and let it down. While holding the top rail, I hang my legs over the side of the bed and inch forward until my feet touch the floor. Still holding the rail, I try to stand. My legs shake and I think I'm going to fall, but then my knees lock. My jaw drops open and a smile covers my face. I'm standing. For the first time since that fateful day, my legs are supporting me. 
I try to let go of the rail, but as I lose my balance, I realize I'm not quite ready for that yet. I laugh, shouting out as my tears fill my eyes. Hey, Echo 2, do you guys see this? I'm standing. I'm standing. I'm going to make it. My voice fades. I'm going to be okay. Sucking in a huge amount of air, I yell at the top of my lungs, Oorah! Marine Corps! From the back of the ward, I hear my mom. Donald! We're here, son! We're here! Epilogue Don Talbot remained at Great Lakes Naval Hospital for the next three months. He suffered through long days strengthening muscles he once used without thinking. Before February 8th, his brain would tell his legs to move, and they did. Now, even that became difficult. At first, as hard as he tried, Don found standing from a kneeling position an impossible task. Then, 27 days into his therapy, he stood up. His mother was there that day, a day for celebration. His mom remained at his side during those three months. She was there during the painful days, during the days when there were only small accomplishments, and she was there the day the doctors told him he was ready for active duty. That day came in June 1968. To Don's surprise, the doctors at Great Lakes made him an offer. He could choose to stay at the hospital under their care for 30 more days, at which time his end-of-contract date would be less than 90 days. The Marine Corps already had plans to start cutting back. The order read, Any Marine returning to duty with less than 90 days under contract will be discharged. Don was proud to be a Marine, and he even considered re-enlisting. But first, Don wanted to know what life would be like in the regular Marine Corps. He turned down the doctor's offer and requested duty to Camp Pendleton. Don was an 0311 grunt, which was all he wanted to be. But because Don's contract had only 120 days remaining, Camp Pendleton wasn't going to happen. Don's orders were to Marine Corps Base Quantico, Virginia. He found himself in supply. Though disappointed, he did his best learning and becoming a good supply clerk. During his time there, he met an old friend, someone he didn't even know was still alive. Burge, the Marine wounded in the neck, who left the battle with Sergeant Palmer. The two met while having lunch at the mess hall. When Burge spoke, Don found it difficult to understand his friend. Burge's wounds that day in February left him with a weak and raspy voice. His speech was almost incomprehensible. Don learned how Burge and Sergeant Palmer fought their way out, how on more than one occasion roaming bands of VC had attacked them. Burge explained, If not for Sergeant Palmer, I wouldn't be alive. Don asked Burge if he knew where Palmer might be. He did not. They were separated after reaching Highway 1. Don's feelings toward Palmer changed after hearing what happened. To this day, he still doesn't understand why the sergeant picked himself to go. He was, after all, their squad leader. But he also knows that without the sergeant's help, Burge would not be alive. On October 17, 1968, Don was honorably discharged. He returned to his parents' home in Illinois. After his separation from the Corps, Don was paid for 30 days' leave. This money gave Don what he needed most at that time of his life, a way to forget the horrors of Vietnam. Don spent his days sleeping and his nights partying with neighborhood friends. As he drank his pain away, he smiled. When those around him asked, what did you do in Vietnam? Did you kill anyone? Don kept the horror to himself and told everyone only the funny stories. He remained the happy-go-lucky guy who always found something to smile about. He wanted to make people laugh, not feel sorry for him. When his money from the Marine Corps ran out, Don found his first job at Arden Corporations, running a machine that made fiberglass for antennae. Shortly after his return to civilian life, Don married a girl from the neighborhood. It didn't last long. They divorced two years later. They had no children. Don left Arden Corporation and decided to better himself. 
He used his GI Bill to attend school at a local junior college close to his home. He studied business and graduated with an associate's degree. Don then found a job with a debit insurance company called United Insurance. As a licensed agent, he collected premiums from clients located on a specified route. He served those clients and sold insurance. Don became very successful. Don met Diane and the two fell in love. Meeting Diane kept Don on the straight and narrow. She was the one for him. They married on October 22, 1977. They now have three children and several grandchildren. Over the years, Don and Diane shared their lives together, raising their children. He retired in 2015 and now lives in Indiana. In the summer, Don plays golf, enjoying his retirement. He stays in contact with fellow Marines through a membership in the Marine Corps League. He's been there for 20 years. Don suffers from PTSD. When he's reminded of the events on February 8, 1968, he smiles. Though the thoughts of that day are still on his mind, he has learned to live with them. February 8th will always be a part of Donald Talbot. The loss of those he served with will always be on his mind. On January 27, 2004, Don was watching the news when he heard, The remains of a recently discovered American prisoner of war have been identified. DNA was used to positively identify the remains of Sergeant Hammond. Immediately, Don flashed back to February 8th. In his mind, he was back in the ditch, remembering the moment Hammond and Joe disappeared. Then the report said Sergeant Hammond had been reported missing in action on February 8, 1968. The report went on to say, Another Marine, Joseph Zotaki, was identified last November. Zotaki and Hammond were captured on the same day and in the same battle. Don was more than sad learning that his brothers had died in captivity. He was in a state of anguish. This may have been the first time he admitted he suffered from PTSD. When Don and I sat down for the chat that led to this book, he was smiling. I remember being told a long time ago that when the past gathered dark clouds around you, talking about what was in those clouds could help the day get brighter. I hope Don's days will always be bright and he will always have sunshine. I leave you with this one thought. I served in Vietnam, saw combat, did my duty. But Don did so much more. Don Talbot is a hero. We all gave some in that war, but Don gave more. This concludes Silent Valor by Rick Greenberg. Narrated by Patrick Lawler. Copyright 2022 by Rick Greenberg. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Rick Greenberg and was produced in the year 2023 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.